In two seconds, Friday called it. <laughs> a family with a rip of pliers, continental drift. There ain't no pace in science for your stubborn. Marie went back to the drawing board. Literally, she had a drawing board. She checked it once and she checked it twice. To be triple sure, she checked it thrice. She took it back and she showed it to Bruce. But this time, he called the truce. He shook his head. He said, Marie, Marie, I think I owe you an apology. Your map is right, yes, I must admit. But I'm worried that this map applies continental drift. They published in any way. Even though they knew the sciences were bound to say. That's what the men said, yeah, that's what the men said, they called it Girl Talk. Rejected like that, in two seconds flat, they called it Girl Talk. A valley with the rift applies, continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your You know it's all about the timing. The paleoclimatologist raised an objection. The climate of this talk is moving in the wrong direction. Don't make me lose my appetite, said the mineralogist. My stomach's moving left to right, said the seismologist. I'm shifting in my seat, said the plate tectonicist. When do we eat? Said the biogeochemist. Can we please slow down? Said the glaciologist. Everybody settle down, cried the sedimentologist. Now I can see this conference was dissolving into chaos. chaos. At any moment, this could be San Andreas. So I reach for the nearest thing that garnered my attention. And lifting high a glass, I address the whole convention. Everybody grab a cup and let's propose a toast. Cause the planet that we live on is our planetary host. We all have different disciplines, there is no right or wrong. I want to hear you click those buttons and hear you chant along. I'm a geophysicist, he's a geophysicist, and everybody at this meeting also on the geophysics. It takes a lot of discipline to reconstruct the past. Cause the time scale that we're dealing with is infinitely vast. I'm a geophysicist, she's a geophysicist, and everybody at this meeting also the one that geophysics. It takes a lot of discipline to reconstruct the past, cause the time scale that we're dealing with is infinitely vast. Science is real. Science is real. From the big bang to DNA. The radio waves 
the gamma rays Like a Henrietta Leavitt from the galaxies of far away Real revolution to the Milky Way Atoms to molecules, metals to metalloids The periodic table to the physics of an asteroid I like those stories about angels, unicorns, and elves Yes, I like those stories just as much as anybody else But if you are seeking knowledge, my friend Be it simple or abstract You'll find the facts are with science indeed The facts are with science Because science is real And when the facts are undisputed, there's no need for an apology. From dinosaurs down to bumblebees, even microscopic organisms living in your BLT. A scientific theory isn't just a hunch or a guess. It's more like a question that's been put through countless, countless tests. And when a theory emerges, it must be consistent with the facts. You see, the truth is with science because the proof is with science. Science is real. Reality. Welcome to City of STEM 2022. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great day of science, technology, engineering, and math all set for you. My name is Ben Dicko, and I'm the president and executive director of the Columbia Memorial Space Center. We're a space museum and hands-on STEM learning center located just south of downtown Los Angeles. We're actually on the site where NASA built all the Apollo spacecraft that went to the moon and all the space shuttles. But today, we are the host of City of STEM. City of STEM is one of the largest STEM initiatives in the world, and it is the largest STEM program in Southern California, or in Los Angeles. Throughout the day, you are going to be hearing from STEM experts, professionals, organizations, seeing hands-on activities, just a full day of science, technology, engineering, or math. Now, it's focused on Los Angeles, but because this is an online event, it's going out throughout the world. So we really are celebrating STEM everywhere you are. Um, also, what's really fantastic about today is in addition to this online program, for the first time since 2019, we're able to do City of STEM in person. Right outside the walls here in the Space Center, we are taking over the public park that we're in. We have over 100 STEM organizations and special guests showing off the best in STEM in Southern California and trying to bring it to you. Throughout the day, you're going to be getting reports from the field, some interviews from some of the booths and some of the people that are out there, plus exclusive content for online. Uh, today, during City of STEM, we, like I said, we're going to be checking into one of those over 100 STEM organizations. We're also going to hear from our keynote speaker, astronaut Ellen Ochoa, the first Latina in space. We're going to be seeing a performance from Jason Latimer, a world champion magician who has a new YouTube show called Impossible Science, which brings magic and science together. 
We're going to be seeing a musical performance from Music Notes, a group that brings math and teaches math through rap. Uh, we are going to see the winners of our Innovation Challenge, a months-long City of STEM program that challenges middle school students to think about sustainability. Right now, we are doing the City of STEM eSports tournament in the Space Center. It's the huge eSports tournament that's bringing teams from throughout Southern California together. We're going to be hearing from expert panels. We're having drone races today. And again, tons of content from over 100 STEM organizations from around the area. Um, you know, City of STEM is truly a celebration of science, technology, engineering, and math. We want to, it, today's activities kicks off a one month focus on STEM throughout Southern California. We will be focusing on at least multiple STEM events every single day of the month of April. And we're just trying to, to celebrate that and really sort of focus on not just the leadership of Southern California in STEM, but the leadership that STEM has throughout the world. I mean, for the past couple of years, the biggest story in the world has been COVID-19, which is a STEM story. And it was science that was allowing us today to do this in-person event. Today, we are celebrating the power of science and we're doing it through the mission and vision of City of STEM. The mission of City of STEM is to have at least one month out, the, out of the year where everyone understands that they are surrounded by STEM, where you can walk down the street and look at a tree and it's beautiful, but you also know that there's a lot of science in that tree. The second vision of City of STEM is that everyone feels like they are aware of and have access to all the fantastic STEM resources that are around you, not just in Los Angeles, but in whatever city you're at. And then three, we want to make sure that all of you feel like you are part of the ongoing story of STEM. All of you, meaning anyone from any background, any, uh, any age, all of us are part of STEM. It's not just one group or another group. Everybody's part of STEM, and you are all capable of doing STEM every day in your life. The only way that we're able to pull off such an, a huge, ambitious online and in-person event is by a ton of support. And I want to thank each and every one of the people who've come together to put today, uh, to, to put today forward. Um, especially, I want to thank our sponsors, our title sponsor, the Amgen Foundation. Amgen is a huge biotech corporation based here in Southern California dedicated to promoting science and innovation. Thank you, Amgen Foundation, for being our title sponsor. I want to thank Kaiser Permanente, uh, Financial Partners Credit Union, SoCal Gas, the Clean Power Alliance, Edison International, Hitachi, the Annenberg Foundation, Northrop Grumman, Pacific West, and Intel. All of them have come together as sponsors for City of STEM. Also, there's another sponsor new this year, the Academy of Magical Arts. They have never sponsored a public community event like this before, and we are very super happy to have them here to be able to show the connection between magic and science. And finally, there are a few other groups that helped us in kind to be able to put on today, namely STS Esports, AOC, and Koala No. But most importantly, I want to thank the over 100 organizations who have been planning for, over, for a year to have City of STEM. These over 100 organizations, many of them who are here right now, um, is the community, the STEM, the STEM network of Southern California. And I want to thank each and every one of you for sticking with us and making today possible. Without you, there would be no STEM for us to show off and celebrate. Um, and then really finally, I got to thank the volunteers who are working super hard today to be able to put both of these experiences together online and in person. And most importantly, I want to thank the staff of the Columbia Memorial Space Center. We have the best staff in the world, and we are putting STEM out there in front of the world for everyone every single day. The staff works super hard to do this, and I cannot thank them enough. I want to thank everybody who's involved in this uh, online experience today. I know it's going to go great. I've been working on it for a long time. And most importantly, I guess, over all of the most importance that I just said, most importantly, I want to thank you for tuning in today, for being enthusiastic about STEM, for wanting to maybe learn something new about it, or just have a great party day around science, technology, engineering, and math. Have a wonderful day. I'm going to turn it over to the hosts. Thank you very much. City of STEM. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 2022 City of STEM live Let's event. Go. Let's go. It's going to be a great day today. City of STEM here in the beautiful Downey, California, here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. Yes. We're going to have a very good time. My name is Anthony. 
My name is Maynard Okereke, better known as the Hip Hop MD. We're going to be your host for today's events. I am very excited. I'm super excited. I'm yes, hyped. Sir. Yes, it sir. is Saturday morning and we get to talk science all day all long. Day. What are you most looking forward to today? All day. I am looking forward to Jason Latimer, one of the really one of the most famous magicians out there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah he's yeah. awesome. We had a chance to talk with him last year. He's going to be on the main stage doing some fun STEM science experiments because we all know science is almost like magic, right? It is crazy. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a uh, Natural History Museum. Right. I've done a lot of work at the Natural History Museum, one of my favorite places to visit here in Los Angeles, California. And that's really what this City of STEM yeah. event is all about, right? Is bringing all of these STEM organizations that are thriving all throughout the city, all throughout the area, and bringing them right here to you. Getting out to you guys, for sure. Getting the whole City of STEM uh, implemented in the classrooms and whatnot. And uh, if you let us know where you guys are listening from, you know, let us know, hey, I'm from down in California, or hey, I'm from here, I'm from there. That'd be great. Uh, get to know, you know, share the link, let us know. And uh, yeah, if you can't make it here in the morning, you can come here, you know, like we said, after in the afternoon, we're gonna have a lot of stuff. Yeah. And this is the kickoff for a month long event that's gonna yeah. be happening, right? Because STEM isn't just one day, we could be doing this every single day throughout the year. But the whole goal of City of STEM is to bring fun STEM educational resources to you at home, wherever you're at. So if you are able to make it here, come here. If not, this uh, virtual chat is going to be very, very interactive. Yes, Feel free to ask any questions. We'll hopefully be able to get to some of your questions throughout the day. But we have some credible things. We're going to be meeting with Jeff at JPL. What yes, else we got be. going? We also have a bunch of stuff like the boots. If you guys, you know, can come over here in uh, person because it's been a while, you know, it's been the whole mm -hmm. COVID season. So. We're finally able to come in person, you know, with masks, without masks, vaccinated. So mm -hmm. it's very great that we get to get into the science world all over again in person. Like yes, just back to normality. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I miss it. I miss it. Right. Yeah. It's like 2019 all over again. <sighs> right. Yeah, it, it, it is great. It's a breath of fresh air. And what better way to get jump started back into live interactive stuff than being able to talk science yes. and STEM. Yes, right. I'm very excited. Yes. What's your favorite STEM topic, by the way, Anthony? Mm -hmm. Um, probably the science aspect, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that you can discover and it's, it's just a lot of the, our world that haven't really been discovered yet. So, uh, mm -hmm. science, definitely science. Yeah. 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 Actually, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big nature nerd. All right. I love wildlife explorations. I go on wildlife trips. I do like backyard right. science videos, uh, exploring, especially here in Los Angeles. And that's a great thing about our city. There's so much nature and so much wildlife to explore. Natural History Museum is going to be talking about some biological discoveries you can make in your area, different things you can learn at the uh, Natural History Museum as well. So, so there's so many ways to be able to get connected with our city, and we're hopefully going to be able to bring that to all of you that are at home today. Of course, just mm -hmm. getting out there and get, you know, getting your science on, maybe in the mountains, maybe in the, you know, the forest, and really knowing. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the times, I, you know, we don't really know where to go. We don't really know what resources yeah. are out there, and that's why we're here, right? We're going to let you know, inform you, educate. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, sometimes education is our greatest weapon, right? You exactly. Know, how it are is. we supposed to help? How are we supposed to fix? How are we supposed to, you know, without knowing mm -hmm. what what we can do you know yeah. so that's why we're here yeah. knowledge is power absolutely is power. and a lot of times people look at los angeles and it's the big city hollywood bright lights and it is all that but we have so many amazing organizations so many opportunities to learn so many opportunities to get educated for all age groups yeah. i mean k through 12 young adults you know adults like myself still learning every single day and it's amazing and that's what i love about being in this city there's so much to be immersed into and so if you do have the opportunity to join us live here today in downey come over if you haven't been to the if you haven't been out here to the space center it's an incredible incredible place to get educated and learn too and now that we're back open what better time to do it than now? Yes, sir. Here mm -hmm. in the city of Downey. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's going to be a great day. Also, um, we're going to have like musical performances later yes, on. Aren't we? Yes, yes. Yeah. How did I so forget? About? Even... I'm the hip hop MD. I didn't even come talk on, about the musical performances. Come on. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Music Notes is going to be performing live on the main stage as well. If you don't get a chance yeah. to see them in person, you get it tuned in virtually. It's going to be an awesome show. Right. All righty. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's you know let's get the ball rolling. Yes. Let's, we are here with right Jeff Nee, where he's here to talk about uh, the eyes of NASA. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's going to be going to be yes. great. It's um, uh, you know. That's going to be our first guest. So I think we're bringing him on right now, uh, Jeff D. And I'm going to plug in because we're going to get interactive on this session. So we're going to be chatting with him and you're going to be able to ask questions as well, too. So shoot us any of your questions that you have for Jeff at JPL, any amazing things that you want to know. But we're going to get live into this demo because he has something amazing he wants to tell us. So I'm going to throw my headpiece on. I think you got your headpiece on and we're going to get with him live. Uh, Jeff, how you doing over there? 
Hi, great. It's great to be here. Awesome, awesome. It is a pleasure to meet you. Uh, first of all, we, we did our introductions. You know a little bit about us. Uh, tell everybody that's tuning in live a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We are the NASA Center for the Los Angeles area. NASA has centers and partners all over the country, and we just happen to be yours, is, mm -hmm. is the point. Nice. And I work at the education office at, at JPL. Mm -hmm. Nice. That is absolutely amazing. Now, uh, for those that, I mean, everybody's probably heard about JPL and you work with NASA. Uh, what is, uh, tell us a little bit about specifically what JPL does and a little bit, a little quick summary about what you're going to showcase for us today. Great. So JPL, every NASA center has its own specialties. Uh, JPL specializes in robotic space exploration. And by space exploration, I mean we, spe we study the Earth, the solar system, pretty much everything in the known universe is, is in our wheelhouse mm -hmm. and, and more. Uh, and we do like our robots at JPL. So that's, that's kind of <laughs> our thing. Yeah. And uh, today what I have is, is one of the things that JPL does is we have award-winning education and communication tools that literally anybody can use, right? So this mm. stuff is, is available on mobile devices, on PCs, Macs, whatever you need. And it's great for if you're a student just wanting to learn a little bit more, or if you're a hardcore educator, a, science, mm. a STEM educator who wants a tool to teach your students something really profound and really interactive. So nice. I have one of my things is, is called NASA Eyes. NASA's eyes, and uh, and it's it's just a URL. It's called it's eyes.nasa.gov. So e y e s dot nasa dot gov. And I think he's sharing it right now. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. Could you show us one of the uh, tabs? One of the ones yeah. you would most likely want to show us. Yeah. As soon as as soon as there you go, there it goes. <laughs> as as so awesome. So eyes.nasa.gov. So you can see the URL right there. Eyes.nasa.gov. Okay. We make it really easy to remember. And the All idea right. is that you're you're looking through the universe uh, through NASA's eyes, looking at the universe through NASA's eyes. And so we have a lot of different flavors, I call them. And, okay. and the the one to start with, if you're not sure where to start, is probably the solar system one. It has the solar, solar system, system in it, interacting. Right? <laughs> okay. Nice. So I mean, who doesn't love the solar system, right? <laughs> exactly. So it's going to take us on a journey through our solar system. Here it is. And the idea is that this works on your phone. So if you just go on your phone and goes eyes.nasa.gov, it'll be right there. And it has pretty much the entire solar system in it, everything that we know of, at least, and all of the current NASA missions. So for example, wow. do you guys have a favorite planet or someplace that you've always wanted to go? If you would, what's if you favorite, would, what's your know? favorite? What's your favorite planet? Can we go to the? Can we go to the red planet? Mars. Red planet Ooh, Mars. I love it. On so Mars. You just scrolling in to zoom in, and Mars is right there. You just click on it. Right. And there it goes. Oh. Now, what's really, really interesting about NASA Eyes is that this is all real time. You can see the time right up, right at the top. This is exactly yeah, where right. all of our spacecraft and all the bodies are, literally. At this second, nice. so we have a couple have? of different things around Mars. You can see one of my personal favorites is this one, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Okay, and you just click on it, and there it is. Oh wow! This is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is exactly where it is. This is exactly what it's seeing right now at this very second. That and is we know amazing. this because we keep very, 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 very close tabs on all of our robots. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We don't want any of these <laughs> robots <laughs> disappearing, right? So yeah. that is where it is right now. So it, can you? Can anybody just click on it and find more information about uh, the satellite itself? How can yeah. people get more detailed information? There's a little click. There's a little link that says "Read More." Click on it, and it'll take you to. to... Here, let's just click on it. There you go. And here's a, a whole list. Of stuff. It's, you can see it's been going on for 16 years. 16 nice. years this NASA mission has been going on. That is right. amazing. That makes it easier for teachers to teach on specific things. Right? Absolutely. If you like to focus on Mars, you can just click the link and it'll be there yeah. for uh, mm -hmm. future reference. Yeah, right. absolutely. Cool. That's me. How about, how about our good old friend, uh, Perseverance? Perseverance is right here. Now, this one won't land you all the way in, but... Mm -hmm. There are other other options to go to go and check it out. For example, if we wanted to go, this is actually uh, the mars.nasa.gov site that I have. 
this mm -hmm. is my background right here. So we're on, okay. I'm sitting on Mars. There you go. Yeah, yep. I see. I see you. Whoa. I see you tuning live from Mars. All right. Yep. <laughs> I'm not even breathing over there, but somehow you are. All right. <laughs> and so we list everything on on the websites for everybody to find out. NASA is funded by public funds. You are our funders, right? The the American mm -hmm. taxpayer is ours. Our funders. All of our stuff yes. belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what the way we we like to operate. So if I just click on Perseverance, for example. Mm -hmm. There's everything you need to know, and you can even explore the rover in 3D. That is amazing. So NASA, wow. we built all this stuff just so people can understand more about what we're doing. Yeah. And I think you brought up an interesting point. I think a lot of people forget that, right? Like, we are funding everything that's going on with NASA. It belongs to the people. It belongs to us. And so we need to take more advantage of these educational tools and resources. And the fact that you can pull, pull this up on any PC, any Mac, on your the phone. Phones. I mean, this is so great to talk about, you know, astrophysics, any astronomy topics for educators out there. This is an incredible resource. And any just yeah. science nerd like myself that just wants to tune in and see what's happening on any planet at any given time, what we're working on. This is an amazing resource. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah, so it here's opens. our 3D model of the of the rover, and you can go anywhere you want and find out more about all of the different parts that go oh, into wow. it. Yeah. So and if you want to see what it is, for middle schoolers and high schoolers, right? That's not. That's we can not actually go. They know older people. You know, where is the good. rover? Mm -hmm. We're looking for the rover right now. I'm looking at the rover. Yeah, yeah. There he is. Okay. Perseverance. Nice. You get a whole three dimensional view. Everything. That's amazing. There we go. Where is the rover? Love it. <laughs> Where'd it go? <laughs> How many rovers do we have on Mars at the moment? Okay, we have two. China has one. So NASA has two. China has one. There are a bunch of uh, dead rovers, I should say. Uh, rovers that are that, are, that don't work anymore. So we do mm -hmm. leave uh, some space junk on Mars, but you know, one day we'll 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 hope to go get them. Yes, yes. All right. So That's here, cool. have you guys heard about the helicopter I, on Mars? I have heard about the helicopter. So this is exactly where they are right now. So it's just uh, where is the rover? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it started all the way down here. You can see, and it this is how far it's gone in a little more than a year we've been on there for a little more than a year and the helicopter is just doing great it's already already on flight 23. i think it was slated nice. for like five flights but it's That's lasted amazing. way longer so the yeah. fact that we have a helicopter on mars yeah. is in, just incredible the, 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 the ability of us to be able to take technology to that next level uh Anthony, you mentioned something that you're very interested in knowing yeah. about that you can have full access here through nasa eyes it was about yeah. climate change right yes yes sir i'm taking yeah. a class at high school ap environmental science and um i was looking through your website earlier nasa eyes and uh, i saw something about it before and after and it's really you know sometimes it's it's a you know it's a dark topic like what we're doing to our earth and whatnot but it's kind of cool to see how our earth looked like before and Absolutely. after and you know yeah yeah so if you scroll down again one of the flavors is eyes on earth so here's eyes on the earth mm -hmm. so and not only do we get eyes on space in the solar system we get to see what's happening right here on our blue planet and you know a lot of people forget earth is a planet earth, earth is part <laughs> of space. We're, we're not separate from space we are in space right now yeah. earth is our spaceship right and we got to take good care of it and absolutely the thing we like to say at nasa is that we, we it's not that we don't is that it's not that we believe in climate change it's that we measure it that's mm -hmm. that's all we do we measure climate change that's all we do right yes. and so you can just see all the different tools all of these satellites that are going around the earth mm -hmm. right now these are just the mm -hmm. nasa science satellites there's obviously mm -hmm. thousands of satellites around the earth yes but these are the tools right. that we're using to actually measure and track all the changes that are happening mm -hmm. all around the world and this stuff mm -hmm. helps not just space nerds like you and me but it helps farmers mm -hmm. It helps disaster relief. It helps all these different aspects. Pretty much any aspect you can think of that happens on Earth uses some sort of NASA data. That is so for amazing, example, man. one of my favorite ones, I need to find it. There's so many, right? Right. <laughs> There's so many. The Landsats. Here you go. Here's the latest one. Landsat. If you've ever seen any sort of online map, these Landsats. Mm -hmm or where it's all oh, where wow. what it's all that about. That is cool. Right. These oh, are what, what actually takes, that is. Really? These, these yeah. are actually what actually takes the, the images that you see on 
on your maps, on your phone, online, anywhere you like. Okay. And wow. again, they they have decades of data, decades of images mm -hmm. where you can actually see, like you said, before and after, and see what's mm -hmm. going on. So, for example, the best place to go for that is actually this site right here. It's called climate.nasa.gov. So climate.nasa.gov. Okay. Again, it's a whole site that's interactive and has all this information. The best place, okay. if you want to see um, before and after stuff, has got to be mm -hmm. Explore Images of Change. This is relatively new. This actually came out just in the past year. Okay. So images of Change. Mm -hmm. And what region and are we looking at feature. right now? What, what area are we looking at right there? So right now, this is the South Sudan. And this is called, okay. this is about extreme rains and all the flooding. So you can yes. kind of just see, just literally see how the, how the landscape has changed. Wow. Wow. Just in, this is uh, December 6, 20, 2019. So just in the last year, just in the last just year the, or two. This is just the past year what's changed. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's wow. incredible. And then one of my favorite ones, you can actually click up here. There's a little, there's a little ga gallery tab. Mm -hmm. And you can pick any one of these. We 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 design all of these to be very interactive. One of my favorite ones mm -hmm. is this one. You might have heard read this in the news recently that Antarctica lost a giant sheet of ice. Yes. Oh, wow. uh, just yep. in the last few months, it, here it's right here, and you can see before and after. So this is January sixteenth to January twenty sixth. Just a matter of ten days. This oh, is what goodness. happened. Wow. No that way. entire sheet just fell apart. Wow. So that's what it was like so in January sixteenth. And 10 January days later, 16th. 10 days later, this is what it looks like. It's all broken up. It's all practically gone. Wow. Wow. This and, is so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And so why should we, be, why should we should be concerned? Like, why should we be concerned? About Antarctica? About like oh, the, the, yeah, the problem is that and whatnot. If you look at this, I mean, this is what a lot of people have trouble um, visualizing. Mm -hmm. One part of the earth is not just one part of the earth. We are mm -hmm. one entire planet yeah. everything is connected and this is this is really why nasa studies the earth because the earth is an entire planet system and mm -hmm. something that happens over here you may say oh it's so far from la it doesn't matter to me it does it affects everything on the planet and mm -hmm. that's kind of what we've learned is that the mm -hmm. entire planet is interconnected things that happen in one area affect what happens in other areas. No, and nothing right, yeah. could be more demonstrative of this than the weather, mm -hmm. right? The weather, it's, a, it's one weather system. It's one global weather system. It's not that, oh, it rains over here in Japan. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. to me over here in Los Angeles. That's not true. The water mm -hmm. that falls in Japan has an effect around the entire world, and it travels mm -hmm. around the entire world. You can kind of just see that it's just one yep. piece. It's yep. not like we have a wall here in the Pacific that separates us. Mm -hmm. And this Absolutely. is the one thing that, that astronauts always say. If you talk to any astronaut who's been up in space, there's something called the overview effect. Yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. it, have you heard about the overview effect? What have you heard about it? Yes, yes. I have heard about the overview effect. I was actually talking to my good friend, Dr. Siam Proctor, who went on Inspiration4 mission uh, last year. And uh, this is, yeah, this, like you said, there's a common theme that astronauts talk about. You have a greater appreciation for our planet. Uh, once you go up there and you experience and you see this blue planet, you see everything. You think about all the billions of people that live here on this planet and how interconnected everything is. And you get this greater appreciation for why we need to protect it, why it's so important, why it's so valuable. And sometimes you have to kind of be away from Earth to look back down upon it and be able to understand why everything is so interconnected and how detrimental climate change can be. Right. So uh, what could we be doing to, you know, kind of not necessarily, you know, stop the climate change, but, you know, bring it down, at least take our baby steps into, you know, eventually, uh, you know, helping uh, the world out? <laughs> well, if you're asking me for advice, the thing that NASA tries to, at least I try to avoid is I, I try to avoid giving advice. What I what NASA specializes in is collecting data and showing people the data and showing what's happening so you, you can make your own choices. Does that um, kind of make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great, that's the first step is to be informed because yeah. a lot of times people just don't know what is happening. You know, we're in our own cities, our own, our own countries all across the world, and you may not be familiar with what's taking place somewhere else across the globe. But to be able to have access to data and content like this just informs the public and gives us access so that we can see these detrimental changes that are happening over right. periods of time, whether it's 10 years, 
10 days and the effects that we're having on this planet. So this is such an incredible tool, even if you just share with your classroom to just get your students familiar with what global warming and what climate change is, just to have the basic understanding, the fundamentals, this is an absolutely incredible resource. Really, yeah, and talking about it. the overview of tech, this is, this is the, you guys recognize it? Is that the ISS? That's the ISS right here. Yeah. And the overview act happens wow. right here. This is mm -hmm. called the cupola. This is where all the astronauts, mm -hmm. if you see all the great photos, this is where most of the photos from, from the ISS are taken. Mm -hmm. And it's just an incredible place. It has windows. You can kind of see it. It has windows all over. Yeah. And so you can just mm -hmm. pop in your head in and just see the Earth exactly like this mm -hmm. and you can just see for yourself you don't have to go to the space station you can see that the planet is one planet we're all connected we're all one humanity living on this spaceship earth yes right. absolutely that is absolutely incredible jeff from jpl thank you so much yes. for giving us this full interactive experience uh, letting us know about NASA Eyes. Uh, can you give that website again for anybody that's tuning in that wants to get to know a little bit more about this incredible resource? Where can they find this information? Absolutely. Eyes.nasa.gov. E-Y-E-S dot NASA.gov. E -E uh, nice. Uh, nice. That's incredible. Cool. Incredible. I'm going to make sure to browse upon that as soon as I get home because there's some cool things that I'm talking about with climate change yes, and global warming when it comes to uh, some of our marine protection uh, in a couple of weeks. And so that's going to be a great resource that I'm going to personally utilize. So hopefully anybody that's tuning at home, you have that resource now to be able to connect with, share with your students, share with yourself and learn a little bit more about our planet. Incredible, yes, incredible. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I get a chance to chat with you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's been really fun. Thank you, Jeff. Nice, nice. Take care. Alrighty, on to our next segment. We are going to be exploring and talking about the Natural History Museum. It's one of the largest natural and historical museums in the Western US. So yes. I'm actually excited. We've been there plenty of times. I've been there lots of times in Natural yes. History Museum. I love the spider, uh, the spider exhibit and the butterfly pavilion. Those oh, yeah. are some of my two favorite exhibits. You get to actually be fully immersed with nature live there on site is incredible. Yes, sir, and it's it's really close to home, you know? It's like just, you know, down the street. That's per se. <laughs> yeah, per se. <laughs> per se. Depending on where you're at. 20, 30 minutes, an hour, <laughs> an depending hour, on traffic. An hour, two hours. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have the Natural History Museum live here uh, at the City of STEM event. Yeah. But they're going to talk to you a little bit more about what's going on at the Natural History Museum and how you can get involved as well. Sure. Explore these mind-blowing exhibitions and explore nature and culture in LA. Yes. Which is what we're all about. City of STEM. Absolutely. Let's check it out. Quite on set. Rolling. See one, take one mark. Action. The face of Hollywood has changed, but the gender disparity between men and women in leadership roles is still huge. I'm Dunya Merrill Georgievich, a filmmaker and the founder of Girls in Focus. My team and I pioneered a remote online filmmaking intensive where girls and non-binary youth make their own films from idea to festival-ready films in just three weeks. So what this program does is it helps females and girls um, start off at a very young age in order to get the experience they need in order to become confident enough so that they can enter the film world with vigor and know their path and that they can stand up for themselves and 
speak for their creative vision. Every single girl is entitled to a safe space to be creative, which is also free of gender-based discrimination. I joined Girls in Focus because I thought it would be a great way for women who share the same passion to come together and break down this barrier that's been here for a very long time. I want girls to find strength and encouragement within each other, especially in an industry that's very critical and primarily run by men. This is a hub where girls and women from the industry can grow and learn and support each other. guys are <laughs> 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 There are so many insects in the world. There are lots of species that are still unknown to science. In the 20 so years I've been studying insects, I've helped to find new species, which is just a dream come true. This is the happiest day of my life! Insects are a little different than other animals that use slime because they don't really have slime on the outside of their body, but they do have ooze-like fluids on the inside that they sometimes can use for defense. Sometimes they actually push out a pores in their exoskeleton, which we call reflex bleeding, which is just really kind of gross and cool. And then in some cases, slime comes out the other end of their body, so sort of peeing it out. Can I use your bathroom? Okay, make it quick. That's okay. So it's hard to see because they're so small, but right at the tip of my tweezers here is a special little creature that we call the spittle bug. If you happen to see them outside, it'll look like someone actually can spit on the plant. <laughs> So grasshoppers, they get captured, and they're actually going to regurgitate or barf up some fluids that are inside of their body, which will make them a little slimy and make them taste really, really bad. So something like a lizard might start to swallow it and then change its mind and spit it out. Pretty cool. Amazing. We need a lot of different kinds of people to become scientists, people who are curious and creative and compassionate and bring a lot of different abilities and talents to the scientific community. So if this is something that you're interested in, pursue it and don't let anybody discourage you. Who's ready? I'm ready! Who's ready? I'm ready! City of Stairway. She is unique and special. 
Her presence today is just another testament to her long-standing commitment to our youth. She's an incredible role model, especially for young girls who inspire and she gives hope and confidence that they too can excel. And perhaps maybe someday among one of you is the next Dr. Ellen Ochoa. The Columbia Memorial Space Center truly is a bright star that helps to make Downey the wonderful city that it is. This is due to the outstanding staff who under the leadership of Ben Dicko has made the Space Center a national model for inspiring our youth to pursue professions in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. The Space Center exposes our children to the wonders of STEM, and it does so by providing an enjoyable and hands-on learning experience. The annual City of STEM Science Festival is an example of Ben's and his staff's outstanding effort to bring attention and excitement to the rewarding and valuable potential of a STEM profession. I commend Downey's mayors, members of the city council and community leaders for their support, which has contributed significantly to the success of the Space Center that is so important. Okay, so unfortunately we are having some technical difficulties, but it's normal. This is what happens when we're still doing this virtual hybrid space right now. Technical issues happen, but we are getting them worked through. But lucky for all of you that are tuning in, we have other exciting things to talk about. Yeah, what is that on your on your lab coat? Says oh. Hip Hop MD, what is that? Yes, yes, I, I am the Hip Hop MD. For those that aren't familiar, I have a platform called Hip Hop Science, right. where I use music, entertainment, and comedy as tools to educate on a wide variety of scientific topics. Right. I touch on everything from space to math, to physics, to biology, wildlife explorations, anything that's fun in STEM, you name it, I'm on it. Uh, I'll actually be at the Space Symposium uh, on Monday, all, Monday. The, all the next week, uh, talking to all sorts of different space officials from NASA, JPL, and beyond about new technologies, new innovations happening that are going to support space exploration. Uh, but I have a really big passion about making STEM topics fun and exciting, just like the city of STEM is doing for all of you that are tuning in right now. Uh, but I use pop culture and intertwine all these fun scientific topics. But rather than me just talking about it, let me show you a couple clips about my platform, what I do, and how you can get involved with my work at Hip Hop Science. So check this out. Today, the Hip Hop MD is doing what he does best, talking about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, yes, STEM. We're obviously breaking down the science of fitness. Tell us a little bit about uh, your favorite brand of shoes. Uh, it's gotta be the Jordan. Are you big into virtual reality? Do you do a lot of gaming yourself? I wouldn't say I'm big, but I, I have been in virtual reality. You've partaken in the virtual reality space. Got the screen here. Show us a little bit of your movements, different things that you can do on this motion capture. I am with the man, Honey Johnson the inventor of Super Soaker and the Nerf gun. I'm with Levi Simon, Josh Willis, Kelly Mead. Is there anything specific that you guys have to do to encourage mating here? What would people find unique about your augmented reality artwork? It's unfortunate that there's so many people that contribute so much to science, especially with women, right, that we don't talk about. Polygons on polygons, 16K. <laughs> we ain't playing games out here. This is for real. This is my retirement job. This is your retirement job. Okay, yeah. this is a great retirement job. We're talking science of Game of Thrones. Do you guys know what civil engineers do? This is absolutely beautiful. Quick work out tip for anybody that's trying to get like you. Just train every day, twice a day. <laughs> every day, twice a day. That's all you need. Hip-Hop Science, Hip-Hop MD. We are here at the Art of Technology. This is absolutely amazing. You cannot find this fusion of art, technology, entertainment anywhere else.
awesome. Hopefully that was exciting for you. That shows a little bit of highlights of some fun things that I've been able to do with my hip hop science platform. I love being able to do these in-person events because you get to talk to people in detail, get to be embraced into full scientific topics. So that uh, video reel was some of my highlights of some of the most incredible events that I've had a chance to be at. Yes, yes. What was uh, your favorite one? Have you ever been to like a mm, some crazy like event, something that happened? Yes, yes. Actually, my favorite event to go to, and I go to this every single year, is CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. Have you heard about it before? No, I've never heard about it. Tell me about it. CES is absolutely incredible. If you're a tech nerd, right, if you love technology, if you love innovations, if you love gizmos and gadgets galore, <laughs> CES is the place to be every single year in Las Vegas. Anything that's new in technology is debuted at CES. So uh, the first yeah. iPhone ever was debuted at CES. Any new uh, item that's coming out for that year, uh, you have the hottest companies there out there. They have full displays, you get interactive things. It's absolutely incredible. This past year, I got a chance to ride in BMW's new electric vehicle. Oh, wow. The little test drive yeah. was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Zero to 60, 2.9 seconds. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, but so many new innovations are spotlighted and highlighted at CES. It's one of my favorite events to yeah. be at. That's great. That's cool. Where's mm. that at? That is in Las Vegas. In Las, Las Vegas, Vegas every right. single year. Uh, but we have we talk so much about cool things happening here at City of STEM, amazing e pro uh, programs and events. Uh, we talked obviously about Natural History Museum. Uh, La Brea Tar Pits we didn't get to. Have you been to La Brea Tar Pits? Yeah, I have been to La Brea Tar Pits. I think one of the coolest things over there is, you know, highlights the things from the past. You know, the uh, the whole Ice Age and the whole thing that's going on over there and mm -hmm. uh, what happened over there or back then, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the coolest things about La Brea Tar Pits is that you can, you know, you see the scientists and you see them you know, making discoveries and doing their sciencey things like when you go to a museum. Yeah. You know, like n normally when you think about museums, it's like, oh, you know, learning, you know, which shouldn't really be the case. And then when you go to this museum, it's like, wow, this is fun. Like, this is cool. Like, look at all these things that they do. And uh, yeah. yeah, La Brea Tar Pits. And the thing that's actually unique about La Brea Tar Pits, this is the only museum in the country that is a live functioning uh, that uh, laboratory as yeah. well as a museum. If you go to the Brea Tar Pits, scientists are making discoveries live on the spot every single day. They're uh, discovering new fossils. They're discovering new remnants, different things that have happened through the Ice Age. You're making discoveries live there in person. It is one of the only few museums where you can actually see those discoveries taking place. You might show up one day by yourself or with your classroom and there may be some new, uh, there may be some saber tooth tiger fossil that just got discovered at that very moment. You get a chance to see that in person, which is one of the most unique things about yeah. the Librea Tar Pits. Which I just got news that, you know, uh, the Natural History Museum is up and running. So we'll go to that now. So the Librea Tar Pits, stay tuned for that later. That is coming up mm -hmm. after the uh, Natural History Museum. So, yep. Uh, and Boundless Brilliance as well, too. So yeah. amazing things. So enough with us. Let's jump back over to the Natural History Museum and see what they have to talk about today. City of Stereo. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Great kids here today. Why? Because they love science, technology, engineering, and math. And that is a door to the future. I want to commend the center staff for their efforts to promote the areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. You're going to hear this time and time again. We want to put it in your brain that you are part of the future. And I'd like to thank you for that. We'd like to also recognize the fact that all of your schools, your boards of education, your superintendents, all the teachers that you have that have introduced you to the curriculum of these great studies that we have to do and your contribution now and in the future. And of course, the contribution of Downey in, in Los Angeles County. We're so proud of all of you. And I know one thing that as you start learning about these important subjects, as you go through the K through 12 program, you'll find that it's gonna open doors for you in the future in college. And that's why I am here with my office 
we've con coordinated community partners, educators that have come together, thousands of people that we have been able to work with over the years. But more importantly, I'd like to give a shout out to those supporters who've given us thousands of laptops for students. Four school districts have received these last laptops because they found that it's so important to contribute to the future of the kids, having the technology they need. So after two years, we've done that. But we tell the students that put it on your site, put it in your future, that the more you learn, the better you're going to be for your future. And that's why I've supported the increase of affordable uh, bread, uh, uh, broadband internet service, which is so important. And I mentioned about the laptop. It is important that we all acknowledge the opportunity there for the future. And of course, I am so proud to share this with you. When I was mayor of the city of Pico Rivera, we actually opened a school in the name of our special guest today, uh, Astron Eloa, because the Ellen Joy Prep Academy. And we honored her. And I think, I do believe, and I've got to ask you this, was that the first school named after Ella, the astronaut? I've got to ask. And I'm sure she's being recognized all over the country, but I've got to ask that because we're so proud of what she's done. And when I heard she was born and raised in the greater Los Angeles area, I'm telling you, it could have been from anywhere. So you kids thinking about going on to school, whether it be SC, UCF, Stanford, Harvard, whatever you think about going to school, you think about your future science and math. And her accomplishment, can you imagine what she went through and the study, the technology, engineering, math she had to do and fight as a Latina, as a woman, to become an astronaut. I'm telling you, talk about that glass ceiling. She probably just poked it right through it and broke it. And she did. She was up space. Can you imagine Dr. Ellen Ochoa? She's back there. You're going to hear in a minute. And I want to thank her and congratulate her for all she's done. And I will also tell you that I think we've done some things together, too. And I'd like to uh, get uh, our Claudia, representing the city of County. Can you come up for a second? We've got, and Ben, can you come up here? Where are you, Ben? Right here. We've got a little surprise gift. As Senator Bob Archuleta, I've got this little small check. Ben, I don't know if it will fit in your ATM. <laughs> but uh, to the city of Downey, Claudia, and all the city council and everyone for your contribution. But this is an $800,000 check going to Downey in the state center. So let's stand over here and see. Ben, put a hand on the check. Take it away. No, no, it looks like it. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, one more. Anyone ready? Ready? So as they say, everyone, that's what we've done. So all of you are filling the today of the deal. And remember, boys and girls, they say, your place is right up there. Look up in the space. One day you might be there. So congratulations to all of you. And keep studying and stay in school. Keep doing it. Your future is in our hands, and we love you for it. So God bless you all. Great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Archuleta. That's fantastic. And uh, just so you guys know, um, that's going to help that contribution. Thank you so much. The seed money to help us restore our space shuttle, which is going to go in a brand new building right behind me over there in the next couple of years. Yes, we're sitting Oh my gosh, apologies on the Natural History Museum. Oh my gosh, we told you twice. April Fool's was yesterday. <laughs> hey, April Fool's was yesterday. April Fool's We're was day yesterday. late. What are we doing? Sorry, sorry. But uh, yeah, keeping it kind of themed with what we did earlier with uh, the eyes of NASA, we talked about astronauts and how they, you know, over the overlook, what was it called? The overview effects. The overview effects. Yep. So uh, keeping it themed, keeping it, uh, we're going to have Ellen Ochoa. 
She is a former NASA astronaut, first Hispanic woman to be in space, which is super cool. Absolutely incredible. Super cool. And she is a native to New York, which is mm -hmm. kind of cool. And uh, she's going to be giving a, a keynote. She's going to be a keynote speaker here in uh, City of STEM. It's mm -hmm. going to be great. It's going to be really cool. And uh, yeah, she's yeah. Uh, her story is absolutely fascinating. She's logged over a thousand hours in space, uh, and as like as Anthony said, the first Hispanic woman to ever go into space, and that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, we just wrapped up Women's History Month, and so she is an icon in the world of space science. So if you're tuning in right now virtually, make sure to check this out. It's going to be coming up in a couple of minutes here, live on the main stage. So get to know a little bit about her story her background and some of the work that she's doing. She has, she's yeah. done some amazing things even outside of being an astronaut, which is absolutely fantastic. So definitely looking forward to that. Uh, and then what else is coming up on the main stage after that? What else is coming up? We're also going to have some musical performances right yes. after. So that's going to be really cool. Yes. You know, it's it's kind of cool to see how like science isn't really just science. Like it's it's hip hop. It's, you know, mm -hmm. entertaining comedy, magic, music. Yeah. You know, it's it's all around us, you know, just mm -hmm. like just like technology is just mm -hmm. like engineering is mathematics, which is what, you know, STEM really stands for. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Super yeah. Cool. And that's steam. Right. We add that A into you know science, technology, yeah. engineering and math put the A in there, which is for arts. So we like to bring that, especially with the city of STEM, to be able to incorporate the arts into it. And so that's why we're going to have a musical performance. And that's what I do on my platform. It's the yeah. hip-hop hip MD, hip-hop science, try to integrate pop culture, dance, all these other themes, because it gets us more connected with these scientific topics. Yeah. Uh, and then we got Jason Latimer coming Jason as well, Latimer, too. I'm right? so excited for right? Jason Latimer. Super hyped to see yeah. him. He's going to be doing some fun STEM science experiments uh, and tying magic into it as well, too. So science cool. of magic, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, but we have Ellen coming up on the main stage show. Uh, we'll eventually, hopefully, get back to the National History Museum at some point once we get the Wi-Fi connectivity issues figured out. Uh, but the main stage is functioning, is ready, and there's so many people out there in attendance right now. Hype. The weather is great. It's not too hot. And so people are enjoying themselves out there. Uh, but we're going to send it over right now to the main stage for all of you to check out Ellen Ochoa giving the keynote presentation live here at the City of STEM. Let's go. City of I just want to see all of you. It's, it's so wonderful to see this event come back to life. I am really taking it all in. <laughs> After two years of undoubtedly uh, such great challenges, it is wonderful to see you all. And Ben, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful work that you continue to do for our Columbia Memorial Space Center, uh, for our city. And parents, thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing your children. As a mother of four, my oldest is in grad school, my youngest in high school, all raised in the beautiful city of Downey. And education, parents, is key. I see all of you cradling your little ones. Love them up. Love them up because they grow up fast. STEM is such an important area. The science, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, you know, we're all gifted in such special skills and abilities. Parents, thank you. Thank you for the investment you are doing in your children. It is us, it is a collaboration, and it is the partnerships that we have with our school districts, with places like the Columbia Memorial Space Center, but it is up to us parents to instill in our children the love of learning. And we are the ones that plant those seeds of curiosity. We are the ones that plant the seeds of wanting to know more. And so thank you. Thank you because instead of spending a few moments more laying in bed this morning or maybe watching the cartoons. Parents, you are here with your children. God bless you. Give yourselves a round of applause. We are building a generation of learners. Our world keeps changing every minute of every day. And it is up to us to continue to invest in a generation that will change the course of history. Ben said a few moments ago, we are standing in such a historic site. 
This is boys and girls. This is where the capsules that went to the moon were built many years ago. Isn't that amazing? This is where engineers thought about how to build these capsules and how to work together and collaborate. We're all different, just like the fingers in our hands. And just like the fingers in our hands, we're able to come together, appreciate how different we are, how skilled we are. And so today I am so honored to be amongst great people. Our first Latina ever elected to Congress, Lucille Roy Ballard. Thank you, 30 years of service, thank you. Thank you for your service to our region and to all the people that, that you've cared and loved, thank you. Senator Archuleta, Assemblywoman Christina Garcia, thank you. And again, thank you to Financial Partners Matter. Thank you for your continued commitment. Again, I don't wanna take any more of your time because we're here to listen to an amazing woman that went to space. But I wanna tell you parents that we've got, we've got great things. We've got, it is up to us. Downey is a medical hub with three hospitals. I am honored to also work for Kaiser Permanente right behind us. And they're also one of the sponsors. So let's give them a round of applause. We've got Kaiser, we got PIH, we've got Rancho Los Amigos. And so as the Congresswoman, the Assemblywoman and the Senator said, amongst us right here, we have future scientists and engineers and doctors and people that will impact Downing and the region for generations to come. So thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of the day. All of you, all of you volunteers, for uh, this city of STEM. Thank you for all the work that you have done over the course of the last many, many, many months. This is a beloved and treasured event, and it's a jewel, not just in Downey, but it's in the entire region in the Southeast. So thank you, all of you, for being here today. God bless you, enjoy this event, and I'm here to serve you. I'm your council member and former mayor, Claudia Fermetta. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and representing the city. Um, I'd like to bring up our title, uh, a representative of our title sponsor, the Amgen Foundation and CEO, Eduardo Setlin. Thank you so much for being here. It's because of Amgen that we're here today. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everybody. My name is Eduardo Setlin, and at the Amgen Foundation, we believe that everyone needs science. And that science, science needs all of us. Science needs everyone. What a joy it is to help make this event a reality. Science is all around us, but too often, the place where we live, the financial constraints of our family, can be access to a high quality science education. That's a problem for all of us. With challenges in our hands, as complex as climate change, fighting serious illnesses, reducing poverty, we need diverse talents. We need everyone to bring their top minds to make new discoveries and bring progress to everybody. That's why at the Amgen Foundation for more than 30 years, we've been working to level the playing field and give every student the opportunity to learn to think like a scientist, to learn science by doing science. Astronomer Carl Sagan said that every child is a natural born scientist. And I'll tell you a very brief story to illustrate this. A few years ago, I was driving down, I live in Ventura County, I was going to the Museum of Natural History, and I got a little lost, traffic was really bad, so I turned on Waze and, you know, got directions, turn here, turn there. And the girls were, I got two girls, the youngest one was four at the time, and they were all talking. I said, I need you to be quiet just a little bit so I don't get lost. They did. And after taking a couple of turns and, you know, getting closer to where I needed to be, uh, the little one asked, Daddy, do you trust this lady on your phone? And I'll think about that. What a great question. Yes, I did trust her. But why did I trust her? Who is this lady on the phone? 
How did she know where I was and where I should turn? As you go about your day today, visiting the many, many wonderful booths, talking to people, I'd invite each and every one to connect with your inner child. Be curious, ask questions, look for answers, experiment. That's what science is all about. At the Amgen Foundation, we are honored to sponsor the city of STEM and, to thank, and we thank everyone who's working so hard to make today a reality. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Eduardo. And thank you so much for the Amgen Foundation for being our title sponsor today. I can't thank you guys enough. You've really kicked it to the next level for us. Thank you. Um, I would like to bring up the um, uh, my board chair. He is the CEO of Financial Partners Credit Union, who is also a sponsor of today's event and has been a consistent sponsor for many of the things we're doing, including an expansion of our Girls in STEM Club program, if you're interested. Um, he's a great mentor. He's a great uh, uh, friend and colleague to, to go through the, uh, the board chair of the Columbia Memorial Space Center, Mr. Nader Bergadam. Thank you, Ben. You know, I uh, I was sitting there and I said one of the uh, advantages or disadvantages of going last is you get the benefit of everybody's great comments before you. So I'm trying to find some space between some of the comments and try to be relevant. But it's an absolute joy to be working with, uh, with Ben and the, uh, the wonderful team members who are wearing green shirts and volunteers here at the Space Center. That That's what makes it work here. For the eighth year, we're coming together regard, uh, about the uh, city of STEM and, you know, this wonderful event that we have. I remember early on, we started uh, working on this. Uh, I didn't really believe how big it should get. Uh, the last few times that we've gotten together, every time it's gotten bigger and every time it's going to get, it's getting uh, more relevant to the communities that we serve. Wonderful thing about, I want to give you guys dads and moms all the credit for bringing the young ones in grandmas grandpas thank you for doing this because your effort and your time and your list on your on the, on the young ones here who are going to lead us in the future is what's going to make it work i remember uh, many years ago self senator chaletta mentioned this that he's got kids in uh, in usc i was a uh, I, I got into usc and my engineer uh, my uh, of entry was in industrial science engineering. But I know I elsewhere. It was in numbers, but wasn't necessarily in science. So it's always wonderful when so Eduardo says, you know, everybody needs science. He's absolutely right. What you do, whether you in the rock face or in software working on, on any project, science is absolutely math and science is always. I want to uh, start by two things. The Space Center was created in 2009. And uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in, in 2009. And uh, at that time, the reason I was personally involved was people used to then work for North American Aviation in 1937. They came together and they said, let's do something for our courts, help them with credit, all those kind of things. And, uh, and that little thing that they plant, seed that they planted 85 years later is $2 billion strong, 85,000. So it shows the idea, which in space or whether, whether over here, how can we help one another? And I think that the, the Space Center, one of the wonderful things that it does, and I think that Ben alluded to this, girls in STEM, we're really excited about that because there's not enough representation from our young ladies getting involved in the STEM education. And I think that that spark, I think is gonna be one that is gonna ignite a lot of passion by a lot of people who are gonna get in this. Just remember one thing, one of us have had a moment in our lives when one event, one episode, one chance conversation led into something that we started imagining about our future. Today could be that day. Today, this experience that the young ones are here, it could actually manifest itself in something that is going to evolve to greatness and i want to say that you know you know whether it's jason's program or Dr. or many inspirational people are going to now past scientists and the rocketeers who actually work on this site this site used to basically have five thousand people who worked on the new age and the space 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 frontier 
that we're experiencing right now. So let it be your day. Enjoy the day. Use it with excitement. I'm so excited to be now standing here and giving way to Dr. Cho, who I, who I think is going to really spark all this all this conversation. She's a hero, and I want to give her a big, big, big hand. Ben, you're awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Nader. Board chair, couldn't ask for somebody better to support the Space Center and our expansion, remember. All right, we're going to hear from one more. One official and then is but i would like to welcome ivan sulik representing janice hans office the supervisor for la county thank you ben good morning everyone uh, it's a pleasure to be here i'll be brief because i'm the last speaker and i know we want to get to our keynote speakers i just want to add on and welcome each and every one of you here you guys could have done any other thing on a saturday but you chose education you chose to be here to learn and to further your horizon so thank you uh, ben wanted to thank you and your team for the great work in producing this event. So on behalf of Supervisor Han and the 10 million residents of LA County, I have here an official proclamation kicking off this event, this month long event. It's not just today. This is a month long event so on behalf of Supervisor Han, her colleagues and the 10 million residents. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of gold on this. It's pretty nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and what Ivan was talking about today is the kickoff to an entire month of STEM. Every single day in April, you can check the City of STEM website and see something going on throughout Los Angeles. But here we are, the main event, our keynote speaker. I'm going to invite all these speakers to, if you can, thank you so much for being here today. If you're going to take a chair in the front row, and I'm going to bring on our keynote. Thank you so much. We're clearing the stage because we have, well, listen, it is my honor. Being here at City of STEM for the past few years, we've had some pretty interesting keynote speakers, but this keynote speaker is very personal for me. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. My mom is over there. She is she's somewhere over there. She helped me out. We went, I got to go to space camp when I was in high school, but I always wanted to be an astronaut. It is my absolute privilege. This is the best job I've ever had to be able to lead a science space museum. But really the coolest thing is I get to meet an astronaut. And this is so fantastic for me. This is the first Latina in space. She was born in Los Angeles. She's from Southern California. She went all the way up four times in the shuttle. She's an inspiration to us all. Give it up for astronaut. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming out to the city. We have seven people in space right now. A few hands. We got some up there. Uh, three of the seven are NASA astronauts that people I know, uh, including Kayla Barron, who she has an engineering degree and was also a submarine officer in the Navy before becoming an astronaut. And if you look up tonight, starting at 8.37 p.m., assuming it's not still overcast in the clear sky, you can actually see the International Space Station fly over Los Angeles. So just get out your phones and search for spot the station. And then it'll ask what city you're in. If you're in Los Angeles, it'll tell you where to look. And so I hope of you will check that out. And then think about those seven people who are on board. We've had people in space continuously for over 21 years now on the International Space Station. So crew members generally switch out about every six months or so, but there has always been people on board the space station since November of 2000. You might have seen in the news that one of NASA astronauts Mark Vandehey landed uh, just a couple of days ago after being in space for 355 days, so just a few days short of a year. In addition to operating the International Space Station, 
NASA's developing a powerful new rocket. It's called the Space Launch System, SLS, and a new spacecraft that we worked on at Johnson Space Center when I was director there. Astronauts few years, including who will land on the land on the and right the very SLS and Orion together it is our Kennedy Center for test their uh, a little bit of this probably early June. It's going to pass off on its very first ship. We go out for this first ship with this flight. And it will be on the bank that the first time a human rated via has gone by in the book for it. It's called Artemis One Vehicle. So it's a really talented group of people make all of this. The other types of professionals to complicate. I all came to work with different ones. Parents were men, and they in Southern California. This is for you, the young I'm in Finland. Mom, who is from Oklahoma. Um, didn't chance to go to college when he was young. My dad was able to get an appointment in the academy. The whole time he was raising my sisters and they take one all of this after at Oak University in San Diego State. So uh, the excitement of learning new things and that definitely uh, made an impression on me and my brothers and sisters. Now when I was 11, is when the Apollo astronauts first landed on the moon. And this was a hugely exciting event. Um, everybody in the country, actually everybody around the world was watching this. At that time though, there weren't any women astronauts. Uh, women weren't allowed to be selected. And in fact, um, very few at all uh, at NASA. And so it wasn't something that I thought about being able to contribute to. Of careers in science and engineering that are open to anyone who's interested, people who have curiosity, um, who are creative, who like to solve problems, who like to discover new things. That's what science is, and engineering is all about. And hopefully, as you look around today at all the booths, you realize that's what's important, um, not, not anything else about um, your particularly where you came from or whether you're a boy or a girl, uh, but just really having that um, curiosity and creativity. Because uh, uh, my family was interested in education, I was able to go to our local university, San Diego State, um, after I finished high school. But I still wasn't in science. I didn't know any scientists or engineers and had never really thought about doing it. I never got a chance to come to a city of STEM event because um, they just didn't have those things um, when I was growing up. Uh, but I had always taken a lot of math, and I continued to take it in college, along with music, which I briefly thought about majoring in, and, and lots of other kinds of classes. And I decided to try to find out what um, kinds of subjects used this math. So I went to talk to a couple of different professors um, at San Diego State. One was in the electrical engineering department. And unfortunately, it was clear he wasn't at all interested in having me in his department. I guess I just didn't look like the kind of person that became an astronaut, at least in his mind, I, that became an engineer at all in his mind. However, when I went to talk to the physics professor, I got a much better reception. He was glad to hear I was interested in physics. He talked about a lot of different careers that people could have if they majored in physics. And he said, with my math background, um, he expected that I would do really well because I'd already learned the language of physics and I could concentrate on the concepts. 
So I uh, ended up studying physics, which for um, people, who, especially younger people, I know I didn't know anything about physics at the time, but it's about um, what the matter is made of. It's about light. It's about energy. It's about motion. It really explains how a lot of things in our physical world works. And so it can be applied in a lot of different areas. I got to have a couple summer jobs where I did research and I decided that was something that I wanted to continue to do because you got to um, try to understand how processes work, try to develop new information and add to the body of knowledge. And so that really required graduate school. So I went up north to Stanford University and got a master's and PhD. And this time it was actually in the electrical engineering department. A few, a couple of years before I went off to graduate school when I was still an undergrad, NASA was in the middle of developing a very new vehicle at that time for space called the Space Shuttle. And they wanted to select people who would be able to do all the jobs on board, which involved not only piloting, but a lot of it, what it was going to be used for was experiments, science experiments, technology development. And so they were really looking for people who had studied science or engineering or mathematics or medicine. They were certainly interested in medical doctors as well. And the first astronaut class that they picked to train specifically for this new vehicle, the space shuttle, uh, was the first one to include women, six women, and the first one to include minority astronauts. So it was a huge deal at the time. Uh, this was in 1978. And even though I had just gotten into science and I wasn't really thinking about space or the astronaut program at all, I just remember that as being um, a really big deal. So after I was in graduate school, near the end of my first year, the space shuttle flew for the first time. And then two years later, Sally Ride flew, the first American in space. And that was another huge milestone that people all across the country um, were watching and following along. And not only was Sally a woman like I was, but she majored in physics like I had. She had gone to Stanford, which is where I was currently a graduate when she flew in space. And I think I really needed to see all those things in common for me to think about, well, maybe this is something that I could do. And it wasn't something I really thought about before that. But I'm hoping as you look around today at, at all of the um, booths and materials and activities that maybe some of the kids are going to start thinking about that much younger than I did and make some good decisions. For example, in high school, take, take the science and math classes that you need. But uh, also communication, you know, reading and writing and speaking is important for almost any job that you have. And if you happen to be bilingual and are able to do that in more than one language, you are even well ahead of a lot of other people in terms of who you can communicate to. So it was when I finished that I did myself for the astronaut program, but I have to admit, I didn't expect I would ever hear back from NASA because I knew thousands of people sent in their applications and I couldn't really picture how they were going to pull my application out of all of that. Um, and NASA doesn't do an astronaut selection every year. It might be every three or four or five years, just depending on when they knew astronaut, need new astronauts. But a couple of years later, I did get called by NASA. I got the chance to go to Johnson Space Center for the first time and interview. Um, talk to some actual astronauts, find out more about what the job was like, see the training facilities. Um, and I wasn't selected that year, but I was encouraged to keep my application updated so that a few years down the road when they did another selection, uh, I could be considered again. And I also realized there were some things that I could do to make myself a better candidate. So I was uh, mainly doing research, working in a lab, writing up papers, presenting my results at conferences, but I didn't really have any operational experience. And of course, as, as the astronaut job, not only are you a scientist or engineer, but you also have to operate in a spacecraft. 
So I went and got my private pilot's license. And then I also decided I wanted to work for NASA, even if I was never selected as an astronaut. And so I worked at one of uh, NASA's research centers um, up in the Bay Area, NASA Ames Research Center. And three years later, I got to interview again. And that time I was selected along with 22 other people uh, as the 13th group of astronauts ever selected by NASA. Well, over the next 12 years or so, um, first of all, I trained with uh, my group of astronauts and then I got assigned to a mission and then I got to fly in space four times on the space shuttle um, for a total of 41 days in space. So what is it that we do up there? Uh, my first two missions were about studying the Earth and particularly the Earth's atmosphere. And maybe some of you in school have studied a little bit about the ozone hole or ozone depletion um, and some of the problems that are being caused by chemicals that hu humans use on the earth that make their way up into the upper atmosphere. When it destroys ozone, it allows ultraviolet light from the sun to reach the earth, which is harmful to humans and other life. So we had a number of science um, instruments on board that were measuring chemicals in the atmosphere to give us a good idea of what was really going on. I can remember coming back from those flights and talking to the scientists who had developed one of the instruments and asking him, well, is there anything that we as astronauts could do better um, to help you learn more, or get more out of your instruments? And he said, well, you could stay up longer. And uh, at the time, the shuttle would, you know, would usually be up for you know, 10 or 12 days or so. Uh, NASA was already working on the idea of a, state, a space station that would stay in orbit essentially, you know, for many, many years. And uh, it's an international space station. And I got to spend a good part of my career working on the international space station. And my third and fourth flights were part of building the international space station. Uh, one of them was the very first shuttle to dock with the station. Um, before it even had a way to support people living on board, its own life support system, and so there wasn't a crew on board, but we were transferring supplies in preparation for the first crew. And then three years later, I got to go back. Um, by this time, people were living on board. We had sent up a laboratory where they were working. Uh, we had an airlock so they could go outside and, and help with the assembly. Uh, we had a robot arm on the station that was uh, helping with assembly and to um, work on repairs. And uh, so we, were, we added a big, big piece of the truss structure to the station. And over the next several years, um, that truss structure grew about 350 feet long. And now the four large solar arrays are attached to it, which provide power not only to the U.S. lab, but to uh, laboratories that were sent up by the European Space Agency and also the Japanese Space Agency. So even though um, this whole international effort wasn't something I originally thought about, I was really glad to be part of something where countries around the world are working together for the benefit of people on Earth. So all of the time that I was at NASA and I ended up spending 30 years there, including in a variety of leadership positions, I had the opportunity to speak at a lot of schools and for kids um, in after school programs designed um, just like this STEM event to introduce STEM to students and provide hands-on activities. So I wanted to thank the Columbia Memorial Science Center for hosting the city of STEM, LA's largest science program that brings together over 100 science organizations. So thank you. The Columbia Memorial Science Center is a hands-on center designed to ignite creativity, just like I, what I talked about at the beginning. And I also want to thank the sponsor, Financial Partners Credit Union, and the title sponsor, Amgen Foundation. So thank you. With all the outreach that I've done, I have especially focused on reaching out to kids who aren't well represented in STEM. Um, particularly girls, particularly Latinx students. And as I talked about, it's really about reaching out and thinking about uh, the kind of curiosity and problem solving that you might like to do every day. 
and bringing it to, um, to solve challenges in our community. So the final thing that I wanted to mention is, is that with the publishers, Lily, so they have booth, I'm working on creating a series of bilingual board books for young kids to introduce STEM concepts to kids. And my first book, We Are All Scientists, or Todos Somos Científicos, is part of a new series that I'm working on to, um, that's going to be published at the end of August. And I hope you'll look for that and also look for the book today. Uh, they also have other STEM books. So thank you so much. We're so happy to be part of your City of STEM event. All right, everyone, we're going to do a big selfie. We're going to take a picture this way. So make some noise. Thank you, Atlanta Trail. Thank you for being here. Have a great, wonderful day. Take care. <laughs> Uh, Woo! We are back. That was an amazing, amazing yes, was. keynote. We had a chance to hear from Ellen Achoa herself. If you had an opportunity to be here in person, you'd probably have a chance to meet her, but hopefully y'all felt that uh, presentation live wherever you're tuning in from. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, it was great. Uh, great. Awesome. Uh, we have ourselves some stuff from uh, Mirad City of STEM partners that will be coming up. Little talk to our sponsors who uh, keep us alive, the City of STEM, you know, who who uh, help us bring out people like Ellen Ochoa and, yep. uh, you know, eventually uh, different people like that, like uh, Jason Latimer, right? Yep. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be exactly. great. Exactly. And then we'll go into a musical performance by Music Notes as well, too. So, so many amazing things still on the agenda for today, yes, live on the main stage. Uh, so, yes, let's check out a word from uh, some of our uh, sponsors here. You know, Ellen Ochoa, she, uh, she talked about... Her. by the sea struck by lightning as a baby she survived that's pretty crazy townsfolk said her wit and vigor awoke oh, when the lightning hit her said to be a sickly child the lightning struck and she turned wild clever mary what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down clever mary what have you learned the books abound and pages turn clever mary what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages turn? Mary's pastor urged his flock with faith in God and also walked. So clever Mary, raised by the sea, her first love was geology. With brother Joe, faithful pup Jay, Mary searched for vertebrae. A lifeline for a family poor, for Mary fossils were much more. Devil's fingers, vertebraries, the search was no hobby for Mary. Her knowledge grew extraordinary, a science born at the forefront. Clever Mary! What have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned of books abound and pages turn? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned of books abound and pages turn? Fossil hunting in Lime Regis was extremely dangerous. Unstable fish freshly collapsed is where the Indian shores were trapped. Clever Mary was tight for limb to find the final specimens. Ichthyoplesio pterosaur, Mary discovered evermore. Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned when books abound and pages turn? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned when books abound and pages turn? But being a woman 
was quite common, the practice was still frowned upon, and though clever Mary knew more than most, she was never allowed to publish her Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the wax and picks to Clever Mary, what have you learned the books are found in pages there? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the wax and picks to Clever Mary, what have you learned the books are found in pages there? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the wax and picks to Clever Mary, what have you learned the books are found in pages there? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the wax and picks to Clever Mary, what have you learned the books are found in pages Okay, we're almost set for the Music Notes performance. Uh, we're going to have a little Music Notes performance by uh, Jimmy Pasiasio and Lamar Queen of Musical Notes, an educational music company. Tell us more about them. Yes, they're an educational music company. Uh, two educators right here from South Central Los Angeles. They're going to bring you some engaging and fun, fun STEM education excitement. And I'm the Hip Hop MD, so this is right up my alley. I'm super excited to hear the performance, but I'm sure you all are as well. So let's check out Music Notes live on the main stage right now. Let's go. City of Stereo. Baby, baby, what time is it? Five, five, put time in it. Baby, students we notice that integers is one song that our students sometimes struggle with but after hearing our songs they understand the information and they can recall the concept that's right we wrote these students for this song for our students at la academy middle school and um when we wrote it i decided i was going to cover adding and subtracting d i want to do multiplic multiplying and dividing and so um concepts are memorized through these songs it's a good supplemental material for teachers <laughs> You check us out on our website, y'all. Let's get it. The integers, whole numbers and the opposites. And don't forget the zero, please. Don't forget the zero. And these are positive and negative numbers on the number line. Oh, yes, it's math time, y'all. Integers, whole numbers and the opposites. And don't forget the zero, please. Don't forget the zero. And these are positive and negative numbers on the number line. Oh, yes, it's math time. Hey. Negative one. And positive one, those opposites, when you add them up, you get zero, they cancel each other out. Now don't say, Mr. Queen, what you talking about? And when you have two negative numbers, you put it together like, like negative three plus negative four is negative seven. Or you can do it like this, negative four plus negative two is negative six. Yeah, as simple as that. But when you have one negative and one positive, then you gotta subtract. Like negative nine plus five, negative four. Oh, my God. 
say is when you multiply or divide, and it's negative. What is one number zero when you multiply or divide by another number? You get zero. Hey, sit your our educational resources on musicnotesonline.com. We have over 150 songs and videos that teach students. That's right. Now, this next song we're getting into is a fun one for us. We got to partner with a company named Illumina. They are the leaders in the technology that scientists use to study DNA and the human genome. And so we're going to get into that, all right? This is DNA, y'all. Hey, my DNA. Hey, I see my acid my Forensics like fingerprints and DNA to turn a medical treatment from DNA. Hair color, eye color, and skin from DNA. Genes from your ancestors to link your DNA. Study DNA to find holes in your genetic code. DNA tells us things that we didn't know. DNA shows mutated cells. Let's find the reason before we get DNA. Living things have genes and DNA. We can learn a lot studying DNA. Like who did it? Not me. Where did I come from? Where? Why am I sick? Not me. Watching the creek discover the structure of DNA. Through my veins. 
want to give a, another shout out to Illumina for allowing us to partner with them with that song, DNA. We actually did another song with Illumina that's called Genomics. This was our first song that we did with them. That's right. And we're going to let the video play for you. Genomics is the study of the human genome. And in this song, we talk about some careers you can pursue in genomics and, um, and all the cool things that come along with it. So go ahead and check out this video and then we'll be back with our last couple songs. Genomics, genes, DNA, information, genomes, I study DNA, I'm cracking the code, I study genomes, genes, DNA of people, chromosomes, consistent DNA, and genetics, I study genes, genes, are section of a genome, that's what I'm gonna do. Do you know what DNA is? DIT virus. The structure of the molecule DNA. TGC, a base pair, nucleic acids for DNA. Genomics, genes, DNA, information, genomes. Genetics, genes, DNA, genes, DNA, genes, DNA, Genomes, a complete set of genes, genetic material, in the cell know what I mean. We know three pairs of chromosomes, and each cell 23 pairs of chromosomes. One set of chromosomes comes from your mom, one from your dad, genome makes sense. Coming up, a middle school math teacher raps to garner his students' attention. And guess what? It works so well. Now he's on a nationwide tour with a stop in D.C. Tells you how many parts there are in total. So you can find this on musicnotesonline.com and all of our resources that teach students how to be successful in life. So this is Understanding Fraction. Fraction A over B. Numerator we talk B is the number equal equal part. A is the number of the shaded part. Shaded part. You can use any number for your A. For your A. You can use any number for your B. Except zero. Fraction A over B. The numerator A. Denominator B. We talking fraction. Let's take the circle. Cut it in the A equal part. Each part is one eighth of a circle. There are eight total parts. So that B or your denominator. The bottom is the same two parts. Eight is doing that's three out of eight parts. The fraction three eighths. Now let's take a square. Better in the each part. Four total parts. Four total denominator. Bottom part your denominator. If you say two parts, A is your numerator. So. Yo. 
And um, that's our goal as educators, give our students opportunities to take And guess what? It worked so well. Now he's on a nationwide tour with a stop in D.C. And today he's stopping by the Great Day Studio. Sim Kim. Coming up, a middle school math teacher raps to garner his students' attention. And guess what? It worked so well. Now he's on a nationwide tour with a stop in D.C. And today he's stopping by the Great Day Studio. Sim Kim. Sim Kim. These fractions right here, I can compare. Compare any fraction, anytime, anywhere. Numerator's the same. Check out denominators. Which one is greater? Which one is smaller? Look at two whole pieces. Cut them up in equal pieces. One made of two pieces. The other has eight. Which one is greater? Which one is less? Pieces are smaller than two equal pieces cut from a pizza. Yeah. A fraction is something that's cut up into equal parts. Comparing, comparing two fractions is this where you start. Numerator's the same. Look at denominators. Which one is bigger? That fraction is smaller. When comparing fractions, I have to use greater than, less than, or equal to. Equal to. Look at the numerators, they're the same, so I look at the bottom. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'll give an example. We both have an apple pie. I cut mine up in five equal pieces. You cut yours up into three equal pieces. Now take a look and see at what fractions we have. I have one fifth, you have one third. One fifth is less than one third. Because if you take one of my pieces and one of yours, my piece is smaller. Yep, comparing, comparing, comparing. I'll draw a picture to show all my work. Make diagrams and I hope it won't hurt. A fraction is something that's cut up into equal parts. Comparing, comparing two fractions is this where you start. Denominator is the same. Check numerators. Which one is bigger? That fraction is bigger. When comparing fractions, I have to use greater than, less than, or equal to. Look at denominators, they're the same, so I look at the top. Here's an example 2 over 8 and 4 over 8. These fractions show how much cake we ate. Which one is less and which one is great? Turn. Since we can see the bottoms are the same, the fraction is greater with the bigger numerator. 2 over 8 is less than 4 over 8. You can do 
fractions Anytime, any place A fraction is something that's cut up into equal parts Comparing, comparing two fractions, this is where you start Numerators the same, look at denominators Which one is bigger? That fraction is smaller that's A, A fraction, fraction is something that's cut up into equal parts Come on, comparing, comparing two fractions, this is where we start Denominators the same, check numerators which one is bigger? That, that fraction one. is bigger. Yes, yes. There Woo! it is, yes. Hey. Oh, I love that. Because of that song, I was able to finish my homework. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lamar Queen, the rapping math teacher. Tell us how you got started. Um, my first year teaching. One half and two fourths. Thirds and four sixths. Eight twelfths and two thirds. Six tenths and three fifths. Take any fraction, multiply your numerator by your number greater than one, and then take the same number, multiply by the denominator. Get a fraction that's equivalent. Let's look at three fifths. Multiply by two over two to six over ten to three fifths and six tenths are equivalent. Pick a number, multiply with your numerator and denominator for equivalent. Mr. D drove half a mile, cut the mile in two, two weeks apart. I drove one space, multiply by four over four, you get four eighths. Of a mile is Mr. Q, you ease place. Mr. Q's mile is cut in equal part. Then he went for his faces. Let's see where we are. Mr. D and Mr. Q, but the same This is what it means is one half and four eighths are equivalent. Just gotta multiply, or you can divide. This is how you divide. Equivalent fraction. But how the same value multiplied or divide. This is how you divide. Equivalent fraction. Take a fraction, divide the numerator by a factor that is greater than one that is shared for the denominator. Then you gotta take the same factor and divide with the denominator. Try five tenths, divide by five over five, you one over two, so five tenths and one half all equivalent. Take your factor and divide it with the numerator and denominator for equivalent. If a pizza was cutting six equal slices, then you took four. Is it the same amount? If it was cutting three equal slices, then you took two. Let's see if four, six, and two thirds are equivalent. Four, six, divide by two over two is two thirds. So four, six, and two thirds are equivalent. It's the same amount of pizza because it's part of a whole. So it means that the portions are equivalent. Just gotta multiply or you can divide. This is how you divide. When I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? I said, when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? I said, when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? Check it. I am a mathematician. When I do my work, you know I'm on a mission. I do a problem. Then I check my work. Does my answer make sense? Is it reasonable? That's the question that I ask every time I do math. I never do a problem and move to the next without asking myself, does it make sense? I can explain to a partner too. When you finish your work, that's what you're supposed to do. Yep, I cannot quit. When it comes to math, I'll never be content. Yes. I am it, and I always make sure my answers make sense. When you work with numbers that are compatible, that's how you know your answer is reasonable. Say when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? I said when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? 
never step in the class, don't disrespect. You can solve any problem, that's a bet. Guess and check is what you need to do When you're solving a problem and you're unsure what to do I solve a problem and I do more than just work it out I So sorry for all the technical difficulties. Bear with us. It's our first year after COVID. We're getting it done. But yeah. hopefully you guys enjoyed at least the mu their music videos. They had some pretty fire stuff. I was getting jiggy with it. Yeah. Loved it. <laughs> Got the whole science-y, math -y in their music. But now we're going on to a new topic, a new event that we have here at the City of STEM. It's called the Icon Award, where we uh, highlight people who have really, you know, shown the City of STEM spirit and what we stand for. Uh, the first person who has uh, gained the reward is someone called Miguel Ordenaya. He's an environmental education and, and wildlife biologist. He works at National History Museum, which we weren't quite able to get to you. But at least we, you know, uh, get a sprinkle in a little bit of National History Museum here for you guys. And uh, he is dedicated to making science and uh, access to nature more um, accessible, which is literally what City of STEM is all about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other uh, a winner that's uh, going to be not that's going to be celebrated today is Nicole Whiteman. She is the CEO of the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation. Uh, really, really important because they're making STEM accessible as well uh, to students and beyond here in the Los Angeles area. They provide hands on STEM curriculum and programming to elementary and middle school teachers uh, and students. So we are absolutely honored to be able to showcase these icons today on the main stage for all of you. Uh, so without further ado, let's check them out. Congratulations, guys. City of STEM. The time. Uh, so Downey is very, very dear to me. Uh, my, both my kids were actually born in Downey too. Um, but I, I'm excited that we're here. I'm excited that all of us have uh, decided to bring our kids and introduce them and and um, show the STEM and careers in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math are very much part of us as well. And at Little Libros, um, Little Libros, if you don't know what Little Libros is, it's a bilingual chance company. Both um, I and my partner, Mariana, who started back in 2016, with a, with a celebrate our less culture, introduce that to children through books. And also encourage parents us to read our kids, not just in English, just that is so important. And, um, we are sometimes uh, in the past, we hope for the and and we like celebrate. Celebrate. Not just that, but who are as a community, right? uh, as a community. we have rich stories. So, in for a very long time, we didn't have anything that representation in media, in books, in movies, in film, and television. Representation of us, where we come from, our stories, the uniqueness of us. So, it's really important for us to do that through our books because uh, books are the first form of media we introduce our children to. And like Dr. Ochoa said earlier, it is so important that our children grow up loving to read. Books allow our children to travel without leaving our living room. They allow our children to read books that don't exist. They allow our children to build empathy and it allows our children to other people that are different than us. That's the power of reading. And we have been doing that since 2014. And last year, we began to think about the other layers of 
important foundation for our children that is not just reading but it's also science because science is all around us science is here right now science is in the in that little wind you feel right now science is in the fact that we're standing up science is in us breathing science is, is in connecting and we want to make sure that we understand that science is is very much part of us it's not something foreign it's not something impossible we just brought on dr ochoa to show our kids that someone with that last name can go to space. How wonderful is that? Someone from children of immigrants can go to space. How beautiful is that? You know, just right now, I just spoke to a, a mom and her young seven-year-old told me that he's gonna be the next president. You know, that's the level of energy we need to encourage our children to have. And that starts with reading. And what I want all of us to do is to promise ourselves as parents that we're going to continue fostering that foundation at home. And now that we are building at Little Libros a STEAM program with our books, we're Knowing more than one opens the doors to places that we're not even part of yet. You know, I started my career at 16 years old. Um, I, I, Linwood, I come from, I'm from Linwood, Linwood High School. One morning, me and my girlfriend got in my mom's car, and, it, and, I, and I told my mom that I had detention that morning. I lied to her. I don't, I don't condone anyone lying to their parents, but I did. Instead, I drove to, we drove to uh, Kiss FM that morning, so I wanted to get tickets to see NSYNC. That's what we wanted. And by, by the power of the universe, they, uh, uh, the producer of that, of that morning show at that time allowed us to walk in and I was 16 years old when that happened and we went on the air and we got the tickets we wanted to and sing these four girls from Linwood 16 year old girls and I was I'm walking out of the studio my heart's telling me Patty you have to ask a question you have to ask a question but I was so embarrassed and I was so scared to ask it and I'm like we're walking into the elevator with the producer and I'm like, I only, I only have this one minute before he walks us down and I never get to see this person again. And if I don't ask this question, my chance is over. I will never have this chance. And right when the door opened, I felt the courage and me to ask, are you guys hire me at 16? And he says, well, how old are you? And I go, oh, I'm 16. I'm like, well, we're not, you're too young to get, you know, to be hired. Uh, you have to go to college, you know, for an internship. He said, but how about this? How about, you know, you give me your information. If, if anything opens up, I'll call you. And I never thought anything, any of that would, you know, anything would happen of that. And two weeks later, my phone rings at home. That's before we didn't have cell phones back then. I think you guys remember parents. There's no cell phones. And my phone rings and it's this, the voice of that producer. And he says, hey, can you come by to Burbank to help us out? And I was like, you're kidding. And I didn't even think twice. I said, I said, yes, and I'll figure out how to get there. You know, so I went with the tell, I went to talk to my mom. And I was like, how am I going to talk to my mom about this? How am I going to tell her how this even happened? So I'm like, you know what, mom, remember that one time I told you I had attention? Well, I'm sorry, I was lying to you. Actually, I was going, I went to a radio station. What did you choose? <laughs> and I asked if they were hiring. Well, they're not hiring, but um, they're asking if I could go if I can um if I can go help them. And my beautiful mother sing mom at that time. Don't have a she had to take the keys and I'll take the bus to to work. And if it wasn't for my mom's support. 
the career that I have been able to build and the career that I have been able to do, the dreams that I've had growing up, if it wasn't for my mom's support, it wouldn't have happened. If it wasn't for my mom's support, I wouldn't have worked with Ryan Secrets for 17 years. If it wasn't for my mom's support, I wouldn't have had the courage to create with the libros. If it wasn't for my mom's support, I wouldn't be standing here with you all. And that's how important it is for you, us parents to support our kids' dreams, no matter how silly they sound. And even if we don't understand them. And she took the bus to work and she never complained once. And she didn't even understand what the heck I was doing in Burbank. But she did it because she knew that that's what I wanted to do. At 16 years old, I would drive to Burbank and 17. Um, and then um, I got hired. I got hired. And that's what it takes. It takes for parents to believe in our kids. And that make it, you know, challenging. And I, and I told my son the other day because he wants to be a, a gamer. He's 11. Parents, I have to hold back on, on screen time. You know, but he is 11 and all his buddies at school now play screen time. And he doesn't like it when I take away screen time. You know, when I push him, I take him away from Minecraft. He gets upset with me. And I tell him. A lot of people are going to be walls toward your dream, including your mother. Because there's going to be many times that I don't understand what you love. And sometimes because I am human, I want the best for you. But I'm also a wall toward, you know, toward your dream many times because I have, I have blind spots. But if this is what you really, really want, if this is what your heart tells you to do, Whatever it is, whether it's playing Minecraft, whatever it is, you have to find a way to jump over that wall, even if it's your mother. You know, even if it's your mom, even if she does it, you know, if I do it with love, but we cannot ever, ever hold our children back because we are afraid. And while I don't want him to spend too much time screen time, if this is what he wants to do, he will find a way to do it. If that's what he's meant to do, he will find a way to do it. Our ch children find a way. And all we have to do as parents is support that way in one way or another. So I'm really happy that you are all here because I'm sure there's so many kids here that are dreaming of becoming scientists, engineers, artists. I say artists because I think we don't think that art is a career but it's very much a career. You get writers, illustrators, all those are beautiful careers. And our children really want to be part of that. I recently volunteered um, in, in Watts. We were, giving, we were handing out toys, soccer balls, footballs, and basketballs. And I was in charge of welcoming the kid to the, to the room and ask him to choose either, you, you either have to choose a ball or an art kit. And I was so surprised that boys, the, the amount of boys that chose art kits over balls. And that made me so happy to see because we are encouraging our boys to love art because that should, they should love art. Boys are not meant to just play sports. Boys are also meant to create. And that made me so happy to see, and I'm very surprised to see that. We had soccer ball, football, and basketball from so many kids given the opportunity because they were asked, what do you want? I didn't assume that they wanted a ball. I asked the boys and the girls too. And then I did find that many girls chose balls. And that also made me very happy. We have to ask our kids, where do, what do you want to do? What makes you happy? What brings you joy? And to me, what brings me joy is when I can see my children 
having agency, even if I'm a wall many times. I'm very thankful to be here. Dr. Ochoa is backstage. She hasn't left. Uh, she'll be back in about 50 minutes. She will be signing books at our booth. So please, um, in 50 minutes, sign up if you want to have an opportunity to meet the first Latina, Ochoa. That last name, man, who's not part of that? And Ochoa went to space. A granddaughter of immigrants went to space. And I want all the kids here, I want them to meet her. So she'll be signing uh, our books there at 1 p.m. at a little libro fruit. So please, in about 50 minutes, go hang out. And thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, please give it up for Patty Rodriguez, everyone. Home, hometown person, basically. This is fantastic. This is so great. Um, hey, uh, so definitely go visit the Little Libros tent. Not right now, though. We're coming up right in this right in this very second. But when we're done with the next thing, Cynthia, you can go to the tent. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you go over there and get those books because they're super awesome. But right now, it is my pleasure to introduce the STEM Icon Award winner for 2022. So here's the deal. City of STEM does the STEM Icon Award every year. It's a big honor. We've had some fantastic people who've gotten this award. Um, they have to either further the, um, the, further the cause of STEM education in LA. They have to have contributed to STEM in LA somehow, but most importantly, they're local. They're local, they're here. Their influence is based here. And I am so excited. We actually, because this is our first in-person event in a couple of years, we actually have two Icon Award winners this year. Not one, but two. One is here, the other is not, which is fine. And I'm gonna introduce right now. So our first Icon Award winner is Nicole Whiteman. She's the CEO of the LA Dodgers Foundation. Unfortunately, she could not be here with us today, but we are gonna be sending her award. She, um, something came up in the past couple of days. The LA Dodgers have been a great supporter of STEM. They contribute funding to a sports and science program that you may have seen around LA. So Nicole, thank you wherever you are. Thank you so much for, for all that you do and for your STEM Icon Award. Our co-Icon Award winner, our other Icon Award winner is here with us today. He is, he's almost like a media personality, I'd have to say. He's a wildlife researcher who works at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, one of our great supporters and great friends. But he also is the guy responsible for finding or discovering or coming across P-22. How many of you guys know about P-22, the mountain lion? Yeah, an LA icon who found an LA icon. Give it up for our STEM icon award winner 2022, Mr. Miguel Ordenena. Ooh, come on up, and his friend. <laughs> and Miguel, thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to, to be able to give you the STEM Icon Award for 2022, um, presented to Miguel for your passion and commitment to advancing STEM in, throughout greater Los Angeles. <laughs> and Miguel is a real scientist, Really great guy, and we're gonna to listen to him now. So thank you, give it up for Miguel, everyone. And also a little bit shorter than that. All right, <laughs> All right. thank you so much for having me. This is an honor. Um, I'm still... Um, especially in my hometown here in LA, especially in front of people that I care and love uh, very deeply, my family, uh, fellow scientists, and leaders in STEM. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues, it's, it's a big event, but the STEM community is pretty small. And so uh, there's people that know me very well in the audience and that know that I love the spotlight. I love having a lot of attention on me. So 
they're watching me squirm up here. They're getting a little bit of entertainment, um, which is good. Um, but I'm embracing this one. Uh, this has the word icon attached to it. And icon has a lot of weight attached to it. Um, but I honestly had to Google it. I, I didn't know exactly what that meant till I Googled it. And that moment of understanding that this means that I've made some sort of impact and been um, in a very positive way in a particular sphere, and that, that sphere being the LA STEM community, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so for that reason, um, it's, it's truly, I mean, especially because I was voted by fellow STEM community members. And I know how tireless they are, how generous they are with their time. And for them to choose me about amongst a lot of heroes that are here today uh, in these booths that I hope you all can visit, um, that just means it's really touching to me. Um, and, but to be receiving this in LA, my hometown, that's special for a few reasons. For one, yes, because I love LA. Um, it's, it's where I grew up. But also, it's also a place that for, until very, very recently was never thought of as a place where nature existed or at least a place where nature worth preserving or protecting existed. And obviously that's not the case. Look at where we are today. We have multiple booths celebrating STEM, celebrating nature. We have organizations from all over the place, not only being here and, and talking about how science is important, but also that it's accessible, that it's fun, and that it's for everyone, regardless of your background, even if you look like me. Um, and so that's, that's extremely meaningful. And, and what other proof that do we need? Then yes, a, a festival like this, like City of STEM, we have P22 Day, we have Nature Fest at the Natural City Museum. We have all these celebrations of nature. And on top of that, LA is also home to this guy over here, P22. And he's arguably the most famous, most impactful individual animal ever in our history. And for me to be a part, a small part of that story, for me to be able to discover this individual and help basically be his uh, promoter uh, in a way is an honor to me. And the P22 story is extremely so impactful that it started 10 years ago. And now 10 years later, we have a, the biggest wildlife crossing ever that's ever been built in the world in the most urban setting that's going to break that break ground in just a few weeks 80 plus million dollars it took to raise across 10 years to make this not only a, a place where nature is respected but now this is a destination for conservation for stem people want to come from all over the world including celebrities that people revere, um, just to see our nature, just because they know that P-22 is here, his story is here, and what better way to honor that legacy and that story? And so if you're don't, not familiar with the P-22 story, 10 years ago, a mountain lion escaped the Western Santa Monica Mountains because he was facing a lot of competition over space, food, territory, and he made an unprecedented journey crossing two freeways. The first one, the 405 freeway. Who's been on the 405 freeway? Who likes being on the 405 freeway? No, right? Nobody does. And then he went through a lot of fancy neighborhoods like Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Studio City, never was seen. Then crossed another 10 lane freeway, the 101 freeway. And then entered into Griffith Park and established that as his home. And that blew people's mind, at least here locally. Then National Geographic got wind of this. They came out to the same park and took probably one of the most famous wildlife photos ever of P-22 in front of the Hollywood sign. And what more of a statement do you need for people to respect nature, to respect LA? It's not just a place for smog, beautiful people like us, movie stars, 
but also it's a very important and unique place for nature. And we should all take pride in that because there's no other place like it. But meanwhile, our mountain lions throughout Southern California are about to go extinct, especially in the Santa Monica Mountains. And we need to bring attention to that. And not only the fact that scientists, traditional scientists are the ones that are gonna protect them, but no, it's all of us. It's all of us that made this campaign to build this wildlife crossing that's gonna save them from extinction, a reality. Not just the white community, the Latinos, African-American community, everybody to make this really crazy idea a reality. And at its core, why P22's story has been so impactful is because at its core, it's a story of coexistence, that coexistence is possible, even in a mountain lion living in the middle of the city, where in a park, that's probably the, the most popular park in the country, and, or in the city at least, gets thousands of people a day. And there's a mountain lion living there and he's been there for 10 years. And as long as we give them the space that they need, we can coexist, we can coexist with anything. And that's a really powerful message. But also his story is about overcoming barriers. And as a Latino, I come from a legacy of a community that is very familiar with overcoming barriers. And so I don't understand um, um, when people are excluding us from con discussions and conversations about wildlife conservation, figuring out ways to be creative and, um, and send out powerful messages, inspiring messages. Latino community has been all about that for a long time. And my family, like a lot of Latino stories, they came here as immigrants with nothing not speaking the language, but using their work ethic and their value in family to persevere. My grandfather, for instance, who came here from Nicaragua, any Nicaraguans in the house? Central Americans? Okay, this is a big ego boost for the Mexicans in the crowd. Any Mexicans in the audience? Yeah, I knew it would be. <laughs> Story of my life. Uh, so this, opportunity here is amazing because my family came here like a lot of other families latino families with nothing not speaking in language and my grandfather in particular was wheelchair bound um, after a very violent incident very sad and he he supported his entire family running a business out of his garage um, and in a flea market on the weekends and made a, made a life for everybody in his family and, and an amazing uh, inspiration for me. And I'm proud to have his name, Miguel Angel. I'm the fourth, he was the second. Uh, my son's here in the crowd, the fifth. Um, and it's an honor to be talking to people that have firsthand experience with that journey, immigrating to this country, struggling to make something of themselves and their family out of nothing. And those that are here now that are benefiting from that legacy. And there's a parallel there between that experience and the experience of wildlife. Wildlife are persecuted, they're displaced, they're voiceless. And I know what it feels like to have that experience. And I'm sure a lot of people in this audience do as well. But whether, but what better way to show what our strength is as a Latino community, as any community who finds value in family and hard work, than to uplift the voiceless. And that is the Latino community and other immigrant communities, other marginalized communities here in LA, but that's also wildlife. And let's uplift them, these voiceless animals that are struggling to survive we have a deep history of beautiful animals being here. We have the La Brea Tar Pits booth over there showing us that pumas, mountain lions, have been here for thousands of years since the Ice Age. And it's our job now to make sure that they're here for future generations and that everybody is a part of those conversations, and people, including people that look like me. 
So thank you very much. It was an honor to be here to be presented with this award and I won't take it lightly. And uh, it's gonna be driving me to be doing even better. Um, and I appreciate everybody trying to do the same. I opening windows, opening doors for, for the next generation to show that the STEM community, wildlife conservation is something that needs us, needs us all. And I hope that my, my speech today lets people know that, yes, there are some conservation heroes, STEM heroes like Elena Ochoa that all of us look up to, but there are inspirations all around us, right under our nose, like my grandfather, like my mother here in the audience, like my father, like my cousin, like all of you who face barriers and power through it for a better life and a better future for both humans and wildlife. So thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Did I say that right? Yes. 2022 STEM Icon Awardee, Miguel Ordenena. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I have to say the message of representation is what City of STEM is all about. It is a place, the third part of our vision is that everyone, everyone feels like they're part of the ongoing STEM story of LA. Nature, physics, whatever it is, chemistry. It's about all of us. All right. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Again, he's about to get uh, about to get some media attention, which is awesome. Hey, everybody! In two minutes, in two minutes, we have the world champion magician and the star and principal personality of the Sony-produced YouTube show Impossible Science is going to be taking the stage, wowing you not just science, but with magic. And I, this is a point in the program where I have to thank one of our sponsors specifically, the Academy of Magical Arts. City of All righty. Congratulations to Miguel Ordenaya and Nicole uh, Whiteman. So, again, they deserve the Icon Awards. That was a great showing of the Icon Awards. And now, uh, without further ado, I am so excited to uh, introduce Jason Latimer. He is a world champion magician. He's a creator of Impossible Science in San Diego, California. He will be giving, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, magic show talent shows. Yes, yes. Bringing the magic to science. He is live here on the main stage. So check out Jason Latimer, Impossible Science. Let's go. City of Stem. For 25 years, Discovery Cube audiences have been wowed by the most amazing bubble extravaganza ever created, Bubble Fest. And now you can become a bubble expert by completing Discovery Cube Connect's Backyard Bubble Fest. Join celebrity bubble artist Melody Yang as she teaches the science and secrets of this unique craft. Advance your skills from basic bubbles all the way to more advanced tricks, earning your Backyard Bubble Badge. Learn the surprising science that makes these airy, shimmering orbs of goodness so magical. Let's start the adventure. For 25 years, Discovery Cube audiences have been wow. Today, we are celebrating Computer Science Education Week all across the 720 square miles that encompasses LA Unified. 
So my students were trying to figure out a way to help design for those further away from power. We were making a prototype so that we can help other students with autism express themselves. So some of them had designed a sweater where he pressed the finger if you moved it. It said, hi, my name is. Another one said, I'm hungry. For me, it's like a whole new world. So I feel grateful to have access to those things because I can really do a lot more to help others. They're integrating language arts, they're integrating art, they're integrating music, and so to put all of that together into something for good. I feel that coding is a way to help everybody, no matter who they are. So when you do an event like today, there's a couple of things that are happening. One, you're inviting the whole school to the table. If you have new students at the school that have maybe never engaged in computer science ever before, they have an opportunity to experience that today. The folks that came today are community stakeholders at our school. I wanted them to know this is what you've been investing in, this is what you've been partnering with us in. Those principals that come in and see, we've only been doing this for three or four months, this can be at your school too in just a short period of time. It's an important skill because you don't only learn how to code, but you also learn about life skills, so teamwork, patience, double checking. So even though you might not think about using coding as your future career, those skills that you have, you can take them with you anywhere in any job that you decide to do because you're always working with people around you. It's got a lot of design principles in it and logical thinking and that's what really computer science is and it's now critical across all fields and all careers, ways we communicate, everything. For so long, computer science was not really fully present in schools with high numbers of kids of color and low-income students. So in LA Unified, the demographics of our students is 73% Latino. However, the private industry in terms of computer science does not reflect that whatsoever. So if we were able to really provide that opportunity for access, we would also be having an impact on the industry. And so this computer science movement is really an equity movement. That's what the work is about, providing the opportunities for students who wouldn't have it otherwise, and really opening up the field for everyone. What we're seeing here is only one of the many initiatives that the Instructional Technology Initiative is undertaking. If you're not exposed to these kinds of opportunities, whether it's computer science or anything having to do with instructional technology, you don't know where you can go. That's a blocked off path for you. If we can change the computer science educational pathways of youth today, that they'll be able to take that knowledge into whatever career pathways they choose to pursue in the future to solve community issues and problems that need the diverse perspectives of many people to solve them. Welcome to Discovery Cube Connect's Farm to Kitchen Adventure, friends. From seeds to sprouts to organic fruits and veggies, this colorful adventure is a regular cornucopia of exciting, engaging, and scientific activities and videos that'll bring the fun of the farm right to your home, kitchen, and classroom. Heck, you'll become a regular green thumb and a farm to table expert as you advance down this exciting adventure path that'll produce smiles at each stop along the way and awaiting you at the completion of the adventure, your very own Let It Grow bags that you can add to your collection. Woo, that's fancy. It's Discovery Cube Connect's Farm to Kitchen Adventure. Have fun, young scientists. We'll be rooting for you. <laughs> You're about to soar into an airborne adventure, taking flight in and around your home with Discovery Cube Connect's Backyard Science Adventure, Flappers, Flutterers, and Flyers. In this one-of-a-kind hands-on adventure, you will become science experts, observing, studying, and investigating creatures that buzz, fly, and land in your backyard. Advance with each unique step and earn your Flappers, Flutterers, and Flyers badge. Butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, and other cool creatures await with loads of fun along the way. Let's start the adventure. Yeah. 
All righty, that is it for us. It has been a great day at the City of STEM here in Downey. Uh, we've learned so much, right? We've learned about yes. the NASA eyes. We've done uh, some. We've tried Natural History Museum. We've tried a lot. Sorry <laughs> for the technical difficulties. But uh, if you guys made it here, uh, you guys can still make it. We're going to go until like after the uh, into the afternoon. But uh, this has been Maynard and me. This yes. Any final remarks. Yes, it's been a fantastic event. It is not over yet. Uh, like Anthony said, you can still have a chance to come down here live in person to experience some amazing boots. Uh, we had some technical difficulties today that we worked through, but it's the nature of the business. We're in this virtual space. Uh, but nonetheless, Natural History Museum will still have some content coming for you later on, um, as well as the, uh, the aquarium as well too. And Jason Latimer, all those videos that you had that you missed, unfortunately, we'll be bringing back later on this afternoon. Uh, once we get into our video of our next partners, uh, you won't see our beautiful faces anymore. Uh, another amazing group of hosts will be coming in afterwards. And so they will continue the rest of the afternoon in this incredible City of STEM event. Uh, what was your highlight for today? My highlight, honestly, the, that, the NASA eyes. Honestly, yeah, really, really cool. opened my eyes now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, definitely we'll be using that tool later on whenever I need to uh, you know, study some things for my AP mm -hmm. Science class. Yes, you? absolutely. Uh, I, I, would, I would actually agree. I think that for me, that was definitely a highlight. You know, for me, I always love sharing uh, educational resources and tools that we can use because that science is all about the application, right? Yeah. It's one thing to just learn about these topics, but to be able to interact with them and to be able to physically touch, get hands on is absolutely incredible. And so we really thank Jeff and JPL for being able to showcase some tools that you all can use uh, every day and share with your students as well. Uh, so with that being said, it's been a pleasure hosting this event. It's been a pleasure getting to know you as that well, too, Anthony. Thank yes, so it's much. been absolutely a pleasure. Yes, and it's been a pleasure talking to all of you at home. Uh, we're going to go into some partner videos. They're going to showcase some amazing organizations that City of STEM is working with. And we might even share some video content that I produced as well, too, to get you more immersed into nature right here in Los Angeles. So thank you so much for your time and continue tuning in because there's lots more to come here at the 2022 virtual City of STEM event. <laughs> we'll see y'all soon. Ah. Southern California, known for its palm trees, beaches, Hollywood, beautiful women, and famous rap legends. People come from far and wide to enjoy everything the city has to offer, including the bright lights and free-flowing open roadways. Okay, maybe not, but there are a few other more hidden wonders of the Los Angeles region that don't always get as much attention. Hidden wonders that possess some very unique creatures that don't mind the spotlight, but also enjoy wet, rocky services. It's funny they say it never rains in Southern California, because without rain, this hidden creature would be long forgotten. In a previous Backyard Science video, we learned about the incredible ecosystem known as freshwater streams. These ecosystems, just like many others, possess an abundance of both abiotic and biotic factors that help the system flourish. Organisms that thrive in these environments have done so by developing unique adaptations that enable them to not only find food for survival, but also defend themselves from potential predators. And no species has become more adept to the freshwater stream habitat than this commonly known amphibian. Frogs and toads consist of over 7,300 species and are found all over the globe in moist, damp locations. Likely the most popular of all frogs, Kerbin himself, is actually a spitting resemblance of a frog species that was discovered in 2015, scientifically named Hyaline obotracheum dionae, or now just commonly known as Kermit. This glass frog found in the mountains of Costa Rica represents just one of many new species of frog that we continue to discover on a yearly basis. Just last year, I released a video all about taxonomy to help us in naming a new species of tree frog found in the cloud forests of Ecuador. Name suggestions came in from all across the globe, with the final winning scientific name being Hyloscirtus conscientia, or the Chacao cloud forest frog, appropriately named as a reminder of our need to be conscientious when dealing with our environment, as well as describing the location where this incredible species was discovered. Oh, this frog species right here is no different, as it too is appropriately named for the location that is commonly found, California. 
This is the California tree frog. Much like some of your favorite rappers that rep the state of California, such as Snoop Dogg, E-40, and Kendrick Lamar, this species isn't found throughout the state, but rather in a range that spreads throughout coastal Southern California, eastward to Joshua Tree National Park, and south all the way into Northern Baja California in Mexico. Ironically, it shares much of the same territory with another Cali native, the Baja California tree frog. Both species are similar in a number of ways, with the easiest differentiator being the distinct black stripe through the eye of the Baja California species. The California tree frog is primarily found in a pale coloration with dark markings, while the Baja California tree frog can be found in a variety of colors, including greens, grays, and brown. California tree frogs measure about one to two inches in length and have a rough textured skin perfectly blotched to match its surrounding habitat. Simply by sitting still on the rocks and boulders that make up its freshwater stream environment, these tree frogs can completely blend in, making them nearly invisible to would-be predators such as snakes and birds. They prefer slow-moving coastal and canyon streams with permanent quiet pools where they can hide, mate, and hunt for food. This species will typically feed on small insects, worms, spiders, centipedes, and any other small invertebrates it can fit in its mouth. So cool. But the question I'm sure you're all wondering is why they call California tree frogs when their habitat of choice is clearly rocks and other grounded fixtures. Well, why is little baby a fully grown adult? Why does the weekend make music on weekdays? Questions we may never know, but we do know this. Not all tree frogs live in trees. This family of amphibians is actually defined by their non-Balenciaga wearing, no Air Jordan having feet. The last bone in their toes, known as the terminal phalanx, has a claw-like shape, which along with specialized toe pads, enables them to climb trees, rocks, or other elements in their habitat. However, before developing into these tree or rock climbing specialists, these frogs, like most other amphibians, go through a metamorphosis. Males will mate with females in a love grasp known as amplexus, where the males will externally fertilize the female's eggs. The eggs are attached in clusters to twigs, leaves, and other debris in quiet pools, and eventually hatch into plant feeding tadpoles. After about 40 to 75 days, the tadpoles lose their tails and begin to form legs and a defined mouth. They then leave their underwater homes and roam freely as fully air-breathing juvenile tree frogs. So next time you make a visit to Cali, Think far beyond the Rodeo Drives and Melrose Streets. Look past the Santa Monica Piers and Beverly Hills Boulevards. Think of more than just leisurely strolls through Compton or Watts. Okay, probably not so leisurely, but there is one place where blue and red flags don't matter, but rather the pristine, fresh running waters of an ecosystem that one of California's own calls home. I'm the Hip Hop MD. This is Hip Hop Science, reminding you as always that curiosity is nature's PhD. Never stop asking. I've printed many different kinds of fish from all over the world. But when asked when, what is on my bucket list of fish to print, I would never reply anglerfish because it's a creature that I assumed I would never realistically encounter. That all changed when the folks at the LA County Natural History Museum invited me to document this pristine specimen in the way of kyotaku, which is an old form of Japanese taxidermy, where calligraphy ink is applied to the fish and a sheet of paper is rubbed onto the surface to create a print. Knowing that very few people in the world ever get to see one of these fish in person, it was such a huge privilege to be one of even fewer people to touch one as well as create a piece of art with it. There have been a lot of challenging fish printed in my career, but this one with its cactus-like spines, 
Protecting its soft, gelatinous skin was by far the most technically difficult fish I've ever worked with. Printing this particular angler fish was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me. I'm so grateful to have been able to share it with my family. I look forward to working with the museum staff again to add to the pages of natural history. My name is Lisa Gonzalez, and I am an Assistant Collections Manager in the Entomology Department at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I really love my job. I get to lead nature hikes, give presentations and tours of our insect collection, all with the goal of helping people discover the amazing insect diversity that exists in the world. The majority of my job consists of collecting insects for a research project called Bioscan. I can spend an entire day blissfully peering through a microscope at the tiny, beautiful creatures that are mostly unseen by the naked eye. Our entomology department has a collection of 6 million specimens from all over the world. Think of it like a library with each insect telling a story. Insects do just about every ecological job you can think of. They pollinate, they decompose, they are beneficial as predators and parasites and other insects, they are a major part of the food chain, the list goes on. Studying insects is essential if you want to understand what is happening in a particular habitat. That is what makes maintaining an entomology research collection so important. I have been fascinated by insects and spiders for as long as I can remember. I was always playing in the dirt and looking for bugs when I was little. I had no idea back then that I would continue to do that as an adult, as part of my job. My backyard was basically my field site. I spent many hours sifting through leaf litter and turning over rocks in search of hidden creatures, usually assisted by a cat or two. My mother told me that I would put roly-polies in my doll stroller and tell people they were my babies, which I don't remember doing, but I believe her. I didn't realize there was a whole community of people who were crazy about insects like me until I went to my first bug fair at the NHM. This would have been sometime in the late 90s. I think it was the 12th annual bug fair. My lovely mother offered to go with me. I was in my late teens and none of my friends related to my insect obsession. I think it was just keeping it to myself at that point. I walked into the Natural History Museum into a sea of people who were all bug obsessed. Kids who raised caterpillars and had little insect zoos in their rooms, just like me, who read every Ranger Rick article and memorized scientific names, just like I had done, and adults who had turned their childhood obsession into a profession. That was a huge revelation for me. Pretty soon after that first visit, I started volunteering at the museum in the insect zoo, feeding the insects and spiders, then working in education as a gallery interpreter. That was 22 years ago, and since then, I have been at every bug fair. Usually I was presenting live animals from the insect zoo, or releasing butterflies or moths in the butterfly pavilion, or being a judge for the bug chef competition. One year I was interviewed by Heel Hauser. That was pretty cool. Every year I talk to so many people about insects that I end up losing my voice. What do I love the most about bug fair? Seeing little kids who have attended for so many years who are now teenagers thinking about studying entomology in college. The entomology research department has a table in the main hall every year where we showcase specimens from our collection that the public normally doesn't get to see. Last year, we brought out our largest and smallest insects so people could see, for example, an adult beetle smaller than the head of a pin next to the largest beetles on earth, the Titan and the Goliath beetles. We also brought out the world's smallest fly, which was discovered by the curator of entomology, Dr. Brian Brown. The fly is 0.4 millimeters in size and named after Arnold Schwarzenegger because of its big, beefy legs. There are well over 1 million insects known to science and millions more that are waiting to be discovered. You don't have to go to the tropics to find new species. There are unknown insects right here in Los Angeles. That is why the Natural History Museum launched the Bioscan Project, the first large scale insect survey in a major city of its kind. We use special tent-like traps called malaise traps to collect samples of insects in yards and gardens across LA. Community scientists make this possible by allowing us to access their yards or public green spaces that they helped manage. Within the first few months of collecting, we found 30 new species of flies unknown to science. We are now up to 65 new species. Most of the insects we collect are really small and hard to appreciate with the naked eye alone. So I started taking photographs of them using a Keon's digital microscope. 
All of these insects in these photos are from Los Angeles. Most are about the size of a grain of rice. Some are much smaller. These are the insects that I get to see through my microscope on a daily basis. It seemed really unfair to not share all of this beauty with the world. Just look at the face on this outline. How could you not fall in love? To coincide with this year's bug fair, the Natural History Museum has created an online exhibit titled Spiky, Hairy, Shiny, Insects of LA. The exhibit showcases some of our favorite insects that we have captured from the Bioscan project. These are just a few of the thousands of insects that we share our city with. Many are large, but most are too small to appreciate with the naked eye. It is a great joy for me and an honor to share this unexpected beauty of LA's insect diversity with you. On behalf of all insects, thank you for being curious and kind. How amazing is this? We are talking about biotic factors in freshwater ecosystems like streams, and look what I just came across. How incredible is that? We have a snake that just caught a fish and is attempting to devour it on the side of the stream. This is absolutely incredible. I have yet to see any fish during my exploration here on this freshwater ecosystem. And the very first fish I see is in the mouth of a snake. This is amazing. This fish is about the same size as the snake. So watching it actually attempt to devour it is gonna be incredible. Snakes have the capability of opening their mouths up to 180 degrees to be able to swallow prey that's larger than them. A reptile live in action in a freshwater stream ecosystem. It doesn't get much better than this. Came back to check on our snake friend and uh, he's about halfway done with this fish, which is absolutely amazing. It can take snakes upwards of hours or even days to consume an entire meal, but uh, we'll yeah. check that out on the next one. Hi everyone, I'm Connor, I'm a junior in high school. And I'm Bauer and I'm a freshman in high school. And we are the founders of Cardboard Superheroes. And Cardboard Superheroes is a nonprofit organization that promotes the arts and education. And we built some really cool, awesome life-size cardboard models, such as like Iron Man and Groot. We also have mini models, such as like this X-Wing fighter right here. Uh, we built some other models like this cardboard Thor hammer right here. And just yesterday we came from WonderCon. We just had a panel and we'll share more about that later in the video. And um, so I know that some of you are the online viewers were not able to see Jason Latimer's magic trick, um, but I have a little magic trick for you all. So right here, we have a coin. You see on my hand, I'm going to grab the coin. It's gone. <laughs> that was pretty impressive. Let me see if I can one up that. All right. All right, let's, all right. See. let's see. All right. You guys see, I all have this deck, deck of cards right here. I bet you I can make Connor pull the 10 of clubs. Let's see if I can make that happen. All right, tell me when to stop. And stop. Right here? Are you right sure? There. Or do you want to pick another one? I'll, I'll pick that one right there. Ten of clubs? All right, that's right. All right, so right now we're going to uh, be talking with the Ocean Exploration Trust, OET, and they are right now exploring U.S. deep waters and, and the seafloor and delivering ocean exploration needed to strengthen the economy, health, and security of our nation. And they're actually tuning in near Hawaii where there is a live vessel. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Connor and Bauer. Thank you. How are you? Great. We're great to be here. It's, it's a great time to be with City of STEM and talk about STEM. So uh, we're hoping, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and also your work with OET? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first, Welcome to the EV Nautilus. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves soon, but um, before we do that, I do want to mention to anyone viewing that if we occasionally lose satellite for a few seconds, um, it's just because we're in some pretty rough waters right now. So um, there's a possibility our satellite might go down for a few seconds, uh, but we should be coming right back. So um, just stay with us and uh, we'll return, hopefully, um, if we do lose any satellite feeds. But first, I'm Kelly Moran. I'm the education program coordinator with the Ocean Exploration Trust, which operates this vessel. Um, and while I'm here on the ship, I am the communication 
exactly making sure all of the communication leaving the ship is going to the right places, letting the world be able to see and hear what we're doing and uh, bringing you some really awesome videos of the deep sea that we're seeing on all of our dives. And with me. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Oskovich. I am the lead scientist on this particular expedition. Um, I'm also a postdoctoral researcher at Boston University, where I study the ecology of the deep sea environment. So seamounts and deep water corals and sponges, and a little bit about their biodiversity and where they occur on our earth. Um, so I'm out here helping to facilitate the science uh, and making sure that we can do some great science while we're out here exploring the unknown US waters. So first we'll show you where uh, we are. Um, it's kind of hard to see on this map, but we are um, all the way a little bit in between Hawaii and that farthest dot. Um, we were exploring the Kingman Reef in Palmyra Atoll region of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. So we were pretty close to the equator uh, during the height of our expedition, and we're currently in transit back to Hawaii, back to Honolulu, which we should be uh, getting within eyesight getting back into port on Tuesday. So um, we were pretty far away and we're currently still in the middle of nowhere in the Central Pacific. I want to show you our ship and where we are currently uh, so you're able to kind of get a sense of where we live. So this is the EV Nautilus. It's 224 feet long or 68 meters um, and can hold up to about 50 people at any given time. So uh, right now, we're almost at full capacity. I think we have somewhere between 46 and 48 people. Um, and it's kind of like summer camp in a weird way. We have to share rooms. We Most of us have bunk beds. Um, we uh, eat meals all at the same time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, we can you know, watch movies, watch the dives that we're doing, and really just get to know everyone that we're with. But the main thing that we love to do is stream what we're doing, stream all of our dives, because we use remotely operated vehicles and not people. So let me show you. Uh, this is Hercules and Argus. So these are our two remotely operated vehicles. And because we don't send people down, these two machines can go down to 4,000 meters, uh, about 13,000 feet. Hercules is the one in the front. It has really bright lights and cameras, so we can always see what we're doing and take really fantastic pictures and video of anything that we see. It has manipulator arms, so we can take samples of uh, corals, sponges, rocks. For this cruise, lots of rocks. Um, we can take water samples and sediment samples of the seafloor to see maybe how old the sediment is or what's living in it. Um, and we also have different types of bio boxes for these samples and can take other types of scientific needs that are necessary. Uh, we have something called a slurp that can almost vacuum up some of the samples. Uh, we have a scoop jar as well. So uh, Hercules is pretty well equipped for the seafloor and can just do almost everything that a human would need to do, but at depths that human divers cannot go to. And behind Hercules is Argus. And Argus is super essential to our operations. Hercules can't go in the water without Argus. Um, and that's really because Argus is taking away any of the movement from the ship. So if we're bobbing around in the water and there's some strong currents or strong waves, Argus is really the one hanging below Nautilus that's taking away the movement. So that way Hercules can move really freely on the seafloor. But also Argus is always shining a bright light and camera views on Hercules so we can see what's around that ROV, make sure it's not gonna bump into anything we don't want them to. Um, and we can also get some really fantastic footage of the ROVs in the water from both angles. Here's a really awesome shot um, of Hercules going into the water during our dive. So this is kind of our main operations. We have some big cranes on board and can hoist them right in um, and start our dives. And some of our dives can be anywhere from uh, 20 to 24 hours if we wanted, uh, or longer because we take turns uh, up here on the ship. Do you want to talk a bit about kind of the schedule here on board? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're out here exploring 24 hours a day. Uh, we left a few weeks ago and we've been exploring nonstop. And basically when we're in the water, our watch tenders have four hour shifts. They're on watch for four hours and they get a period of eight hours off. 
But during those eight hours off, you also have other watches that will come on board. And we cycle through the day, uh, all day, every day, exploring the seafloor. Um, a lot of our objectives are out here um, are to explore large swaths of the seafloor from you know the maximum depth of the ROVs, so somewhere around 13,000 feet, up to the shallow peaks of a lot of uh, seamounts that are out here. This particular area of the Central Pacific has a lot of seamounts or guillots, which are flat top seamounts, uh, that have a lot of unknown biodiversity and uh, really poor understanding of their geological structure. So our scientific goals are one, characterize the site from a biological, geological perspective, and also try to better understand the resources that are within U.S. waters so we can better manage them. Yeah, and besides using the ROVs, uh, another main thing that we do out here is seafloor mapping. Uh, before we send the ROVs down into the water, we do like to map the seafloor uh, where we're going. So we get a rough sense of what's down there and not just putting the two ROVs in the water blindly. Um, I mean, it is. We don't know what we're going to see with them, but we do want to know the size of the seamount, what might be a good angle on the seamount to put the ROVs in. Um, and we are also part of a few projects that are trying to help map the whole entire uh, one, the US EEZ, the inclusive economic zone um, of US territories, but also map the ocean floor in general um, in the high definition that we can with our mapping system. So um, I wanted to show you a video on how exactly we map. So we use the system on the bottom of our ship on the hull. It's a multi-beam sonar system that instead of sending down one swath uh, or one tiny ping, oh, we do a wider swath and it actually works better the deeper we are, the swath is bigger. Um, and it really allows us to gain access to what this looks like. You can see by the different colors, you're able to get a sense of where's uh, some deeper locations, where are shallower locations that might be seamounts or underwater volcanoes, uh, where are cliffs and uh, ridges. So it's really helpful to know what's down there, but also for science in general to get a better sense of uh, the seafloor in general that you just can't get from satellites up in space beaming down to kind of understand what the seafloor looks like. Um, so we use ours quite often. Uh, and it also a cool thing about multi-beam sonar is that we're able to see, uh, for example, if there was bubbles coming up out of the seafloor at methane seeps or um, near active volcanoes, you could actually see bubble streams coming up through the water. If there's a big colony of fish, you could also see fish in our multi-beam system too. So um, it's not just the seafloor that we're able to monitor and look at, which is super important, but uh, it is helpful for scientists to know also, you know, where are bubbles coming up out of, where are underwater volcanoes, where uh, are weird anomalies on the seafloor that weren't supposed to be there. Uh, you can see all of that through our multi-beam multi system. Uh, and so before, uh, which I'll have Steve talk about, I wanted to show you a live shot of Nautilus right now. Uh, this is us currently streaming away, uh, heading towards Hawaii. So it's taking about three days for us to get from Kingman and Palmyra uh, to Hawaii. So this is a live shot of the bow of the ship right now. Uh, sorry that there's some water spatter on the camera, but um, we're getting a lot of rainstorms and the waves are pretty high. So uh, it's been a bit of a rough go so far, but uh, still really enjoying it. And it's a beautiful day besides the seeds being a bit rough. Uh, so Steve, do you want to talk a bit about, you know, this mission, how you went about planning it, and kind of what are the main objectives that we uh, were trying to accomplish? Yeah, so th this expedition has uh, kind of uh, been uh, several months and years in the making. Um, we're going to an area of U.S. waters called the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. So that's kind of like uh, a national park, but in the sea. And associated with this monument, um, there are numerous different islands and atolls throughout the Pacific, but we're focusing really only on a very small unit, which is called the Kingman Reef and Palmyre Atoll Unit. And within that unit, we're trying to understand you know, what, what's down there. Um, you know, we set these pier this places in the ocean aside for conservation uh, of resources, but we really don't have a lot of good understanding about which species occur there and what kinds of resources might be down there that we're managing. And so uh, our goal is to provide really important baseline data about what's in this area so that we can provide the best information to make the best decisions possible to managers back on shore. Uh, 
But in addition, there are parts of uh, the U.S. exclusive economic zone around the monument that uh, lack the protections of the monu uh, of, that the monument affords. So another uh, obje objective is to better survey those sites and determine if uh, you know what what are the resources there, so that we can compare uh, you know what an unprotected area might look like compared to uh, a protected area. In addition, um, you know, we're also focusing on uh, accumulating interest from the scientific community. We have not only the scientists on board, um, but we also have a whole host of scientists at, on shore from different universities and institutions that provide us context about what we're seeing on the seafloor. They may be specialists in fish or invertebrates or uh, a geologist who specialize in volcanoes or you know the crust that form and type and these types of uh, ancient volcanoes. So my job as the lead scientist is to coordinate all those goals and make sure that we can accomplish as much as we can out here during the precious few days that we have. It's a massive, massive area, but you know we're just really scratching the surface. And I think uh, in in this year we'll you know try to make a little bit of progress, but this is not the end of the exploration of this area. It will continue to go on um, because it's a huge, huge place. And we were out for about three weeks. How many uh, dives did we accomplish? So we got about seven dives on the seafloor. Um, each of those dives is about 24 hours in length. Uh, so we go the whole day nonstop. And uh, during those dives, we uh, we were able to collect video imagery of a transect from 4,000 meters up to the surface of the, the summits of these seamounts. We were able to collect biological specimens, some that might represent new species, uh, some that might be characteristic of an area to better understand the kind of diversity and abundance we have on the seafloor. Uh, and then we're also collecting geological samples to understand how old these volcanoes are. Many of them we suspect are probably as old as the dinosaurs, the Cretaceous era. So they're 60 to 70 million years old and they've been lying dormant at the bottom of the ocean ever since. And so if we can understand how old some of these seamounts are, we can better understand how the Pacific plate is moving and how the continents move on Earth. Um, and then a little bit how our, you know, how the skin of our ocean uh, develops over time. Uh, it's really important to, to understand this so we can you know, better, better create models of you know, how, our, how, our, uh, how our, Earth, our planet Earth is adapting. Mm -hmm. And one really interesting thing about this expedition, at least for me that I found was that um, we had a lot of different types of grad students or um, interns or former interns on Nautilus that have returned uh, year after year and now are contractors with us. So it felt, at least for me on this expedition, um, there was a bit of a younger crowd, which is which is fun. Um, but a lot of the science happening on this trip were science that were needed for graduate students who are working on their, or PhD students that are working on their projects to finish school. Uh, so we were able, you know, with all of the dives that we did, we were able to hopefully help them uh, finish their programs and finish their studies and get their papers written and their projects done. And I think that is a really valuable part of this mission was not only helping the greater world for science, but, uh, you know, the few scientists that were out here, which are starting off in their careers, uh, we were able to hopefully help get them some samples that they need for their research um, or to bring back to their universities that they come from. Um, and also with our ROV pilots, we were able, and I didn't realize it until about halfway through, but we have six ROV pilots, uh, three that are doing and uh, managing Argus and three that are piloting Hercules. But with our program, what it does is all of the Argus pilots year after year slowly come back and start working their way towards operating Hercules, which is a bit of a bigger and harder ROV to uh, pilot and maintain on the seafloor. So this cruise, uh, we actually had three former interns who were all out again this year as contractors who are piloting Argus. But on this trip, they were all able to work on their skills with piloting Hercules. So for me, at least, uh, who's, my job is to help get interns out onto the ship. Uh, it was really rewarding to see three former interns over the past few years come back this year as contractors and watch them all on their watches piloting Hercules and learning from a few of the experts who are um, in the field for a long time, uh, really, you know, really helping gain that experience and training the next Hercules pilots for the next few years. Um, it'll be really awesome, I think, give it a few more years to have them come out as Hercules pilots, uh, training a new set of intern uh, on the Argus. I think just that full circle 
uh, for this trip was really valuable to me and I really enjoyed it. So uh, loved every minute of it. We had some few hiccups on this cruise. The weather wasn't great. Um, we just had some kind of backfalls on this trip, but um, a lot of really great dives that we had. And uh, I think getting to know everyone on this trip was it was really fun to hear about their experiences and uh, their science needed uh, for all of these dives. But yeah, so that's what we've been doing. A um, couple more days left. We get back into port on Tuesday morning and uh, Thursday. Yep. April 7th, a new trip starts. So uh, this for us, at least our season, I'll pull up the map one more time. Um, but this is our whole entire season. So we're finishing up the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll expedition. Um, but all of the all of the other names you see there are trips that we have for this season. So we'll be going until about mid October, um, in and around the Hawaiian Islands. So uh, a few few as far as this one was a bit a bit out there, uh, but then some pretty close to the Hawaiian Island chain. So um, lots more to see, lots more to do, and a lot of mapping and ROV work to have you done. So excited for the rest of our year, but. Uh, that's kind of all we have for our mission. We'd love to take any questions that you might have of, you know, living on a ship or our expedition itself or how to get out here. Uh, really anything that you'd want to know. Well, yeah, thank you so much. That was so great information. Uh, you know, I just have to say one thing is it's amazing how you guys are able to be out at sea for that long because I know that our little stomachs would not be able to handle <laughs> that. Um, but one question that we did have is, uh, you know, you talked about how some of the volcanoes and seamounts, uh, they are like as old as some of the dinosaurs that lived back then, which is amazing. How exactly do you determine how old those volcanoes or seamounts are? Very good question. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a it's uh, some pretty complex geology. Um, so we have specialists that are both at sea and on shore that help us to conduct the analyses we need uh, to date some of these features. First of all, we need to find the right rocks. It's not just any rock on the seafloor. We need rocks that form uh, when the lava cools out of the seafloor and it remains in that state. There's we had a, rules on each dive on yeah. good rock, bad rocks. So, <laughs> so they knew which ones to take. When rocks are in, in contact with seawater for that many millions of years, they change chemically. So we, first we need to find the right rock that allows us to date those crystals. Next, we have to break open that rock and make sure that it does contain what we think it contains, which actually isn't, isn't the easiest thing to do. But once we confirm that that rock is useful, we'll take it back to uh, a lab and we have geologists on shore that'll do this. And what they do is they use a, a series of um, uh, dating techniques that involve uh, radiating samples and then examining how different uh, isotopes uh, decay within a sample. Because you're dating something that is you know, millions and millions of years old, you need to use very specific uh, radiometric tools uh, to, to determine what the chemical composition and then you infer what the, how, how old the age is based on you know, the, 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 de the decay of those chemicals. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, imagine like carbon dating, but like for much older, you use different radio radioactive isotopes. That's pretty, pretty involved stuff. Yeah. And with all of our rocks or any of our samples, but with our rock samples, um, they all go to the University of Rhode Island after they've been divvied up to whatever scientist needs them um, that we know of now. The rest of it goes to the University of Rhode Island, which has a, a lab there that we store all of our samples at. Um, and then other scientists and other geologists can then request use of them. So if somebody in a few months from now is like, oh, I really needed a rock from the Line Islands uh, on this dive that you did at this random seamount, uh, they can then go to the university's lab and request access to that sample um, and either get a small part of it or get like at least the information from that sample, uh, which can then contribute to their science too. So even if somebody might not know they need to this rock right now, um, it still goes to the you know larger purpose of scientists being able to access it later on. Got it. I really like how you're able to like share your resources and especially with like your live streams uh, for like, you offer to scientists and educators and students. Uh, where can we find these like live streams? Oh, good question. Yeah, so we stream 24 seven. So um, our website is nautiluslive.org uh, and we are streaming the whole season. So we started right before this one a few weeks ago and we'll be streaming live 24 seven until about the end of October. Uh, you're able to watch, so for example, right now on our website, our live stream of this camera is being broadcast. So anybody can watch the ship uh, right now as we're streaming towards Hawaii. 
uh, you're able to watch that. But during all of our dives, you can watch all of our ROV dives live, um, which is super exciting because yeah, we're here on the ship and we're going somewhere that nobody has ever been before, seeing something for the very first time with human eyes. But if you're on our website watching Nautilus Live, you're also the first humans to ever see something for the very first time. So it's not just, you know, being on Nautilus, being the first ones, you know, it's bragging rights, yes. But if you're mm -hmm. watching Nautilus Live, uh, you are also the first humans to watch something happening. So that's super exciting. And when we're CFAR mapping, we're streaming that. Um, we're not shy about streaming various cameras around the ship to show kind of our daily operations and what, one, where we are, but two, the dives and also our mapping systems. Cool. I, I'm definitely going to check out those live streams. Um, another question that we had, uh, I know you talked about like the Hercules and Argus and like your multi-beam sonar. Those are some really cool technologies that you use. What are your personal favorite uh, pieces of technology you use for these deep ocean explorations? Yeah, no, I mean, the for, for myself, so I study uh, the biodiversity and uh, the ecology of deep water corals and, and sponge ecosystems. Um, the ability to sample something on the seafloor, uh, you know, either a little piece of a coral, a little piece of a sponge, making sure we're not making too much of an impact in the environment, and then being able to keep that animal uh, or a piece of that animal alive, take it all the way to the surface where it can be observed and preserved, um, is really, really valuable. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the early days of ocean exploration, it used to just involve trawling a net uh, uh, maybe across the seafloor and you'd end up with fragments of things and it'd be extremely destructive. And, uh, you know, you really would only you would only get a portion of, uh, you know, maybe the animal you were interested in, if anything. And so what we get here is we get an observation of that animal on the seafloor using our cameras, many, many different types of cameras. And we get a piece of that animal if it's requested so that we can make connections about, you know, what something looks like on the seafloor, what it looks like in the lab. And the best part about it, honestly, is you can take that specimen and make it available to scientists all over the world. Much like the rocks go to our repository, we partner with uh, Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology, who houses and curates the samples, and they make it available to scientists all over the world for their research needs. And the great thing about it is that sample will be preserved in perpetuity. So as our ability to do science uh, expands with new different types of toolboxes, we can keep looking at the sample for potentially hundreds of years to come. Yeah. I think for me, the biggest piece of technology is our satellite. Um, <laughs> without our satellite dome on the ship, we wouldn't be able to do anything that we're doing. Uh, we take up a lot of bandwidth on the ship to stream everything live. Um, and that's our pride and joy. Uh, we love streaming our dives to the world, um, to the scientists, but also to the general public. Um, we love our connections that we do here. Uh, last year, we did over 350 live ship to shore connections to schools and science centers and aquariums, uh, community events. And that's just like this one on one uh, or one to many streaming um, kind of more personal. So it was really, I think, having that ability to answer questions from students, answer questions from the public, show off what we're doing um, is really valuable. So without our satellite, I think we'd be a little bit lost. <laughs> Yeah, that all sounds really incredible. Um, you know, you guys have been out on sea for like weeks and weeks on end. And so I'm sure you guys have seen some pretty cool stuff. Um, so we wanted to ask, um, you know, what is your you know, most memorable discovery or what is the most um, you know, exciting thing that you've discovered out at sea? And this is actually a question from the chat. Oh, I think they're experiencing technical difficulties right now. Let's see. Oh, I think they may have just cut out of the live stream. Um, just a little bit of technical difficulties um, on their end. Um, but you can, if you guys are interested more in um, the Nautilus um, expedition and also their crews, you can go uh, to their website, which is nautiluslive.org. And they also have their ed education page, which is nautiluslive.org slash education and you can see all their resources uh, for students and teachers mm -hmm. and then anyone uh, you know students out there interested in their internship program uh, you can check that out on their website you know they just mentioned how um, you know the Nautilus mission that they're going on um, right now that they were just you know live streaming from you, uh, you know they had you know newer students we might have watched you for a second really exciting <laughs> um, for you know these newer students to contribute their knowledge and ideas all right looks like they're back so 
we had a uh, sorry about that. No problem. We had a question from the chat and uh, asking uh, what has been your most memorable experience or discovery. Yeah, um, definitely. You know. Every time we go down, we see something new. Um, it's hard to pick just one because you know it's it's almost like every time you make that statement, something else comes up that says you know, hey, that's really weird or you know that's pretty remarkable. So you know, anytime we see any sort of biology, whether it's a coral or a sponge or a jellyfish, you know, we're probably the one of the first people who's been looking at that, and uh, you know that those are really special moments mm -hmm. um, to be able to. You know, Oh yeah, a little bit, I guess, more technical difficulties, you know, being out at sea for that long, especially, you know, in the rocky waters, like they mentioned before, um, you know, the bandwidth they use on that ship is so big that, um, you know, it can take up a lot of, you know, memory and storage that they're not really able to always have the best connection. Um, yeah. We can share more about some of the other places you can find them. They also have an expedition page, uh, which is nautiluslive.org slash expedition. So you can check out all their journeys and uh, you can check out their journey that they're on right now and the research that they're doing. So right now, uh, for those of you tuning in online, if you could like type into the chat and share what your favorite technology pieces, uh, such as like the Hercules and Argus. So uh, let us know uh, what your opinions on your favorite technology. Oh, they're back. Okay, I think our satellite's a bit mad at us. Um, so we probably should wrap it up soon anyways. Um, but uh, yeah, it was great talking with you. And if any... All right, I think they <laughs> cut out one last time. Um, but, um, you know, it was great to hear, um, you know, from the Nautilus um, crew and also, you know, the expedition they've been on. Um, it was amazing to hear about, you know, the journey and some of their recent findings that they've had. Again, their website is nautiluslive.org. So make sure to check them out. And right now we are going to uh, be listening to some presentations from our City of STEM partners. And so we'll see you very soon. Welcome to Ichthyology, where we have over 3 million fishes. There are more fishes than all other vertebrates combined. So if you take all the birds, all the amphibians and reptiles, all your mammals, fishes outnumber all of those. Who's number 46,853? Fishes are pretty slimy in general. If you've ever held one, you can always feel the slime right away. And they use the slime, though, in so many different ways. The most notable, slimiest fish there is is the hagfish. So these guys are unique among fishes in that they produce slime, and not just a little bit of slime. I mean lots and lots of slime. If anything attacks it, it has over 100 mucus uh, specialized cells that will just create so much slime that it gums up a predator's mouth and gills. And so nothing will keep on holding onto it. So they'll just let it go and it'll swim away. You haven't seen the last of me! Well, I've certainly seen enough! This here is a parrotfish, known because it has its fused teeth that create a beak like a parrot. It's one of the coolest slimy fishes that we have, because it actually makes a mucus cocoon that it sleeps in at night. Oh, can a bird nap in peace? I would tell any kid that wants to be a scientist to make sure to keep your curiosity, to always ask questions, to always ask your teachers how to get more information about something that you're really interested in. Let us go off and admire the beauty and fragility of nature. by the sea struck by lightning as a baby she survived that's pretty crazy townsfolk said her wit and vigor awoke oh, when the lightning hit said to be a sickly child the lightning struck and she turned white. Ever marry what a beautiful
you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down. Clever Mary, what have you learned? The books are bound and pages turned. Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned? The books are bound and pages turned. Mary's pastor urged his flock with faith in God and also what? So clever Mary, raised by the sea, her first love was geology. But brother Joe, faithful pup Jay, Mary searched for vertebrae. A lifeline for a family poor, for Mary fossils were much more. Devil's fingers were to berries, the search was no hobby for Mary. Her knowledge grew extraordinary, a science born at the forefront. Clever Mary! Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs of life? Clever Mary, what have you learned of books abound and pages turn? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs of life? Clever Mary, what have you learned of books abound and pages turn? Fossil hunting in land regions was extremely dangerous. Unstable peace first week collapsed is where the Indian shores were trapped. Clever Mary was tight for the to find the final specimens. Ichthyoplesial pterosaur, Mary discovered evermore. What have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned? The books abound and pages turn. Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned? The books abound and pages turn. But being a woman was quite common. The practice was still frowned upon. And though Clever Mary knew more than most, she was never allowed to publish her Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned the books abound and pages down? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned the books abound and pages down? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned the books abound and pages down? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned the books abound and pages down? some specimens. The coolest part about my job is that I get to study any mollusk that I want, and our collections are huge here at the museum. We have over four million specimens. Check out my new snail. Patrick, your snail is a rock. In nature, mollusks use slime in all sorts of ways. Probably the most common is snails use slime on their foot, so that's the bottom of their body, to slime along either on land or in the ocean. Um, other snails use slime um, if they're slugs, they have sort of uh, poisonous slime that when something tries to eat them, their slime is disgusting. Other snails use slime in, in really unusual ways. My very favorite specimen that we have in the museum is a snail called Janthina janthina, and it's a purple bubble shell. You can see that it's two colors, light on the bottom and purple on the top. And the reason I say bottom and top is because it lives upside down. <laughs> Janthina janthina floats in the ocean with its shell below it and a raft of bubbles that it makes out of slime on the top. Wow. One of the other things that I got interested in because I study mollusks, in particular sea slugs, they're very brightly colored and they have interesting sort of wavy patterns sometimes on their, their body. They're called parapodia. So I sometimes crochet sea slugs for fun. As you do. The most important thing for kids to do if they want to be a scientist is to maintain that curiosity. So keep asking questions about the natural world. The more you do that, the more set up you are to be a scientist. Ah, gee, Gary, you sure are smart. Did you think my shell was full of hot air? City of Hi everyone. So in a little bit, we are going to be talking and uh, sharing and talking about more about the in-person booth at the City of STEM Festival. Uh, but for now, we're going to share some work that we do with cardboard superheroes. So we just came from WonderCon where we had a panel discussion. So here is uh, uh, one of the things that we got. And we're so grateful for City of STEM to share our work and also WonderCon we were able to have a panel. 
So, uh, during the panel, we got to share some stuff that we built. So, so uh, I showed this at the beginning, but I wanted to show you guys again in a little bit more detail. So it is a, a cardboard Thor hammer uh, that my brother and I created together. Um, we actually designed the templates for this on a software called AutoCAD and then laser printed it out. Uh, that way, uh, the details would come out um, a lot better. And here is a ADAT from Star Wars as well. Uh, and also an X-Wing fighter. So sim here are some of the mini models that we've created. And we actually have instructions for you all to uh, create these mini models yourself. And so they're at our website, which is www.cardboardsuperheroes.com. And, um, you know, some of the other projects we build are some of these helmets. Uh, and this is actually a Batman helmet. And we create it so that you can wear it, so that you can pretend like you're Batman. <laughs> so I could, you know, sometimes I like to put this on and act fun and be like, I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and so right now we actually have an exhibit at the comic-con museum in san diego where all of our life-size cardboard models are for example we have hulk buster he's our tallest model and he's standing eight feet tall and so you can check out all eight other life-size models at the comic-con museum uh recently we just found out the comic-con museum is also launching a spider-man exhibition so Make sure to check that out and go onto the Comic Con Museum website and also in person in San Diego. And then right now we're also going to play a little video um, that explains a little bit of a uh, little bit about our organization, Cardboard Superheroes. Hi, I'm Connor. I'm a junior in high school, and I'm Bauer, and I'm a freshman. And we are the founders of Cardboard Superheroes. And Cardboard Superheroes is a nonprofit organization that promotes the arts and education. So we built all of these life-size models, as you can see behind us. And we've been building our collection for over seven years now. So we started off with R2-D2 and we've slowly built our way up into creating Hulkbuster. And right now Hulkbuster is actually at the Comic-Con convention. So the whole mission of Cardboard Superheroes is to promote the arts and youth. Um, we just want to spread creativity throughout everyone using arts and crafts. And we also want to promote education and arts together, sort of like a STEAM idea. So like science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics all together. Thanks to the Comic-Con Museum, we were able to grow cardboard superheroes a lot. Uh, last year, or two years ago in 2019 for December nights, we were able to teach over 600 people how to make Thor hammers. And today we're actually teaching people how to make Captain America shields. And we've been really busy and it's been very fun to uh, reach out to all these people. So today at the Comic-Con Museum, I'm running a special effects video workshop. And so what we're doing for this is people are going to be acting out a certain action or fighting scene. And then afterwards, we're gonna add in all these cool effects like lightning effects and lasers. And you know, the whole purpose of this is to promote public speaking um, because while they're doing the scene, they're also speaking in the scene. So it really makes them have to come out of their shell when doing the workshop. So this is to promote the arts as well as education and engineering and we wanted to combine the two together. We wanted to combine pop culture and education so that we can teach people and promote the arts and allow them to create these uh, shields and also have a lot of fun. And another thing is we got to build a lot of community. A lot of people are uh, meeting each other for the first time and coming together to build these Captain America shields and so it's been a very fun experience. So 
thank you so much. And if you want to check more, more out about Cardboard Superheroes, you can check out our Instagram, which is at Cardboard Superheroes. So we hope this can give you a jumpstart on your own creativity and uh, learn how to use the materials at your house to create anything you want, and just like we did with cardboard boxes. Hi everyone, so uh, just a little bit more about cardboard stuff. So uh, we actually have a STEAM curriculum. I know I mentioned this, but uh, the STEAM curriculum is on our website and you can uh, go up these models right here. We have 10 mini models. We also have student worksheets and teacher's guide guides to follow along with. Um, and so next up, we're actually gonna be going down to the field crew to one of the booths and it is going to be the California State University Long Beach. Um, so. The Science Learning Center, or SLC, it provides a unique learning experience uh, for elementary and middle school age students in local communities, as well as the students of the CSULB club. And so we're, they're going to be talking about an activity. And so the items you need to participate for this activity are 15 index cards, six inches of tape, and also a uh, stuffed animal. So here's an example of a stuffed animal. And so they're going to be, uh, you're going to be making towers. So if you want to participate at participate at home, make sure to grab these materials. And right now we're gonna hand it off to the field crew. Yeah, so sorry, we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties um, in terms of the sound. Uh, we do realize that there is no sound coming out of the video, uh, but hopefully you guys are still able to sort of watch what's going on um, and still participate in the activity. And so just to reiterate the uh, items ne needed to participate in the activity, you need 15 index cards, six inches of tape, and a stuffed animal. And so hopefully you can follow along and participate in this fun activity.
So one thing that uh, uh, C uh, S U L B wanted to share is how important engineering is. And engineering is really just about science to solve problems, and it involves a process of identifying the problem, brainstorming, and planning solutions, testing ideas, and then most importantly, improving the design. And so uh, one of my favorite uh, parts of STEM is uh, engineering as well. And through Cardboard Superheroes, we've been able to use these engineering skills to uh, build these models. And these steps that uh, these steps like solving problems, identifying the problems and more, they really help when you're designing and building the models. And so uh, when you're participating in, these, uh, in this activity, just think about these uh, key factors. about to hear is based on true events. In the early 1950s, Marie Tharp's ideas were dismissed as girl talk. Last name Tharp, first name Marie with an expertise in cartography. Got a job map in the ocean floor using sonar data from the Second World War, but she needed new data to complete her map, so they loaded up a research vessel ASAP. They sailed out on the sea. They didn't let women on the research vessel, so with math making tools, Marie did wrestle. She showed it to a colleague, Bruce Heason. He said, Marie, you got no rhyme or reason. She caused a commotion when she said there was a rift valley at the bottom of the ocean. Girl talk. That's what the man said. Yeah, that's what the man said. He called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, but he called it girl talk. A valley with the rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science. went back to the drawing board. Literally, she had a drawing board. She checked it once and she checked it twice. To be triple sure, she checked it thrice. She took it back and she showed it to Bruce. But this time, he called the truce. He shook his head. He said, Marie, Marie, I think I owe you an apology. Your map is right, yes, I must admit. But I'm worried that this map applies continental drift. They published it anyway. Even though they knew the scientists were bound to say. The men said, yeah, that's what the men said. They called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, they called it girl. A valley with the rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your to take Millie's map with me, a stream they fought the whole world to see, and settle this bubbling controversy. So Clebly, how can it be? Ever since when Maurice said it would be, the Red Valley, every mountain peak, it's enough to make a man sneeze so weak. Because the revolution is now reaping. Marie Tharp's girl talk was the solution. Girl talk. That's what the man said. Yeah, that's what the man said. He called it girl talk. With photographic proof, they learned the truth. They called it with the red proof continental drift. She changed modern science for the silver reliance on that girl talk. Girl talk. Girl talk. Everybody at this meeting's also on the geo 
clueless. It takes a lot of disciplines to reconstruct the past. It's a time scale that we're dealing with is infinitely vast. Now I was just about to call this conference here to order when the volcanologist pulled out a little tape recorder. He said, I'm about to get a groove and a rhyme and to a volcanologist, you know it's all about the time. The paleoclimatologist raised an objection. The climate of this talk is moving in the wrong direction. Don't make me lose my appetite, said the mineralogist. My stomach's moving left to right, said the seismologist. I'm shifting in my seat, said the plate tectonicist. When do we eat, said the biogeochemist. Can we please slow down? Said the glaciologist Everybody settle down Cried the sedimentologist Now I can see this conference was dissolving into chaos At any moment this could be a full-blown San Andreas So I reached for the nearest thing that garnered my attention And lifting high a glass, I addressed the whole convention Everybody grab a cup and let's propose a toast Cause the planet that we live on is our planetary host We all have different disciplines, there is no right or wrong I want to hear you click those buttons and hear you chant along I'm a geophysicist, he's a geophysicist And everybody at this meeting Science is real. Science is real. From the food bank to DNA. From radio waves to gamma rays. Like when Henrietta Leavitt from the galaxies are far away. Real. From evolution to the Milky Way. Atoms to molecules, metals to metalloids, the periodic table to the physics of an asteroid. I like those stories about angels, unicorns, and elves. Yes, I like those stories just as much as anybody else. But if you are seeking knowledge, my friend, be it simple or abstract, you'll find the facts are with science indeed. The facts are with science, because science is real. Science is real. Yes, science is real. To zoology, and when the facts are undisputed, there's no need for an apology. Real, from astrophysics to biology, from dinosaurs down to bumblebees, even microscopic organisms living in your BLT. A scientific theory isn't just a hunch or a guess; it's more like a question that's been put through countless, countless steps. And when a theory emerges, it must be consistent with the facts. You see, the truth is with science because the proof is with science. Science is real. Yes, science is real. Reality. Guess what? Science is indeed real. Sweet, 
Rocky crust is broken into plates. They're moving all the time, but at a very slow rate. Convection currents from deep in the mantle push on the crust till it's hard to handle. But every now and then, the plates get stuck and the pressure builds up and the pressure builds up. The pressure builds up. Name Marie with an expertise in cartography. Got a job map in the ocean floor using sonar data from the Second World War. But she needed new data to complete her map, so they loaded up a research vessel ASAP. They sailed out on the sea. They didn't let women on the research vessel, so with Matt making tools, Marie did wrestle. She showed it to a colleague, Bruce Heason. He said, Marie, you got no rhyme or reason. Shame caused a commotion when she said there was a rift valley at the bottom of the ocean. Girl talk. That's what the man said. Yeah, that's what the man said. He called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, but he called it girl talk. A valley with the rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science. To the drawing board. Literally, she had a drawing board. She checked it once and she checked it twice. To be triple sure, she checked it thrice. She took it back and she showed it to Bruce. But this time, he called the troops. He shook his head. He said, Marie, Marie, I think I owe you an apology. Your map is right, yes, I must admit. But I'm worried that this map applies continental drift. They published in any way, even though they knew the scientists were bound to say, say nothing but girl talk. That's what the men said. Yeah, that's what the men said. They called it Girl Talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, they called it Girl Talk. A valley with the rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your southern reliance on that Girl Talk. Still, one man was intrigued. He was a well known scientific celebrity. So was his name And undersea exploration Was his game He said Ha 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 me, I'll go into the sea I'll be sure to take Millie's map with me I'll send it for the whole world to see And settle this bubbling controversy Chocolate blue, how can it be? Ever since where Marie said it would be The Red Valley, every mountain peak It's enough to make a man please call me Because the revolution Is now They learned the truth, they called it A valley with the red proof continental drift She changed modern science for the southern reliance on that girl The song 
you're about to hear is based on true events. In the early 1950s, Marie Tharp's ideas were dismissed as girl talk. Hey everyone, so now we're going to be going to the Roundhouse Aquarium Teaching Center located at the end of the Manhattan Beach Pier, which is free to the public and open seven days a week. And we're going to bring the ocean here with you guys. And today, you'll learn why uh, we love our oceans, and you may even get a peek at some of the tide pool animals who traveled with us to City of STEM. And so the activity is poop to plankton, and we're gonna, they're going to be teaching you how to poop in the ocean as part of how poop in the ocean is part of the food chain. Also, live tide pools, animals will be there as well. <laughs> and also, the, uh, uh, the audio is broken, so you guys don't be able to watch. Well, we'll be talking to you soon. you're about to hear is based on true events. In the early 1950s, Marie Tharp's ideas were dismissed as girl talk. Last name Tharp, first name Marie with an expertise in cartography. Got a job map in the ocean floor using sonar data from the Second World War, but she needed new data to complete her map, so they loaded up a research vessel ASAP. They sailed out on the sea. They didn't let women on the research vessel, so with math making tools, Marie did bustle. She showed it to a colleague, Bruce Heason. He said, Marie, you got no rhyme or reason. She caused a commotion when she said there was a rift valley at the bottom of the ocean. Girl talk. That's what the man said. Yeah, that's what the man said. He called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, fight, he called it girl talk. A valley with a rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science. went back to the drawing board. Literally, she had a drawing board. She checked it once and she checked it twice. To be triple sure, she checked it thrice. She took it back and she showed it to Bruce. But this time, he called the truce. He shook his head. He said, Marie, Marie, I think I owe you an apology. Your map is right, yes, I must admit. But I'm worried that this map applies cause a mental drill. They published it anyway. Even though they knew the sciences were bound to say. What the men said, yeah, that's what the men said. They called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, fact, they called it girl. A valley with the rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your southern reliance on that girl talk. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, 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 ooh. Still, one man was intrigued. He was a well-known scientific celebrity. Was his name, and undersea exploration was his game. He said, Ha ha ha, I'll go into the sea. I'll be sure to take Millie's map with me. I'll stream it for the whole world to see. And settle this bubbling controversy. So club me, how can it be? Ever since when Marie said it would be, the Red Valley, every mountain peak, it's enough to make a man's knees go weak. They learned the truth, they called it Girl Talk. A valley with the red proof, continental drift. She changed modern science for the silver reliance on that Girl Talk. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Girl Talk. Girl Talk. Girl Talk. Girl Talk.
You know it's all about the time. The paleoclimatologist raised an objection. The climate of this talk is moving in the wrong direction. Don't make me lose my appetite, said the mineralogist. My stomach's moving left to right, said the seismologist. I'm shifting in my seat, said the plate tectonicist. When do we eat? Said the biogeochemist. Can we please slow down? Said the glaciologist. Everybody settle down, cried the sedimentologist. Now I can see this conference was dissolving into chaos. chaos. At any moment, this could be a full blown San Andreas. So I reached for the nearest thing that garnered my attention. And lifting high a glass, I addressed the whole convention. Everybody grab a couple and let's propose a toast. Cause the planet that we live on is our planetary host. We all have different disciplines, there is no right or wrong. I want to hear you click those buttons and hear you chant along. I'm a geophysicist, he's a geophysicist, and everybody at this meeting knows the one that geophysics. It takes a lot of discipline to reconstruct the past. Cause the time scale that we're dealing with is infinitely vast. I'm a geophysicist, she's a geophysicist, and everybody at this meeting knows the one that geophysics. It takes a lot of discipline to reconstruct the past. Cause the time scale that we're dealing with is infinitely vast. Science is real. Science is real. From the food to DNA. From radio waves to gamma rays. Like when Henrietta Leavitt from the galaxies are far away. Real. From evolution to the Milky Way. Atoms to molecules, metals to metalloids, the periodic table to the physics of an asteroid. I like those stories about angels, unicorns, and elves. Yes, I like those stories just as much as anybody else. But if you are seeking knowledge, my friend, be it simple or abstract, you'll find the facts are with science indeed. The facts are with science, because science is real. Science is real. Yes, science is real. To zoology, and when the facts are undisputed, there's no need for an apology. Real, from astrophysics to biology. From dinosaurs down to bumblebees, even microscopic organisms living in your BLT. A scientific theory is just a All right, so that was some really interesting stuff, and now we're going to transition into some more of the City of STEM partner videos. so many insects in the world. There are lots of species that are still unknown to science. In the 20 so years I've been studying insects, I've helped to find new species, which is a dream come true. This is the happiest day of my life! Insects are a little different than other animals that use slime because they don't really have slime on the outside of their body, but they do have ooze-like fluids on the inside that they sometimes can use for defense. Sometimes they actually push out a pores in their exoskeleton, which we call reflex bleeding, which is just really kind of gross and cool. And then in some cases, slime comes out the other end of their body, so sort of peeing it out. Can I use your bathroom? Okay, make it quick. That's okay. So it's hard to see because they're so small, but right at the tip of my tweezers here is a special little creature that we call the spittle bug. If you happen to see them outside, it'll look like someone actually spit on the plant. So grasshoppers, they get captured, and they're actually gonna regurgitate or barf up some fluids that are inside of their body which will make them a little slimy and make them taste really, really bad. So something like a lizard might start to swallow it and then change its mind and spit it out. Pretty cool. Amazing. We need a lot of different kinds of people to become scientists. People who are curious and creative and compassionate and bring a lot of different abilities and talents to the scientific community. So if this is something that you're interested in, pursue it and don't let anybody discourage you. Who's ready? I'm ready. Who's ready? 
Nickelodeon is partnering with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County to learn all about the science of SpongeBob. Welcome to the museum. We all know Bikini Bottom like the back of our flipper, but how much do we know about the history? Good question. Let's check in with Dr. Austin Hendy, an invertebrate paleontologist that studies ocean fossil specimens. Maybe he can tell us a little bit about what ancient Bikini Bottom may have looked like. I'm Dr. Austin Handy. I'm the curator of invertebrate paleontology. Hey, what? Invertebrate paleontology is a study of ancient invertebrates. These are animals without backbones. Animals like clams, snails, crabs, sea urchins, sea stars. They represent 95% of, of animal life on Earth, and uh, they have a rich fossil record. This is going to be written about in the history book someday. I work with a, a museum collection that is about 7 million specimens in our collection, and it allows us to travel back in time to see how marine communities have, have changed through time. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to use our imagination to go back in time and think about what a bikini bottom might have looked like 450 million years ago. Welcome to the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection of the Natural History Museum. This collection we're in today are our type fossils. These are the most special fossils that we have in the collection. Very, very special indeed! SpongeBob and his relatives, sponges, have been probably one of the oldest animal groups. But we have a fossil record that goes back nearly 600 million years. Hey, Grandma! Why, hello, SpongeBob. These are glass sponges, and these are probably the oldest relatives of SpongeBob. Probably belong to your ancient ancestors! Wow! So, the sponge ancestry goes back pretty far. But how exactly do scientists even know how old these fossils are? There's a, a discipline of geology called geochronology, which involves looking at geochemical uh, clues to, to the age of rocks. Particularly rocks that come from volcanoes have a lot of radioactive elements in them. Now, what that allows us to do is look at the fossils found in those rocks and say, okay, we know that these rocks are 400 million years old and these fossils are found in those rocks. Following on from that, we can infer that wherever we find those fossils, they're probably around 400 million years old. I went to the future and, and then I went to the past and, and then this, that was nowhere, but, but now I'm back and, and you don't know how happy I am to see you guys. Check back in for more Science of SpongeBob, brought to you by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon is partnering with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County to learn all about the science of SpongeBob. It's gonna rock! So, if nautical nonsense is something you wish... Bring it around town! Stick around for some silly sea facts from some of the museum's top scientists. I'm Adam Wall. I'm a collections manager for Crustacea at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. There are so many fun facts about lobster. Lobsters pee out of their face. <laughs> Sometimes, when lobsters need to communicate in a fight, they'll use the pheromones in their pee, which are in these little glands right below their eyes, and they'll shoot that urine at their competitor, and their competitor will get the sense that's a really strong lobster I'll stop fighting. And if you thought that was PMI, try this one! My name is Jorge Vélez Guadre. I'm an associate curator of marine mammals. It's when whales, dolphins, seals, sea lions, they feed along the shores. And like every animal, when they feed, there's also poop. Ooh. And in their poop, which is released right there in the ocean, there are nutrients like nitrogen, which feed the plankton. Plankton feeds smaller organisms, and those smaller organisms are food for larger ones and larger ones and larger ones. Okay, we get it already! Including going back to the whales. And some of these species are also food for us. So keeping whale and other marine mammals populations healthy keeps putting food in some of our plates. Extraordinary. In the oceans, when you're talking about a school of fishes, it is not them going to Mrs. Puff's driving school. A school is just a group of fishes that swim together and that move in unison with one another. And there's a number of reasons why fish do, but for small fishes like anchovies, <laughs> the main reason is likely due to defense. Because there are so many swimming together and they're generally quite shiny and reflective, it is very hard for a predator to find just one fish to pick out of that giant school. Well, you know what they say, knowledge is power. And who are we to argue with science? Check back in for more Science of SpongeBob, brought to you by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and Nickelodeon. 
Hi, my name is Chris Weisbart, Director of Exhibition Production here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And I'm here to talk about this really unique display of a giant Nevada ichthyosaur. This is a display that is engaging. It has a specimen that is wildly cool. It's the largest specimen found from this time period. Our team was able to take this item from our research and collections group and put it on display so quickly. Within six weeks, we were able to build a custom display case for it. So some of the special considerations I'm putting an object this large on display is how do we support it? As you can see, we've actually supported it on some of the equipment that is used to transport and safely prepare the specimen. Also, we created a box that was isolated from the specimen. So even though visitors can come and get very excited about it, they aren't gonna vibrate the specimen or uh, impact it in any way by touching the glass. It's so important for us to put these specimens on display quickly because this is research that is happening in real time. We have an obligation to tell our audience when we're working on something this cool. I've printed many different kinds of fish from all over the world. But when asked when, what is on my bucket list, of fish to print, I would never reply anglerfish because it's a creature that I assumed I would never realistically encounter. That all changed when the folks at the LA County Natural History Museum invited me to document this pristine specimen in the way of Kyotaku, which is an old form of Japanese taxidermy, where calligraphy ink is applied to the fish and a sheet of paper is rubbed onto the surface to create a print. Knowing that very few people in the world ever get to see one of these fish in person. It was such a huge privilege to be one of even fewer people to touch one as well as create a piece of art with it. There have been a lot of challenging fish printed in my career, but this one with its cactus-like spines protecting its soft gelatinous skin was by far the most technically difficult fish I've ever worked with. Printing this particular angler fish was a once in a lifetime opportunity for me I'm so grateful to have been able to share it with my family. I look forward to working with the museum staff again to add to the pages of natural history. My name is Lisa Gonzalez, and I am an assistant collections manager in the entomology department at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I really love my job. I get to lead nature hikes, give presentations and tours of our insect collection, all with the goal of helping people discover the amazing insect diversity that exists in the world. The majority of my job consists of collecting insects for a research project called Bioscan. I can spend an entire day blissfully peering through a microscope at the tiny, beautiful creatures that are mostly unseen by the naked eye. Our entomology department has a collection of 6 million specimens from all over the world. Think of it like a library with each insect telling a story. Insects do just about every ecological job you can think of. They pollinate, they decompose, they are beneficial as predators and parasites and other insects, they are a major part of the food chain, the list goes on. Studying insects is essential if you want to understand what is happening in a particular habitat. That is what makes maintaining an entomology research collection so important. I have been fascinated by insects and spiders for as long as I can remember. I was always playing in the dirt and looking for bugs when I was little. I had no idea back then that I would continue to do that as an adult, as part of my job. My backyard was basically my field site. I spent many hours sifting through leaf litter and turning over rocks in search of hidden creatures, usually assisted by a cat or two. My mother told me that I would put roly-polies in my doll stroller and tell people they were my babies, which I don't remember doing, but I believe her. I didn't realize there was a whole community of people who were crazy about insects like me until I went to my first bug fair at the NHM. This would have been sometime in the late 90s. I think it was the 12th annual bug fair. My lovely mother offered to go with me. I was in my late teens and none of my friends related to my insect obsession. I think it was just keeping it to myself at that point. I walked into the Natural History Museum into a sea of people who were all bug obsessed. Kids who raised caterpillars and had little insect zoos in their rooms just like me, who read every Ranger Rick article and memorized scientific names just like I had done. 
and adults who had turned their childhood obsession into a profession. That was a huge revelation for me. Pretty soon after that first visit, I started volunteering at the museum in the insect zoo, feeding the insects and spiders, then working in education as a gallery interpreter. That was 22 years ago, and since then, I have been at every bug fair. Usually I was presenting live animals from the insect zoo, or releasing butterflies or moths in the butterfly pavilion, or being a judge for the bug chef competition. One year I was interviewed by Heel Hauser. That was pretty cool. Every year I talk to so many people about insects that I end up losing my voice. What do I love the most about bug fair? Seeing little kids who have attended for so many years, who are now teenagers thinking about studying entomology in college. The entomology research department has a table in the main hall every year where we showcase specimens from our collection that the public normally doesn't get to see. Last year, we brought out our largest and smallest insects so people could see, for example, an adult beetle smaller than the head of a pin next to the largest beetles on earth, the Titan and the Goliath beetles. We also brought out the world's smallest fly, which was discovered by the curator of entomology, Dr. Brian Brown. The fly is 0.4 millimeters in size and named after Arnold Schwarzenegger because of its big, beefy legs. There are well over 1 million insects known to science and millions more that are waiting to be discovered. You don't have to go to the tropics to find new species. There are unknown insects right here in Los Angeles. That is why the Natural History Museum launched the Bioscan Project, the first large scale insect survey in a major city of its kind. We use special tent-like traps called malaise traps to collect samples of insects in yards and gardens across LA. Community scientists make this possible by allowing us to access their yards or public green spaces that they helped manage. Within the first few months of collecting, we found 30 new species of flies unknown to science. We are now up to 65 new species. Most of the insects we collect are really small and hard to appreciate with the naked eye alone. So I started taking photographs of them using the Keon's digital microscope. All of these insects in these photos are from Los Angeles. Most are about the size of a grain of rice. Some are much smaller. These are the insects that I get to see through my microscope on a daily basis. It seemed really unfair to not share all of this beauty with the world. Just look at the face on this outline. How could you not fall in love? To coincide with this year's bug fair, the Natural History Museum has created an online exhibit titled Spiky, Hairy, Shiny, Insects of LA. The exhibit showcases some of our favorite insects that we have captured from the Bioscan project. These are just a few of the thousands of insects that we share our city with. Many are large, but most are too small to appreciate with the naked eye. It is a great joy for me and an honor to share this unexpected beauty of LA's insect diversity with you. On behalf of all insects, thank you for being curious and kind. How amazing is this? We are talking about biotic factors in freshwater ecosystems like streams, and look what I just came across. Hi, everyone. So before we get into clean cities and possibly some more boots with the uh, field crew, we wanted to announce the City of STEM uh, uh, tournament, the eSports tournament that they're running for high school students. And so right now there are two final teams left, and they've been playing all week. And there uh, it was a total of 16 teams, and now they're down to the final two. Yep. So it's been an intense uh, game of Overwatch is actually the game there uh, they've been playing. Um, and so if you guys want to see the full stream, it's going to be on twitch.tv uh, slash high school underscore GG. Uh, but right now we're actually going to show a little preview of the live stream. City of Stan. Out there playing in Downey right now, and Miracosta came in. They did not back down at all. Uh
front line role as well, being that off support for his main tank. And uh, you, you said it. I mean, Mir Costa just putting on such a strong defense there. They couldn't even break for one tick on that. So, I mean, it really made that second round that much easier for Miracosta. You have to talk about, you know, we talked about that confidence going into the second game. I mean, that was that was over before it began, almost like they were on cruise control. They have to be really pumped up about how they're playing here today, especially against this Downey team that hasn't dropped a single round until this game here in the finals. You said it, and now, you know, going on to Ilios, right? If they play, if they play at all like they did the first half of that matchup, when they were defending, I mean, it is going to be brutal for this Downey squad because Miracosta, they put up a defense, I mean, unlike anything that I have cast in quite a long time. It was stellar. Usually on King's Row, there is at least a little bit of an ebb and a flow. You get to the point, you maybe get the payload moving, and King's Row can take a long time. That map can take a long, long time to be over with. Not so much the case today here, Hot Sauce. Yeah, I mean, they, like I said, Miracosa just had phenomenal defense at that first choke point. Now a little different perspective here on control. Both these teams meeting in the middle of that map. So that first battle, again, equally as important. You want to gain early control over that hill. I think we'll see a little bit uh, differences in the cops. I know Lucio is pretty popular here as well. There's so many places to knock people off the map. Uh, but again, I think that first battle is going to be very important if if downey allows miracosta to win this first initial battle and and they get that first control of the hill i think it's going to be all downhill there for downey very well could be that could spell disaster now i if if downey comes out maybe they mix up the composition a little bit maybe they do some creative things uh i think they can come away with a dub here but I mean, you have got to after a, after a map like that, you kind of you kind of have to be wondering, right? You kind of have to be wondering, OK, um, where are our mentals at? Right. Yeah. Like, let's kind of regroup and get ourselves back into this thing, basically. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that we do see, obviously, you know, maybe these players playing with the characters that they're most comfortable with. Um, but a lot of times you'll see a wrecking ball on this map as well. Uh, but both these teams really not choosing to mix up the comp that much, if at all, maybe one or two here or there. But it looks like basically the exact same for Miracosta. I think Darklight might have switched his character. But uh, again, it's gonna be a, a really tough first battle here. Downey needs to come out fighting. They need to get control of this point early and trying to give themselves a little bit of a confidence boost. Absolutely, absolutely. Map number two here, folks. It is Ilios and we're getting into it. Miracosta v Downey. Miracosta been playing absolutely crazy here on Lucky Tiger, getting over onto the other side of this point. He's played Reinhardt fantastically. Look at that golden axe. <laughs> Beautiful indeed it is. And yes, he's done a phenomenal job along with Drowsy. Both these members tanking very well. They have the early presence up front, really not allowing this Downey team to even press on the site. But now, finally starting to find a break. They get not one, two, three, four kills here from Downey. And now, finally pressuring onto the site. They should take control here as we wait for Miracosta to get those remaining members respawned in and we'll see what their next push looks like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, now that's, that is the stand that Downey needed right there. Uh, after that first map, ooh wee, that is great stuff for Downey as they wanna get themselves back into this championship. Yeah, they're doing a good job here, already at 20%, putting that pressure on Miracosta, really not allowing them to press out of this bunker here. We can see the shield up front from Reinhardt on the downy side, and again, not being able to press across these stairs. Miracosta trying to find a push, both members, oh, a lot of damage being done here to Miracosta. No members fall though, bait on that back pedal. We see him rotating around for the heal. Bait again, healed all the way up. And Miracosta's healer is doing phenomenal things here, but can they find their way into this point, Thunder? Oh, we, and there it will switch. For the side of Miracosta, beautiful push. It didn't happen the first time, but does happen the second time. And now these Downey Vikings are on their heels. Look at how far off the point they were pushed by the Mustangs. A beautiful, beautiful uh, execution. 
Yeah, Punch just now coming back from Miracosta, though. Downey with a slight one-man advantage as they lose Godron, though, who falls early. And Miracosta is doing a phenomenal job on defense, both in that hybrid and here on control. And it could be the name of the game as they have really just kind of put their place in this match. And now they battle back as they look to tie it up here. Downey coming in for the push. Yeah, I mean, Downey, listen, they've got time. They definitely have time, but they have got to do something very, very impressive when it comes up against these Miracles and Mustangs because they seem ready for everything. Hot Sauce, they just seem poised and ready for any attack. Yeah, this, this, uh, this, the, the Reinhardt and Drowsy here, the tank off tank combo, they're doing a great job of rotating off the healer, always getting the heals in, as well as the DPS, rotating around, finding those picks. We've seen a lot more kills coming out. Downey, however, doing a much better job this time of finding those breaks in the defense, getting some kills here on control. And we have seen a little bit more of an equal battle, although I'm giving it a slight favor here to Miracosta as they've just been so phenomenal on defense. Yeah, this is a much tighter map than the first one, clearly, right? That first map was just, as you said, over before it began, right? As we have action over here, Downey and Miracosta getting back into it, wow. This defense has moved up and off the point for Miracosta. I mean, this, as I said, much tighter than the last map, but Miracosta yet again finding a way to just take control. Yeah, Hawks, you know, for Downey doing a phenomenal job healing the micro, the macro back and forth. He's doing a great job of keeping those heals out there. But uh, for whatever reason, Downey just unable to find those kills. Mira just doing it slightly better on the other side with the heals and the defense. 2% left to go, though, for Mira Costa. Can Downey bring the comeback here in map two? Yeah, they've got a hold. They really, really, really have to be strategic at this point. You know, they know Mira Costa, or Mira Costa is coming, and Mira Costa is formidable. They are already contesting the oh. point here. Oh, he's yeah. going to go down first. The Mercy, ouch! That's got to hurt for Downey. Yeah, that was a huge kill there from Reinhardt. The Mercy unable to get away in time, popping off the heels, and that should be all Miracosta needs. Now settling in the overtime, ticking away. A slight contention there coming in, but I truly believe it is not going to be enough. Time ticking down Miracosta, looking to take map number two. Kaboom. Yep. Sheesh. Unreal stuff from Miracosta. Round one goes to the Stangs. Man, I... I as I as I mentioned, not as tight as the first, or not as much of a blowout as the first map, okay? But still, Miracosta showing why they are really, really taking it to Downey today, right? They've just got everything put together perfectly. The execution is on. They know their angles. They are pushing as a squad. They don't let anybody just kind of, you know, hang out to dry, right? Yeah, you can tell the comms have to be absolutely on point as far as the tank, the off tank, the healers coming in with the DPS as well. Uh, you can tell the comms absolutely on point. They're doing a great job here so far. And, you know, as we had mentioned, we talked a little bit behind the scenes. Downey was favored. They had a Grandmaster as well on controller. Kind of favored to win this thing. And Miracosa is showing you why you can never count anyone out. Maybe the underdogs here today, but certainly not looking like it. Nope, nope, nope. All that matters is what happens on the maps here in this type of competition. Boom, that is a big elimination. Rem going down, but trading out a few here. Ooh, this is getting interesting right away. I would expect nothing less from these two teams. Yeah, you know, as, as much as I love a clean sweep, I would love to see Downey fight back here. Maybe send us into a four or even that best of five. But right now, Miracosta's defense is just unmatched. They are taking control of these points. We see him have control here. We don't see that Lucio. Oh, we do see Lucio here from Ari and both teams. Uh, could blast him out. But really, Miracosta doing a great job maintaining control and just being the better tanker. Yeah, you see that amplification matrix come out from Drowsy. Totally assisting that defensive hold for the Mustangs. I mean, they, the, uh, I said it on the first map, and now we're seeing it again. This mentality of bend but do not break, right? Bend but do not break. Let them have a little percentage here, regroup, get back together, and then make it happen as a squad. Miracosta looks great. Downey now on the point of Miracosta. Oh no, sorry. Miracosta did get it back. Look at that. Yeah, you know, Downey doing everything they can here to try and gain pressure. Some ults about to come in here for Downey if they're lucky, but Hawk is going to fall first. R.E.M. nearly out as well. 
And Don falls there. Are you maintaining life? But not for long. And Bait with a two-piece. The double kill. And a huge one from Bait. As he's going to get traded out here as well. Downey doing a great job battling back. But really just struggling to break through this Miracosta defense. And even when they do, it's only for moments at a time. Right? It's so Miracosta... They're showing cracks in the armor here and there, but it's not much. It really is not much. And they just, they find a way to get back into it no matter where Downey is coming from on the map. Yeah, you know, and, and I think it boils down to the kind of pressure that these tanks and off tanks are putting. The healers, you know, keeping them stacked as well. And the DPS just remaining hungry. Downey though on the opposition, looking to battle back here as they get some time, some percentage of their own on that hill and find a couple kills a big one on drowsy nonetheless we'll see if they can make something of it drywall eater probably the most hilarious gamer tag on the map today <laughs> i hope my uh i hope my young uh player out there doesn't have too much chalk in the mouth while <laughs> he is trying to uh execute here on the map hey downey's looking pretty stout right now 44 percent here this thing is getting pretty even up but the attack from your costa ooh, it's stout oh Masonar and Lucky Tiger going down, though. Yeah, the, the attack warded off well here by Downey, finding not a two-piece, but nearly a three. Lucas on the retreat. Bates going to fall as well. Lucas falls here, too. And Downey now making the push they need. And this could be it. Battling back. Miracosta's going to or Miracosta's gonna have to wait on these members to respawn, and this could be a, a final push for them. Yeah, most certainly. I mean, now we are looking at a Downey lead here on the point a couple of ultimates call them three ultimates online for both teams so this team fight right here is going to be pivotal for miracosta if they want to stay in this round yeah and, and retrospectively like on the other side downey has to win this if they want to stay in the tournament you know do or die for them basically as uh miracosta taking those first two with ease We do have that overtime coming out here again. Still being contested. Can Miracosta do the unthinkable in overtime? 99% for Downey. But now it does go in the way of Miracosta. And can they hold it? Will Downey be able to break back in here in these final moments? The dragons come out. It's a huge ultimate for Hunch. And they turn it around. Miracosta backs up against the wall but they push they make it happen and if they win here then they will be on series point if they win here then we go to eichenwald and if they win that it's all over man wow great stuff out of the mustangs now back into overtime being contested here both teams at 99 back and forth but Downey loses three members here and that could be all she wrote as Mira Costa looking to clutch things up still. The contention coming in, the overtime ticking away. Can they bleed him down? Down, he's still losing members. Meanwhile, Mira Costa not losing a single one, and they are gonna clutch it up here. Wow. Downey's showing some life though. Really showing some life throughout this map, but it just is Mira Costa with the beautiful beautiful execution and team play throughout this map as well i mean hot sauce wow they they are on yeah. it right now and a huge play there we see uh, you know from luca's perspective but it was actually hanzo hunch who came in there with that all finding a three piece the triple kill nonetheless and a big one miracosta sitting at two to none versus downey again downey like we had mentioned, kind of the favorite from what we had heard behind seeds. But, uh, man, Miracosa just putting on an absolute display here today. They are. And everybody, look, everybody on the team really participating, right? You know, pulling their weight, playing their role very well. But a couple of players that I want to just highlight, you're looking at Lucky Tiger, okay? Lucky Tiger is out there on the Reinhardt playing that tank. Absolutely lights out. Really, really great stuff. And then Drowsy. That Baptiste, those heals, okay? It's it's tough to play Baptiste well because you are responsible for both damage and healing. You are responsible for a lot. And Drowsy's just doing it, just really executing with the Baptiste. The ultimates are coming out at the perfect time, right? And making everything work cohesively for this Miracosta squad. Amazing stuff. 
yeah, you know, they just they've done a phenomenal job all the way around from from both the attacking side and that defensive perspective. But the defense is what really stands out for me on, on the Miracosta side. Uh, you know, at, at times Downey has found a way to crack it for maybe just a moment. That map there being the closest one that we've seen by far, of course, 99 percent for both teams in mm -hmm. overtime. Um, but really, Miracosta just doing a, a good job at finding Downey's weaknesses, exploiting, you know, over watch being such a tough game there is so much going on those those you know a lot of times dps is so important but that tank role that off tank role and that healing is just so crucial in overwatch six men fight six men and women you know fighting tooth and nail on both sides and there's just so much going on right now miracosta seems to have the better comms their team is working so well together the rotations you can see from the, the main tank to the off tank the heels coming in and really the i would love to hear the comms they have to be absolutely on point right now uh, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine that those uh, those Discord channels for both teams are very, very active at this point. Uh, look, as you said, Downey showed a lot of life there, especially in round two, Avilios, right? Mm -hmm. So do they have the steam to really pick it up and take it to Miracosta right now? I think they do, but they have got to continue on the trajectory that they are on. They cannot let this map number two loss get into their heads. Right? Mm -hmm. Because Eichenwald, this first push is brutal. Man, trying to get up this hill is just a pain. Yeah, I mean, they have to find an answer, right, for this drowsy Lucky Tiger combo. Right now, these two are working so well together. Um, and, and, of course, everybody filling in the role perfectly to, to kind of fill in the, the boys of the team. But I think if Downey can find a way to break this Lucky Tiger drowsy combo, find a pick there early, they can have that push that they need. I completely agree. I do think that that really is what it's about, getting that key elimination off the bat. The issue, Miracosta tends to be quicker getting that first blood, right? They tend to be quicker getting that first elimination. And so at the end of the day, if you're Downey, you gotta get out and you gotta say, okay, maybe target one individual player, right? And say, hey, this is who we're going after and this is when we move. Let's get into it. The bridge is where the action starts, folks. Yeah, as you know, easier said than done sometimes. And we'll see how this first push goes. Of course, Miracosta up by two. Look at the close thing down here. Tournament that you uh, that we all just saw. Um, and so if you guys are interested in watching more of the live stream, you can go to twitch.tv slash high school underscore GG. And so right now we're going to go into the Los Angeles Clean Cities Coalition uh, with Abby Drood, and we're going to go into a video presentation first. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Drood, and I'm here today with the Los Angeles Clean Cities Coalition to briefly talk about ways we can save money when looking to drive an electric vehicle. If you have any questions at all throughout the presentation, please feel free to leave them in the chat and I will get to those at the end. Now, part of my job with the city is really to educate our community on ways we can reduce our environmental impact through transportation. One really great way to do this is by driving an electric vehicle because of the benefits they offer as compared to our regular gasoline or diesel powered vehicles. On the one hand, electric vehicles don't release emissions from their tailpipe which offers us air quality benefits, global warming benefits, and even health benefits. On the other hand, it tends to cost much less to charge our electric vehicles than it costs to fuel our gasoline or diesel powered vehicles. Despite these benefits, I know it can be incredibly overwhelming to buy a new vehicle, electric or otherwise, but fortunately, there are many great cost-saving resources such as incentives and rebates that help to make this purchase more feasible. So that really brings me to the point of my presentation today. Um, my goal is to walk us through some of those cost saving resources. I'll show us how to access those incentives and rebates, and I'll talk about why they're so useful. Now, before I jump into those resources, I want to give a quick introduction to our program, the Los Angeles Clean Cities Coalition, and talk for a second about the work that we're doing here in LA. Clean Cities is a Department of Energy program with an overarching goal of shifting the country towards cleaner transportation options. The program is really a nationwide network of nearly 100 local coalitions all working towards this goal. 
Los Angeles Clean Cities is our local coalition. To work on reducing vehicle emissions here in Los Angeles, we serve as a resource to our stakeholders and the broader community. Our city's departmental fleets are our primary stakeholders, and what we do is really assist them with transitioning to alternative fuels or with using less fuel overall. So just a few examples here in LA, we have refuse collection vehicles which run entirely on natural gas, and we even have an electrically powered fire truck. Okay, now on to those resources. A really great place to start is our Los Angeles Clean Cities website. Our coalition's webpage can be found at lacitysan.org slash clean cities. From here, you can head to the Clean Cities Resources page by scrolling down on the gray bar to the left and clicking on Clean Cities Resources. The Clean Cities Resources page is extremely useful because it leads directly to many of the different incentives and tools that I'll be talking about today. The first three links here will lead you directly to incentives or rebate programs that help with the cost of purchasing or charging an electric vehicle. The next three links here lead to resources and tools for current or potential EV owners. And lastly, at the bottom of the page, there are EV handbooks. One that would be most applicable here is the Plug-in Electric Vehicle Handbook for Consumers. Another great resource is the Alternative Fuels Data Center, or the AFDC. Their website can be accessed at afdc.energy.gov. Right now, we're at the website's homepage. If we want to learn some more about electric vehicles, we can click on this electricity button here in red. That takes us to this informational page where we can learn about the benefits and considerations of electric vehicles, find electric charging stations, and access EV-specific incentives. So back at the homepage here, we can also find various laws and incentives by clicking at this tab on the green bar. There we find this incentive search tool. This tool allows us to enter where we're located, what type of vehicle or incentives we're interested in, as well as what type of consumer we are, and then it'll provide a list of results that match those categories. The last thing I'll point out on the AFDC website is their tools page, which again you can access at that green bar. This tools page provides links to all of the interactive tools that the AFDC offers. Some of the most helpful and applicable tools will be the Vehicle Cost Calculator, the Alternative Fueling Station Locator, and the Find a Car tool. Our next resource is California's Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, or CVRP. Their goal is simply to promote the adoption of cleaner vehicles here in California, and they do this by offering a rebate of $1 to $7,000 for the purchase of an electric vehicle. CVRP's website can be accessed at cleanvehiclerebate.org. To learn more about their rebates, we can click on the CVRP Info tab and access their program overview. From this page, we can access information on eligibility requirements for the rebate, and if we keep scrolling down, we can see how much funding is still available and find some more information about CVRP. Another great resource can be found on their Car Shoppers tab by clicking on Air District slash Utility Rebates. Here we're presented with a comprehensive list of rebates for new electric vehicles, used electric vehicles, electric charging stations at home, and vehicle replacement programs. Lastly, I encourage you all to check with your utility providers for any resources they may offer to help save money on electric vehicles. Many have some really great incentives, especially for electricity rate reductions or charging station costs and LADWP is a great example of this. LADWP's main page can be accessed at ladwp.com. If we head to their residential customers homepage, go to the Go Green tab and click on electric vehicles, we'll see a page full of electric vehicle information and incentives offered by LADWP. There are a couple things I'd like to point out here. First is the used EV rebate, which puts up to $1,500 towards the purchase of a used electric vehicle. And second is the residential EV charging station rebate, which covers up to 100% of the cost of purchasing and installing a home charging station. So these are just a few of the many resources out there that help lower the cost of driving an electric vehicle. I really wanted to show you that there are many cost-saving opportunities out there and provide direction on how to access them. Again, if you're looking for a good place to start, I recommend our Coalition website because there you can find links to many of the resources that I talked about today. Thank you so much for your time and I really hope this was useful. If you have any additional questions that I do not get to, please feel free to email me at the email below. Thank you.
Wow, that was an awesome presentation. So actually now joining us live is Abby to answer some questions. But first, uh, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and about LACC? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abby Drude. I am here with the Los Angeles Clean Cities Coalition. And like I mentioned in the video, we are a Department of Energy program, and we really work hard to reduce our emissions from transportation here in Los Angeles. So yeah, thank you again for having me. All right, so we wanted to ask some questions to you. And one of the questions are, what are some benefits of electric vehicles? And why should we consider driving an electric vehicle? Sure. So electric vehicles have a lot of benefits, uh, starting with the um, environmental side of things. Electric vehicles don't release emissions from their tailpipe. So unlike gasoline powered vehicles, which do, um, electric vehicles really offer these air quality benefits, which um, in turn helps with public health. So um, as I'm sure you know, uh, communities that live close to freeways often often suffer from um, health conditions like asthma and things like that. So um, driving electric vehicles really helps to uh, improve our air quality. And then if we look over on the money side of things, we see that um, it's much cheaper to charge electric vehicles than it is to fuel our gasoline powered vehicles. And I know lately the gas prices have been insane. And so um, electric vehicles really offer that benefit as well. Yeah. And then one other thing, uh, you know, what's sort of the deal with like the EVA range? Like, do you need to worry like about running out of charge? Right. Yeah, that's a really common question. And um, range is interesting. So just in the same way that our gasoline fuel economy differs between different vehicles, the range will differ between different electric vehicles as well. So it really depends on the model. But most people don't have much of an issue with it because electric vehicles can be charged at home. So a lot of people will just plug in their car overnight in the same way that you would plug in a cell phone overnight. Um, or a lot of workplaces and the parking lots will have chargers. So you can kind of just plug in your car while you're at work. And it doesn't tend to be an issue for most people. Although if you are going on longer trips, then it would be good to um, just plan ahead of time and look up where different charging stations are. So you've definitely convinced us to buy an electric <laughs> Uh, vehicle. Um, but you know, we're just we're still students, so we probably can't afford that. But are there any other ways that we can still reduce our environmental impact from driving? Yeah, definitely. So I mean, yeah, I know buying a new vehicle can be super daunting. Um, and it's just, it's just not feasible for a lot of people. But there are lots of other ways that we can really like reduce those emissions, reduce our environmental impact. Um, and it just takes being a little bit mindful about our transportation. So um, one thing we can do is really try to walk or bike or take public transportation whenever that's possible. So maybe if it's for shorter trips, um, can be a good way to get outdoors too. Uh, another thing we can do is carpool. So uh, maybe talk with your neighbor or some friends or, um, you know, someone who's going to school with you or going to work with you and try to share rides that way. Uh, another thing we can do is really make sure we're maintaining our vehicles well. So um, keeping the tire pressure right and maintaining the engine can really help maintain your vehicle's fuel economy. And another thing we can do is really optimize the and the grower and um, it might make sense to uh, um, plan those trips together and combine trips so that um, we're just being more efficient. And then also, you know, I know, you know, normally when you have gas powered cars, you know, you pull it to a gas station and it takes like maybe like two to three minutes to fill it up. How long does it take uh, to charge um, an EV vehicle? Yeah, that's a really common question. So it depends, again, on the type of charger you're using. So there's a few different types of chargers. We have level one, which is essentially just a cord. You plug it into the outlet in your wall and that can take a really long time. So that's more ideal if you don't drive as often or if you can plug it in overnight. Then we have level two chargers, which take about five to eight hours, depending on the car, depending on the vehicle. So again, it just takes some extra planning, charge it overnight while we're at work. And then there's DC fast chargers, which those are really common with Teslas and some other cars as well. And those can be really quick from 15 to 45 minutes. But again, it's more like charging a cell phone than it is like fueling up a car. So it kind of just takes a little bit different planning than just running by the gas station and filling up in two minutes. Got it. And 
This is some really great information. And is there anything else that you wanted to share to the viewers of City of STEM about electric uh, car cars or just about like reducing environmental impacts? Sure. So, um, yeah, you know, in here in California, there's a big push towards um, conserving the environment, towards reducing our environmental impacts. And one thing that um, recently happened was Governor Newsom signed an executive order, which is uh, mandating that by the year 2035, there will be no sales of new gasoline cars. So new passenger cars and trucks um, will all have to be electric or zero emission. And that can be overwhelming, um, especially if people aren't ready to part with their gasoline cars. Um, but I think we should um, recognize how encouraging this is. It's definitely a positive for the environment. And it'll mean that with more and more electric cars on the market um, and on the roads, they'll become more affordable, more common. Um, you know, local governments will, uh, will implement more um, charging stations. And as we all shift in that direction, it'll be much more feasible um, to purchase a, an electric car. Um, so I would just say that, you know, the shift towards electricity is happening. And um, I think it's great for our environment and for our air quality, especially here in Los Angeles. So I think we have some um, exciting advancements to look forward to. Yeah, it's definitely uh, some exciting advancements. Um, but uh, one other thing I wanted to add um, is, you know, there is, you know, fully electric cars as well as completely gas powered cars. And then, of course, you know, some newer um, car companies have been starting to create hybrid, um, you know, I believe Lexus is one of them that has, you know, a little bit of both. Uh, what do you think that has uh, as an impact towards our environment in comparison to, you know, the fully electric cars? Right. I think those are excellent. So, yeah, Lexus, Toyota, there's a lot of car makers with hybrids. And um, hybrids have the advantage of allowing you to still use gasoline, but their fuel economy is um, much better than regular gasoline vehicles. So, um, again, they're going to emit much less. And um, I think any improvement uh, towards efficiency and towards, you know, environmental quality is better than nothing at all. Um, there's also plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which can use gasoline and they can be charged. Um, and so, again, that's a great, you know, um, intermediate option before going towards fully electric. And the same thing, those allow you to use less gas, um, which for some people is more feasible than no gas at all. Got it. And for our online viewers out there, is there any place that uh, we can find, like any websites or uh, social media that we can find the Los Angeles Clean Cities Coalition? Yeah, so the best place to go is our coalition website. It's, um, it's listed on the LA Sanitation website. So that can be found at lacitysan.org slash clean cities. And um, yeah, you can find a lot of information about our program and some of those links and resources that I was sharing in the video. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure having you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yes. So hopefully, you know, we can all take a first step towards helping our environment um, just through, you know, the automobile automobiles that we drive around daily. Um, you know, we can all take a first step by maybe, you know, trying out a new hybrid car or, you know, maybe even, you know, fully stepping into the electric vehicles. Um, but for now, we're actually going to jump over um, to another video from City of STEM. How incredible is that? We have a snake that just caught a fish and is attempting to devour it on the side of the stream. This is absolutely incredible. I have yet to see any fish during my exploration here on this freshwater ecosystem. And the very first fish I see is in the mouth of a snake. This is amazing. Well, this fish is about the same size as the snake. So watching it actually attempt to devour it is gonna be incredible. Snakes have the capability of opening their mouths up to 180 degrees to be able to swallow prey that's larger than them. A reptile live in action in a freshwater stream ecosystem. It doesn't get much better than this. Came back to check on our snake friend and uh, he's about halfway done with this fish, which is absolutely amazing. It can take snakes upwards of hours or even days to consume an entire meal, but uh, we'll check that out on the next adventure. Creatures of the deep. Assemble! Awesome! Wow!
Welcome to Ichthyology, where we have over three million fishes. There are more fishes than all other vertebrates combined. So if you take all the birds, all the amphibians and reptiles, all your mammals, fishes outnumber all of those. Who's number 46,853? Fishes are pretty slimy in general. If you've ever held one, you can always feel the slime right away. And they use the slime, though, in so many different ways. The most notable, slimiest fish there is is the hagfish. So these guys are unique among fishes in that they produce slime. And not just a little bit of slime. I mean lots and lots of slime. If anything attacks it, it has over 100 mucus uh, specialized cells that will just create so much slime that it gums up a predator's mouth and gills. And so nothing will keep on holding onto it. So they'll just let it go and it'll swim away. You haven't seen the last of me. Well, I've certainly seen enough. This here is a parrotfish, known because it has its fused teeth that create a beak like a parrot. It's one of the coolest slimy fishes that we have, because it actually makes a mucus cocoon that it sleeps in at night. Oh, can a bird nap in peace? I would tell any kid that wants to be a scientist to make sure to keep your curiosity, to always ask questions, to always ask your teachers how to get more information about something that you're really interested in. Let us go off and admire the beauty and fragility of nature. As a baby, she survived. That's pretty crazy. Townsfolk said her wit and vigor awoke when the lightning hit her. Said to be a sickly child, the lightning struck and she turned white. Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages turned? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages turned? Mary's pastor urged his flock with faith in God and also what? So Clever Mary raised by the sea, her first love was geology. With brother Joe, faithful pup Jay, Mary searched for vertebrae. A lifeline for a family poor, for Mary fossils were much more. Devil's fingers, vertebraries, the search was no hobby for Mary. Her knowledge grew extraordinary, a science born at the forefront. Clever Mary! What have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages turned? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages turned? Fossil hunting in Lime Regis was extremely dangerous. Unstable fish freshly collapsed is where the alien shores were trapped. Clever Mary was tight and limb to find the final specimens. Ichthyopesio pterosaur, Mary discovered evermore. Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned when books abound and pages turn? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned when books abound and pages turn? But being a woman was quite common, the practice was still frowned upon and Though Clever Mary knew more than most, she was never allowed to publish her Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages down? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages down? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages down? Clever Mary, what have you found amongst the rocks and cliffs and down? Clever Mary, what have you learned in books abound and pages down?
This is my office. Come on in and I'll show you some specimens. The coolest part about my job is that I get to study any mollusk that I want and our collections are huge here at the museum. We have over four million specimens. Check out my new snail. Patrick, your snail is a rock. In nature, mollusks use slime in all sorts of ways. Probably the most common is snails use slime on their foot, so that's the bottom of their body, to slime along either on land or in the ocean. Um, other snails use slime um, if they're slugs. They have sort of a poisonous slime that when something tries to eat them, their slime is disgusting. Other snails use slime in, in really unusual ways. My very favorite specimen that we have in the museum is a snail called Janthina janthina, and it's a purple bubble shell. You can see that it's two colors, light on the bottom and purple on the top. And the reason that I say bottom and top is because it lives upside down. <laughs> janthina janthina floats in the ocean with its shell below it and a raft of bubbles that it makes out of slime on the top. Wow. One of the other things that I got interested in because I study mollusks, in particular sea slugs, they're very brightly colored and they have interesting sort of wavy patterns sometimes on their, their body. They're called parapodia. So I sometimes crochet sea slugs for fun. As you do. The most important thing for kids to do if they want to be a scientist is to maintain that curiosity. So keep asking questions about the natural world. The more you do that, the more set up you are to be a scientist. Ah, gee, Gary, you sure are smart. Did you think my shell was full of hot air? Look how cute these little guys are! Oh. <laughs> There are so many insects in the world. There are lots of species that are still unknown to science. In the 20 so years I've been studying insects, I've helped to find new species, which is just a dream come true. This is the happiest day of my life! Insects are a little different than other animals that use slime because they don't really have slime on the outside of their body, but they do have ooze-like fluids on the inside that they sometimes can use for defense. Sometimes they actually push out a pores in their exoskeleton, which we call reflex bleeding, which is just really kind of gross and cool. And then in some cases, slime comes out the other end of their body, so sort of peeing it out. Can I use your bathroom? Okay, make it quick. That's okay. So it's hard to see because they're so small, but right at the tip of my tweezers here is a special little creature that we call the spittle bug. If you happen to see them outside, it'll look like someone actually spit on the plant. So grasshoppers, if they get captured, then they're actually gonna regurgitate or barf up some fluids that are inside of their body, which will make them a little slimy and make them taste really, really bad. So something like a lizard might start to swallow it and then change its mind and spit it out. Pretty cool. Amazing. We need a lot of different kinds of people to become scientists. People who are curious and creative and compassionate and bring a lot of different abilities and talents to the scientific community. So if this is something that you're interested in, pursue it and don't let anybody discourage you. Who's ready? I'm ready! Who's ready? I'm ready! City of All right, next up is Newport Wales, which is an organization that provides whale watching experiences. And you know, I remember one time in fifth, or sorry, in first grade, I actually went on a whale watching trip. Um, it was such an amazing experience. I actually saw a whale. I was really lucky. Um, it was sort of far off, but I was able to see it sort of come out uh, for a breath of air, um, which was amazing. So it's definitely something you guys should all try one time. So what's your favorite whale? Type of for whale? me... I think it would have to be the blue whale only because I think that's one of the most, you know, known whales just because um, I believe that's the biggest mammal on the earth. And so um, that is definitely my favorite whale. That's really cool. And so a little bit more about Newport whales. So it's Davies Locker Whale Watching, which is located in Newport Beach, California. And it's a year round whale watching at, uh, uh, cruises. And they, you can see whales and dolphins year round at Newport Beach. Um, and then some other interesting things about Newport whales is, you know, depending on the season, you actually go whale watching, uh, different species of whales can actually be seen. Um, in the summertime, for example, we can see blue whales. Um, and then, you know, other animals can be seen throughout the year, like sea lions, seabirds, sharks, um, and jellyfish even. Wow. And so right now we're going to head down to the field crew. 
uh, for an activity. One. Hi, we're over here to uh, ask you. My name is Jill. I'm with Newport Wales down from Newport. Hey, I'll be safe. So what's the activity? Oh my goodness. We are having this really fun activity explaining how our filter feeders, or baleen whales, eat. So as, unlike other predators and carnivores, they don't seek one item out and stop that. They go for masses of little organisms like krill. Studying whale poop has 
done so much for our planet and the health of whales. We used to, back in the day, shoot a dart at the whale and get a plug of skin and blubber. You can understand how that might be somewhat invasive. Now we can scoop up whale poop and test for cortisol or stress hormone levels, see how well they're doing, actually do DNA on all things whale poop. And we can then help them as far as migratory patterns, because we can see the food that they're eating in their poop is not where they are now, so how far they've traveled in that time it takes to digest. And then also, I want you to take two breaths with me, right? In breath, exhale, inhale, exhale, and for one of those breaths, all the oxygen you took in came from the ocean from itty bitty phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton need phosphates, nitrates, and iron, all heavy elements that sink, right? And so it gets trapped into the food or naturally available sink. Blue whales, they only defecate at the surface, redistributing the surface, which then creates the phytoplankton to grow, which then creates 50 to 75% of the oxygen you breathe. So every time you breathe, you need to think. Yes, whale poop! Whale poop has sponsored one of two of your breasts. How awesome is that? Woo! We love some whale poop in here. Yes! You have a very welcome. I appreciate you, girls. Woo! Right! <laughs>
whatever. And I started as a volunteer. And one of the first things we do as a volunteer is you learn how to hatch grunion. So grunion are really cool in that they come up, mom and dad come up onto the beach at night and they lay eggs. And those eggs then get to stay for 10 days under the sand. And all they need is a little shake. And what happens when we shake them, that's just like the big waves coming in. When high tide comes in, all of a sudden, we start to get little friends hatching. And so today we're demonstrating that because tonight is it. And that means that's when mom and dad come up on the beach. And it's one of the things that becomes one of our best teaching tools. We have students um, like myself, I started as one, um, who get to do research in our lab. And one of our great teaching tools is using the drumming. Um, we also have a lot of other critters. We do a lot of reclamation projects helping out uh, endangered species, and sometimes our students get to work with those. Um, and one of the best things we do is the Young Scientist Program. Kiddos from a myriad of high schools come in, and under the tutelage of mentors from the lab, they get to do their own undergraduate research projects, and then they present at the Young Scientist Symposium at the end of the year. So, from that program, we've got two kids here today. George, tell us a little bit about what you're up to, how you got involved with Cabrillo, and what are you doing now? Yes, yeah, so, um, I first heard about Cabrillo at the Grunion Rock, which is really interesting because that's what's happening tonight. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I got really interested because I've always loved marine sciences, and I thought that this would be an amazing opportunity to explore things that's in my interest. So I started working at the Young Scientist Program, and as a junior, I'm still continuing. Um, the Young Scientist Program is one of the best programs I've ever been in, and it's mostly because, like, it's a program where they let students really look and interest and make their own research projects and provide them with the support and help they need to accomplish the walk through those research projects, which I think is amazing and something that really isn't seen or heard of these days. So for the first two years, I was working on marine sponges. I was looking at uh, bioactive compounds within marine sponges and how we can isolate them and use them in the medical field. And then this year, I actually translated the transition to uh, work in rotifers, which are also a very interesting microorganism. Um, and yeah, so I've taken the things I've learned at the Cabrillo Marine Corps and I've gone to the science fair and um, something really amazing, I just got accepted to JSEF, which is the joint um, educational uh, program hosted by Dartmouth College and it is something that I've been looking forward to and I could have done without the Cabrillo Marine Corps. So I would say to any students who want to join that this is a great opportunity, it's a great platform um, and it's a really exciting way to explore your passions and learn more about marine sciences or climate science, which is anything you want to learn more about relating to the ocean. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, I originally got started with the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium by uh, volunteering at their uh, Coastal Park Naturalists program. And um, this last year, actually, I was working with uh, different marine animals, and I thought they were really interesting. So I decided to uh, to see if Cabrillo had any programs. And as it turned out, they actually had the Young Scientist program. So I was working with the uh, young scientist program and I came in with almost no knowledge of marine animals or anything like that but uh, through their guidance and uh, patience I was able to learn a lot more about both um, algae which is the focus of my project and also the scientific process in general so uh, this past year I've actually been working on my project which is finding new applications for algae so I have a couple pictures of uh, some of the research I've been doing but um, it's been really great Having the help of all the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium staff and yeah. Well, Mark, what, what, what are you a part of now? Isn't there something you just did oh, recently yeah. that proud of you for? Yeah, so I recently went to the Elder and I actually ended up getting first place in the uh, microbiology division. And thank you. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to the International uh, Science and Engineering Fair um, in May, so that's very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. Congratulations, my dude. Thank you. I'm really proud of you. Well. That's a little bit about us and what we're up to at Cabrillo. Um, tonight is a grunion run, so we'll be out there late at night getting ready to see new fish come on up onto the ocean. So feel free to come out and join us tonight. Uh, and if not, thank you guys so much for stopping by our booth. It's really good to always talk about fish. We're always happy to do so. Bye thank guys, you. thank you. Thank you.
to the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. My name's Lindsay. I'm an aquarist here at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And one of my jobs is to do something really fun, is to feed all of the animals in our entire aquarium. So I'm going to introduce you guys to some of the food items that we feed in this tank. One of those food items is this guy right here. This is a market squid. We also have something that you might recognize. You might eat this very often. This is shrimp. So we have some shrimp for these guys. And then lastly, something you might not recognize um, as easily, this kind of yellow stuff right here, kind of orangish golden color, this is clam. So a lot of these sharks in here love to eat squid, clam, and shrimp. So that's what we're gonna do right now. And I'm just gonna toss in some of this in a scatter feed. So we do something called a broadcast feed or a scatter feed where I'm simply just throwing in the food because these guys are really good at finding food on their own. They're relying on their senses and I don't really have to target feed them, meaning I don't have to put it right near their mouth for them to find it. They'll swim around and find the food pretty well on their own. Okay. Okay. Aquarium, and we're gonna catch some plankton today. First of all, you need some tools to catch the plankton. You need your plankton net, um, which has this bottle. It's called the caught end. Like when you catch something, you caught it. So this is the caught end. Then we also need a collecting permit because we will be collecting it. So on this, I have a permit. And then this is our collection jar that we'll be putting the plankton in, okay? Estamos aquí a Cabrillo Beach, donde hay dos mareas altas, dos mareas bajas, casi todos los días. Como tú puedes imaginar, la marea alta es cuando la agua está creciendo más alto en la playa y la marea baja es cuando está bajando más cerca a la mar. Es muy interesante cuando tú tienes una oportunidad para ver las cosas que están dejando por la marea alta. A veces encontramos algas, a veces encontramos conchas, piedras, rojas, cáscaras de animales, basura también. Pero vamos a mirar qué está aquí hoy.
grow and hopefully become the future engineers of tomorrow. Are you teaching your kids about money? I love yes. coming to this not, place because it gets to a variety of products to help something. you teach your kids about education. It's something we education. call we start with kids as young as five doing a project we call Fun with Technology, where they learn electronics and circuits. Our most popular product is our financial education curriculum. Move on to mechanical robots, the mech box, motors, wheels, gears, metal. We cover a variety of topics, such as coin identification, We move on to computer programming of robots, which we like to call bots with brains. We teach them the basic code to do things taxes. like turn on a light. The Once they know how to turn on a light long, with a piece of the computer best code, the they can do just about anything. All grade levels. So you teach all your kids now that you can actually do something. Our financial education program program is also dyslexia friendly, autism improved by the Autism Hope Alliance, and the kids teach each other. Also reviewed by Attitude Magazine, which is the ADHD and the Magazine. What's great is our curriculum can be broken down to individual activities to accommodate the learning style of your child. I hope you check us out at www.moneymunchkids.com. I love this piece of machinery. Beyond that, we have a competition team that competes on an international level. I am really proud of myself that I was able to do this. This has gotten me started into a career of maybe engineering or science. That was the best place I've ever went all summer. We help you turn scraps and excess materials into tools for storytelling, experiments, Hi everyone, Functional this is Victoria from Money Munch Kids. And other fun Are you stuff. teaching your kids about money? We brainstorm. If not, don't we imagine, worry. We've got a variety of products make, to help you teach we your kids care. about financial education. This is not only do we have a full curriculum, but we also have games, digital download Learn activity books, as well as other website, accessories. Our most popular org. product is Special our financial education curriculum. Office for that curriculum, we have workbooks for kindergarten, first grade, second, us. and even three plus, which works for up to seventh to eighth grade. We cover a variety of topics, such as coin identification, Science income, like expenses, no profit, no how kids versus adults make money, savings, and spending, today, needs, wants, budgeting, of course, but also topics like view. businesses, investing, stocks, taxes. The lesson's are only 30 to 45 minutes course. long, and the best part Practice is the instructor's guide works with all the grade levels, so you can play. teach all your kids with just a our single instructor's guide. Our financial education curriculum is also dyslexia-friendly, autism improved by the Autism Hope Alliance, we were also reviewed by Attitude Magazine, which is an ADHD and LD Draw, lifestyle magazine. And What's great is our curriculums reading. can be broken down to individual activities Explore to accommodate the learning foot. style of your child. And learn about the I hope you check us out at www.moneymunchkids.com. At Emerald Bay, a lifetime of memories. Welcome to Discovery Cube Connects, outdoor science adventures. We've created three unique, fun, and exciting adventures to help you achieve legendary status in outdoor science, exploring the hidden worlds of your own home and backyard. Flappers, Flutterers, and Flyers adventure. Learn how to become an expert scientist, collecting data and photos of bugs, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other cool creatures. Have you ever wondered how many whales there are? How big do they get? How do they eat? Whales are some of the coolest animals in the whole world. So let's go learn more about them. Spectrum ID, LACM 150167, alias Pop. Description, juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex. Area of study, paleontology, Acquisition. Hi everyone, LACM my name is Erica, and I'm Jessica, Hereafter and we're naturalists. Was so discovered by Prospector Bob yes. Curry in 2003 well, in Montana's Hell Creek Formation, or a layer of sedimentary field. rock dated we to the late Cretaceous between in 67 and So today, we're going to learn a little bit years. about whales, Later, dolphins, and Later, and a team from the Natural History Museum so of Los Angeles all, County, California, excavated for three years between 2003 and 2005, and described the specimen which was named after Bob Curry's brother. Close to 80% of the body was recovered, making it one of the most complete T-Rexes ever found. It was eventually brought to the laboratory at NHMLA, where it was prepared for the better part of six years. It became the centerpiece of the museum's revamped dinosaur hall in 2011. Implementing new display techniques, the original body of Thomas is on display, Sans Australia, and a few teeth, while still being accessible to researchers for further study. The original skull is exhibited in the glass display adjacent to the body. Interpretation and context of how big some of these whales and dolphins actually are compared to an adult human. Do you have a favorite whale? Let us know in the comments when below. When I look at this skull, the blue whale is the largest animal that's primal. ever lived. 
larger than any dinosaur, ancestral fear. larger than any megalodon, and can you see mammals were at their infancy during the Mesozoic. School buses. Early mammal fossils tell of small creatures scurrying between the feet long. of giant reptiles. Since there are so many but hoping to not be noticed. They're actually broken up. Between you gaining attention groups. could mean finding yourself One between giant serrated teeth. Whale category. The other I can only imagine this creature with flesh whales. and movement. And so we'll talk a little bit more Every now and then I unfocus my eyes and I see the smiling whale. outline of what was this once gray whale has a true nightmare. Slightly open. So you can see There's really nothing like staring into the faces of these terrible the reptiles, the imagining the world they rule. Here in North America, none exemplify the domination of Earth during the Mesozoic as much as the iconic Tyrannosaurus Rex, which literally means Tyrant Lizard King. If you look at the inside of a baby Today, whale's the crown is passed to a different animal, hairy, and our understanding like hair. of the light, just as importantly the death as of these old kings, can help us understand what it truly means to whales. rule. And they use the baleen tea Thomas. to actually filter Thomas was a young the water king. like a or giant queen. spaghetti shaker. At this point, we really aren't sure. Unfused vertebra and limbs tell us these bones still had room to grow. When adulthood was reached, they would fuse together capping that crow. Thomas did not have the same resources year-round. And perhaps they during the winter, when food was scarce, the rate of bone growth slowed, leaving behind rings. With special Here microscopes, shark, you can even find these arrested growth coral. rings. And, as you can and much see, like counting rings on a tree, we are able to tell that Thomas was closer to 17 years old. And Thomas is small. Color. At 33 and a half feet, also a typical like adult T-Rex grew to an average of 40 so feet in length. Like he is what we consider a sub-adult. And yet, groups below the even surface. at this age, now the main goal Thomas is still quite a horror. Is to try to get as much There's a reason most people know T-Rex, aside from the radical name. Now this is a fin whale eating it's what sets right these theropods, or three-toed carnivorous dinosaurs, apart from other boat. carnivores. Six people on board, those teeth. T-Rex ruled because, quite simply, they had the what biggest this teeth. Whale is doing. Is it found a Reaching a foot in length, you can see tiny bumps the along the edges, now, and a groove towards the base where the new one was pushing upward. Their Most of the tooth is root. T-Rex needed a strong foundation fish. for what it was now, doing with these 12-inch the serrated, ever-replacing teeth. Their belly button area, Bite marks and copper lights, or ancient feces, tell us that these animals weren't just eating flesh, but even breaking through bone. For a dinosaur, this would mean an incredible time. amount of force. So once Muscles the lining the skull would exert close to 8,000 pounds of pressure. Imagine the weight of three compact cars focused on jagged points. Seawater. This Instead animal didn't just bite do. through bone. When they close it exploded their mouth, it. They use their giant now there are many things that we have been able to discover about the life of the dinosaurs. So again, and yet the even the most well known are full of mystery. LACM 150167 presents one such mystery. I mean, perhaps the first question that comes to mind whenever you discover a body is what killed it? What could have possibly killed this 33 foot monster? Toothed whales are pretty cool. As you can see here, this is a common dolphin. Common dolphins have tons of small, sharp teeth in their mouth that they use to catch and spear small schooling fish. So what do toothed whales eat? There's a variety of toothed whales around the world, so they also eat a variety of different types of food. I don't know. Some toothed whales... You can only imagine how hard it is to determine the cause of death Other when all you whales, have are bones. And it's nearly impossible when the case is 66 million years cold. Yeah, we're not without luck. Thomas, although shows no sign of foul play, so to speak, no broken infected bones or bite marks, and any clues left in soft tissue are long gone. Thomas here exhibits something special. Take a closer look at that eye. Behind that grapefruit-sized eye socket is a large bar. These post-orbital bones would withstand those immense pressures used to break through its prey. However, Thomas has a hole in his bar, a small detail not found in any other T-Rex skull. This feature shows signs of healing. It couldn't have been the reason for a sudden death, unless it was something a bit slower. This hole looks a lot like what occurs when a tumor pushes against bone today. It's difficult to imagine anything that can be considered dangerous for an animal like this. Perhaps this young creature never grew up because of some disease we still struggle with even today. After hundreds of millions of years, the domination of dinosaurs ended. 
and we're still unclear what halted their reign, but two smoking guns were found in the form of a hundred mile wide crater buried off the coast of the Yucatan, and the second in the miles of volcanic rock deposited in India, both around the time of their disappearance. Whether it was one or the other, or whether they just rolled snake eyes, what we do know is that it was only after the extinction of dinosaurs that mammals began to grow and fill the niche left behind by these reptiles. And today, we humans are the dominant rulers of this world. And much like T-Rex, we can be awe-inspiring and monstrous, although our most impressive feature is even more powerful than any bone exploding. It is this tool that has brought domination over most of the world and has allowed us the ability to look back at those that came before us. Thomas is an amazing example of the incredibly monstrous power it takes to dominate the world. And when I stand in front of the glass display, I can't help but notice the other ruler reflected in the mirror. Although we may never know for certain what killed this king, hopefully we can learn and appreciate just how fragile a crown can be. All right, next up is Underdog Education, who will be sharing some work with puppets. So uh, basically with the puppets, they're actually using art rods to create this. And it was actually invented by a classroom teacher to help children by reinforcing the letters of the alphabet uh, by shaping them. And it's sort of like Play-Doh where you can create anything with them. I guess it's sort of a mix between Play-Doh, Legos, and sort of like balloon animals. Um, and so let's go down to the field crew to learn more. All right, 661 Hi, so one, one, eight, 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 Hi, Milena. 661 Underdog Educational. Hi, what's your name? Hi. Keep this moving, keep this moving. Well, it's me. I'm, my name is Max Jaber, and this is my company, Underdog. We are, we are creative, make your own invention, create your own objects, uh, product, make these great things called art rods. By the way, you guys, I'm trying to move this because we have a huge, long plastic rods that you can bend and twist to make anything, everything you see here. Look at these cool objects we made all up and down here. Is that a winner right there? All ages. Every age. Even babies love these because they make anything you want. Look at these great sunglasses you could make, or these uh, this cool. We were making those all day long. If you look around there, about the, two dozen kids have these little dinosaurs and all around, and they make them themselves, right? Very simple and easy. Little hats like the one that we're wearing here. Here's a cool. Try it out. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Wow. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you gotta try on this one. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. yeah. Oh, that is cool. Wow. You know, you know, I look so stylish. Like, oh my god. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> this was a great thing. They can do design it themselves, they can make their own ideas. Really super creative and go in any direction, any kind of inventor they want because it's like it's like Play Doh, it's like balloon animals, it's like Legos because they actually snap together. All the pieces have little snaps on them, so you can be super, super creative. It's a fashion statement. What can I do? Do you think that a kid could, would enjoy making like making uh, cars or doing uh, animation with things like that? Like this? Um, yeah, I'd say so. Uh, okay. So Really beautiful signs. 
decorate. All ages. My kindergarten. I was a kindergarten teacher. Used them for teaching letters of the alphabet. Like S, right? Every day they might say a different letter. We stretch them out, new letters. So educationally, creatively, they're fun. And just, I don't know, for for any kind of purpose. We use them. Made different butterflies. And this is one of my favorite. This is my mascot. Real underwear, real gym shoes. Ah, you can go crazy with them. Right. And we got all different sizes. This is a full meter line. Those are huge. Right. We got sizes out there that have sizes. And um, we even got the small sizes. That's perfect. And check it out, all, all right. different kinds of stickers. Oh, that's accurate. All right, Zach. So it's fun, fun, fun. All right. All right. Nine Any nine questions? Nine 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 um, I, like I said, I was starting with kindergarten with doing letters of the alphabet. But in my mind, I was seeing, I was seeing things like this. I thought, oh, this could be so much more than just letters of the alphabet. So in my mind, every week I get more and more ideas, like a race car, like doing um, the lights on that. It's like this is so fun. So it's all about being creative, being original, and having something nobody else has. So, it's great. Nine, nine, one, seven, nine, you both look great with those hats on. Nine, nine, one, seven, nine, okay, any other questions? Anything? You also get a pretty I think so. I think it's very good. Right, right. But you know, in high school they actually use this for stop motion animation because if you can move it a little bit at a time, it's a great tool for doing animation without clay because they usually use clay. So this is a lot simpler. Again, you know, the price to different ages and years. But I really appreciate you guys coming here and visiting me with my creative idea. Um, I'm so excited to be here at STEM. I mean, this is the place for for creativity and inventions and ideas. Right. So good luck in your future. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Is that good? That's good. Okay. Filmmaking takes a lot of hard work and personally it is tiring but in the end it's really worth it and teamwork is very important too. Uh, when I first started I was only interested in screenwriting. I just wanted to be a screenwriter. When I went to my film classes I was like can I just do screenwriting but um it was actually during one of the workshops where I think, yeah, we saw a storyboard artist and suddenly my mind was blown. I was like, whoa, writing and art, that's wild. <laughs> so, and I think that's, that's what's really beautiful about the program is, yeah, you can focus on one thing that you really love, but no matter what, you're gonna still at least learn about other aspects of it. This program has really given me some knowledge about film that helps me explore different views of people like the cinematographer, the editor, the actors, the writers, and all the thought and effort that gets put into a story to make it visibly realistic. One of my film's names was The Sound of Justice. And that was um, about giving uh, platforms to people to speak on the topic of social justice and their own personal experiences with it. I think we talked to about like nine different people who each told their own stories, uh, whether it be about gender, race, or any other 
equality issue that they felt was important to their heart. And it was just a really great opportunity to hear a lot of stories from different types of people and about their different experiences. Love the support of all the speakers and um, staff helping. Um, this may not be what you want to pursue in life, but it is a very fun experience. Well, you can't have like social innovations without technology and art. And I think film is a great way to push for change just in the same in the same way that science and mathematics and engineering is in the same way. So go team. <laughs>
to help you become an expert in sustainability, we've created four amazing adventures with fun videos, music science, and a variety of entertaining and enlightening activities. Because while we learn to protect our planet, why not have a little fun along the way? Earn achievement badges at the completion of each adventure path, proving that you are a stupendous scientist with super sustainability powers. Good luck, scientists! Right. Mosquitoes kill more people than any animal in the world. More than a hippo, a lion, even a shark. Mosquitoes kill nearly one million people every single year. Let's learn more about these mosquitoes. They're so tiny that they're one-fourth of an inch. They're one-fourth of a quarter. You could technically line four mosquitoes up in a row to equal the size of a quarter. Here in California, there are two different mosquito species that we are most concerned about. They are the Culex and the 80s mosquitoes. They have some similarities and some differences. One of the differences is the time they like to come out to bite. The Culex mosquito will come out to bite at early sunrise and sunset. The 80s mosquito is out all day. That's why it's also known as the daytime biting mosquito. In addition, the Culex mosquito is native to California, meaning it's always been around, while the 80s mosquito is invasive to California and it was first discovered just some years ago. Standing water is water that is dirty, that has algae, bacteria, something that mosquitoes love to call home so they can feed off of it and lay their eggs. Standing water can be found in buckets, neglected pools, ponds, vases, wagons, even a bottle cap. Remember, whenever you see any standing water, make sure to tip and toss so you don't have to breathe any mosquitoes inside or outside your home. Learn more about mosquitoes in our fun and entertaining social media platforms, including Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Mosquito Swat Lab. When I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more to just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? I said, when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more to just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? I said, when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more to just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? Check it. I am a mathematician. When I do my work, you know I'm on a mission. I do a problem, hey. then I check my work. Does my answer make sense? Is it reasonable? That's the question that I ask every time I do math. I never do a problem and move to the next without asking myself, does it make sense? I can explain to a partner too. When you finish your work, that's what you're supposed to do. Yep, I cannot quit. When it comes to math, I'll never be content. Yes, I am it. And I always make sure my answers make sense. When you work with numbers that are compatible, that's how you know your answer is reasonable. Say when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? When I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? When you step in the class, don't disrespect. You can solve any problem, that's a bet. Guess and check is what you need to do When you're solving a problem and you aren't sure what to do I solve a problem and I do more than just work it out I ask myself questions after I ask the questions Yes, I do mental computations But I also show my work Double check in on my work Hmm, is it reasonable? That's the question that I ask every time I do math Hmm, is it reasonable? Take advantage of estimation in certain math situations Yep does it make sense? That's what I ask myself when I'm solving it. And after I show my work, I justify. Then I get in front of the class and testify. Say when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more to just solve it. Does my answer make sense? 
Does my answer make sense? I said, when I do a problem, I gotta do, gotta do more than just solve it. Does my answer make sense? Does my answer make sense? All right, so the next organization is Wildwoods, and they actually partnered with LADWP. Um, and so we're going to be participating in a little activity called the Water Footprint. And so basically for the activity, the participants, which are going to be you guys, you guys are going to think through the items, uh, you know, that you use on like a daily basis that consume water in the production process. And then you're going to basically take eight items in the order of, you know, the smallest water footprint to the largest water footprint. And you're going to basically track how much water you use daily. So for more than 20 years, Wildwoods has been providing uh, outdoor environmental literacy programs to Los Angeles students. And their nature-based programs integrate outdoor education, science, and social emotional learning, and can be done on campus or online, interactive and in real time. For today's activity, which is part of their free A Drop in the Bucket program, we'll find out what the water footprint of everyday items are. Hi, my name is Leah Espana and I am with Girls in Focus. Today I will be Perfect. interviewing. Hi, I'm Carol Peralta. And what do you have going on for today? So I'm with the Wadden Foundation and we have one of our programs set up here. It's a program called The Drop in the Bucket. It's sponsored by LADWP. And we talk about all things water. So footprints, where it comes from, and how it's used. So. We have a game if you'd like to play. Oh yes, I'd love yeah. to. Okay. So I'll give you the set of numbers and what you have to do is you try to have to guess how much water each of these items uses to be produced. So from the very beginning. So for example, if we're talking about paper, paper comes from trees, trees and trees need what to water. Right? So we want to break down each item here and it's a single piece of paper, a single slice of bread, a single apple, a cup of coffee, a beef cheeseburger, a pair of jeans, a gallon of milk, and a two liter of soda. Okay. So I'll be helping you along the way, but tell me what you think. Okay. So, cool. About seven gallons, 830. Yeah. Alright everyone, thank you for those guys. I'm gonna say about three gallons for bread. And I'll tell you at the end as we go along. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And don't worry, this is actually very hard when we've never thought about it. We get folks who get it wrong all the time. 33. Uh, 11. 11. Okay. 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 One freebie, so you get one question that I'll answer. So I'll tell you one. Okay, okay I'd like to switch this one out. What okay. is it? You want to know the number of gallons? Yeah. Okay, so this uses. For one single. Yeah, oh, and wow. the reason for that is because if we look at a burger, it has many ingredients, right? And more than the grain or the vegetables, it's the animal products. Because where do we get cheese from? Uh, milk. We get milk from cows. And cows eat grass. Yeah, and we don't get milk from baby cows, right? Oh, no. They are raised for a couple of years. So that's kind of how you want to think through the rest of the items. So that can give you a hint about one of these other products. Ooh, okay. So you just told me about cows. So I'm going to assume Seven gallons. For this one, I'm gonna do soda. For this one, I'm thinking. Uh, goes here. Thirty-four gallons. Paper. And then we have ninety-two and thirty-three. Um, all right, so you did really well. We have to review some of them. <laughs> the ones that we'll review are paper. So can you remove paper and milk 
and bread. Oh. <laughs> and coffee and soda. But you're close. You're close in your thinking. Um, do you want me to give you the answer now or do you want to try to figure out? I want to try to figure out. Okay. 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 Go for it. So this one, I can't remember which way to put it. Look at the higher end numbers, right? We talked about this, and what was the ingredient that used the most water? It wasn't the grain or the vegetable. It, it was, was more meat. of the the meat and the cheese. So, is there another animal product on the board that might use a lot of water? This one, for sure. Um, thirty-four, ninety-two. I'm gonna have to say paper. Seven gallons. you arrive there so when we think of soda we think of just the liquid in here right yes what makes soda sweet um syrup right syrup right and that syrup comes from sometimes corn or sugar which are crops that need water to grow right yes. so also soda comes in a plastic container oh yeah. and it takes water to make plastic yeah so soda although it has only two liters of liquid inside of it actually uses 92 gallons of water what? so we can go ahead and switch those oh and yeah, we think of paper, we think of a lot of water use, and it is a lot, but it's just a single piece of paper. Oh. And the way they calculate this is, let's say they put 3,000 gallons of water in a tree, right, to grow it, and then they got 1,000 pages of it. Then they divide the number of pages that they got by the number of gallons of water that it took to get that amount. So, three, yeah. Yes. And then we can switch coffee and bread. And again, it's because it's that single slice of bread. It's still a lot of water, yes. right? But it's for a single place. Single. Oh, I should have thought of that. No, single no. Game. <laughs> All right, and this is it. So that's yeah. great. Oh, I love that game. Yeah, that's it's fun. really fun. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the games that we play here with the Roberts Foundation. Um, we do this program at LAUSD campuses within the LADWP service area. Thank you for your time. I am Alia Espanola, Girls in Focus, and right back to you. City of This was such an amazing presentation and thanks to Ilea from Girls in Focus, which is a cool organization that teaches girls how to make films. And so thank you so much for tuning online and we hope you had a fun time in the stream. You know, my favorite part was talking to Ocean Exploration Trust and, and Clean Cities. How about you, Bear? Um, I have to agree with both of those. You know, I really enjoyed Ocean Exploration because I thought it was, I thought it was just so cool the research they were doing out on seeing all the vessels they had. Um, and all the new like research they were gathering. And then for clean cities, the whole mission of helping the environment, you know, by driving electric ve uh, vehicles was definitely interesting. So make sure to follow City of STEM on social media and also check us out on our Instagram and website, which is Cardboard Superheroes at Cardboard Superheroes. And our website is www.cardboardsuperheroes.com. And now we're going to pass it off to the director of Columbia Memorial Space Center, Ben Dicko. What a fantastic day. Thank you so much for being here and watching us today. Thank you for enjoying City of STEM 2022. Definitely be on the lookout for us in 2023. Um, I really want to thank the sponsors who help, who support help put today together. I want to thank our title sponsor, the Amgen Foundation, and then our other sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, Financial Partners Credit Union, SoCal Gas, the Clean Power Alliance, the Academy of Magical Arts, Edison International, Hitachi, the Annenberg Foundation, Northrop Grumman, Pacific West, and Intel. Thank you so much. And then uh, the in-kind help we got from STS Esports, e AOC, and Koala No. Thank you, thank you so much for putting this on and helping us uh, with your support. We were able to put this on today. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Um, I also want to thank the over 100 organizations who are here today showing off the best in STEM. We had mobile groups today. We had uh, small nonprofits. We had huge museums. We had universities. Thank you to all of you for doing this. I want to thank all of the over 100 organizations who continually come to our monthly meetings to help plan City of STEM. Um, I want to thank the staff of the Columbia Memorial Space Center, the, my staff, the, my colleagues, the people that I work with. 
thank you for helping to put this on today. I especially want to thank Laura Brim, who our program coordinator, who really brought all of this stuff together. I want to thank Sarah Medina, uh, Sandra Valencia, and Rick O'Connor for all of your leadership and work on this. Um, I want to thank all of the staff, again, of the Space Center. There's, we just cannot do what we do without you. I want to thank all the volunteers. I want to thank the Girls in STEM Club of the Space Center who showed up and were some of the people who you saw doing remote uh, filming today. I want to uh, thank um, our online production crew, Noah, Chi, Monica, and Diana. Thank you so much. I want to thank the steering committee for City of STEM who meets every Monday to help plan this out. And that includes some of the names I already said, but in also includes Anthony Kwan, uh, Milena Acosta, and Evelyn Serrano. Um, I also want to thank my family. <laughs> I want to thank my wife, Laurel. It was, what, it was her idea that or she said, you know, I think LA needs a science festival. And in 2015, we started it. So thank you and thank you to my kids. Lucy and Miles, nice to see you. Um, and finally, I just want to reiterate, thank the, all of the organizations who came together to make today possible, all the sponsors, everybody, all the staff, thank you so much. But mostly, mostly, I want to thank you, for all of you, for watching today. Please remember to support STEM wherever you are. Support your STEM organizations. Go visit museums. Go out and promote STEM. You don't necessarily have to be a scientist, but just be an enthusiastic supporter of STEM. That's what City of STEM is all about. So that's a wrap for City of STEM 2022. I want to thank you so much for being here. And I will definitely see you next year for City of STEM 2023. Thanks a lot. Take care. The song you're about to hear is based on true events. In the early 1950s, Marie Tharp's ideas were dismissed as girl talk. Last name Tharp, first name Marie, with an expertise in cartography. Got a job map in the ocean floor, using sonar data from the Second World War. But she needed new data to complete her map, so they loaded up a research vessel ASAP. They sailed up on the sea. They didn't let women on the research vessel, so with math making tools, Marie did wrestle. She showed it to a colleague, Bruce Heason. He said, Marie, you got no rhyme or reason. She caused a commotion when she said there was a rift valley at the bottom of the ocean. Girl talk. That's what the man said. Yeah, that's what the man said. He called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, he called it girl talk. A valley with a rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science. went back to the drawing board. Literally, she had a drawing board. She checked it once and she checked it twice. To be triple sure, she checked it thrice. She took it back and she showed it to Bruce. But this time, he called the truce. He shook his head. He said, Marie, Marie, I think I owe you an apology. Your map is right, yes, I must admit. But I'm worried that this map applies continental drift. They published it anyway. Even though they knew the scientists were bound to say the same. That's what the men said, yeah, that's what the men said, they called it Girl Talk. Rejected like that, in two seconds flat, they called it Girl Talk. A valley with the rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your southern reliance on that Girl Talk. Still one man was intrigued, he was a well-known scientific celebrity. Jacques Cousteau was his name, and undersea exploration was his game. He said, ha ha ha, I'll go into the sea, I'll be sure to take Millie's map with me. A stream it for the whole world to see, and settle this bubbling controversy. Chocolate blue, how can it be? Ever since when Maurice said it would be, the Riff Valley, every mountain peak, it's enough to make a man's knees hold me.